Mario Party! Welcome to Identifying Luck for Mario Party 7. It is here we will learn how to best improve our odds of winning at the only Mario Party game with Bowser time. Let's hop aboard this cruise and enjoy the bonus stars. We've got the Happening Star, Orb Star, Minigame Star, Red Space Star, Running Star, and Shopping Star. Why are there so many now? I remember the good old days where there were simply three bonus stars to worry about. Happening, Minigame, and Coin. Now's the the first time we have to deal with more than three bonus stars, so how does that work? Simpler than you think. The game randomly selects three out of the possible six bonus stars to give to players. There's no way of telling which three are going to pop up at the end, making bonus stars in this title unpredictable and a little unreliable when it comes to clutching a win. It's for this reason that you want to try and cover as many bases as possible, win those minigames, buy those items, use those items, run those spaces, land on happenings, and land on those red spaces. Why are you here? Let's get into specifics. The orb star is awarded to the player that used the most orbs. This does not include Koopa Kid orbs, I presume because Koopa Kid is technically the one that throws them. You can use one orb per turn, so on a 20 turn game, the maximum amount of orbs a player can use by the end is 19, because you can't start your first turn with an orb. But what if you've only got one orb in your inventory and now isn't really the time to use it? Should you use it anyways to have a higher count for the orb star, or save it to use it later at a better time. If you're playing against someone who's focused on using an orb every turn and they're already ahead of you on their orb count, then ditch using your orbs every turn and instead pop them at the best times. If you're playing against a bunch of newbies, then use your orbs whenever you want. You may even be able to have a higher orb count by the end anyways. If you're in a situation where you're trying to decide between saving an orb and using it, then it'll come down to the type of orb you're carrying. If it's a yellow orb which affects whoever lands on it, then you're probably good to place it whenever since these orbs rarely have an exact moment where placing them is super optimal. Red orbs though will have precise windows of opportunity because they activate whenever an opponent merely passes the space they were placed on, so when and where you place one is a big deal. Green orbs which affect your movement are similar in this regard, with the metal mushroom serving as a great example. It's meant to protect you from rivals traps, so using it when there are no traps in sight may feel like a bit of a waste, but adding to your orb count may be worth the trouble. As a general rule of thumb, if you only have one orb and you're not sure whether to use it or save it until the next turn, then ask yourself what value you're gaining from waiting until the next turn to use it. If the value is about the same as what you'd get on this turn, or even if it's just a little bit more, then don't wait and just use it now so that you can get your orb count up. All that being said, there's only a 50% chance that the orb star will even pop up at the end of the game, so I wouldn't focus all of my efforts into keeping my orb count high if it means lessening my chances of getting the other bonus stars. The minigame star is awarded to the player that collected the most amount of coins from standard minigames and battle minigames, consistent from how it was in Mario Party 5 and Mario Party 6, so don't get cocky if you've been winning a lot of standard minigames, cause a single high pot battle minigame can be enough for your opponents to knock you out of the running. Losing coins in a battle minigame won't affect your minigame star though. The red space star is awarded to the player that landed on the most red spaces. This is the only bonus star that's based on a traditional bad outcome. Red spaces lose you coins, and yet you can possibly get rewarded with a star if you land on enough of them? Well, it seems counterintuitive. A star's a star. If you can afford losing a few coins, then purposely land in a red space to increase your count. Doing this when red space and blue space coin values are tripled from 3 to 9 can be rough. While yeah, increasing your count is nice, losing 9 coins is not, and can be the difference between purchasing something you need and not. <laughs> Keep in mind your coin count at all times and consider what you may wish to purchase in the near future before purposely landing on a red space. The running star is awarded to the player that moved the most spaces altogether by rolling a dice block. Any form of travel around the board that doesn't involve a dice block will not add to your count for this bonus star. This one can be difficult to lock down if you've been rolling low numbers all game, but you can counter your bad luck by purchasing mushrooms or super mushrooms from the item shop to increase the number of spaces you travel. Ultimately, the amount of spaces you travel in the game will have a great deal of luck involved, so don't get bummed out if you miss this one. The shopping star is awarded to the player that spent the most coins at an orb hut. Oftentimes, the player that won the most minigames will secure this star on account of having a steady flow of coins ready to throw down in the shop whenever they want. 
you could purposely purchase only the expensive orbs in shops to up your count for this star, but more often than not, you'll want to grab the orb that'll benefit your situation more. Imagine spending tons of coins on the priciest orbs at shops just for this bonus star to not even appear at the end. So unless your pockets are bursting at the seams, buy what you need and not what's most shiny. Interestingly enough, the coins a player is forced to spend at a Bowser shop do count towards the shopping bonus star. I genuinely thought it wouldn't, but it does. I guess it helps out in its own weird way, huh? Our spaces for this title are Blue, Red, Happening, Mike, Duel, DK, Bowser, Koopa Kid, and many character spaces which we'll cover in a later section. During the last four turns event, there's a chance that all blue and red spaces coin values will be tripled from 3 to 9. There are no hidden blocks in this game, so don't land in a blue space hoping for one. Mike minigames periodically appear in lieu of a 4 player minigame or a 1v3 minigame about 20% of the time, but only if the mic is turned on or if the option to play mic games with a controller is selected. Additionally, a single player mic game can be played if a player lands on the mic space, where they can bet up to 99 coins as they attempt to beat a memory game involving cards. If the mic or controller mic is turned off, then mic minigames will no longer appear in lieu of 4 player minigames or 1v3 minigames. This will also cause mic minigames to do absolutely nothing. They won't count towards bonus stars, won't do anything to your coins, they become, for all intents and purposes, a dead space. Why the devs thought this was a fine idea is beyond me, but that's how it be. Oh, the mic space is broken, by the way. The memory minigame that it asks you to beat is so pitifully easy that a goldfish could solve it, meaning that you are free to bet your entire wallet with full confidence that you're going to exit the minigame with stacks of cash. Sure, the limit is 99 coins, but doubling that is still a huge deal, especially in this title where we've got bonus stars like the shopping star, which involves spending a lot of coins, and the running star, which can be secured more easily by purchasing super mushrooms. Not to mention the good old orb star, which is easier to seize if you have the spare cash to purchase orbs. Point being, coins matter a lot here, and the mic space is basically a times two multiplier on your wallet up to 99 coins. That is ridiculous and is honestly part of the reason why I turned the mic off. As said before though, this turns off the 4 player and 1v3 mic minigames too, so that decision is up to you. Duel spaces. When a player lands on one, they must choose an opponent to duel in a duel minigame. Now I know what you're thinking, if only all the duel minigames in this title relied purely on your skill, then you could become a god at each of them through lots of practice to basically guarantee you win in every duel encounter. Unfortunately, we've probably got luck-based duel minigames thrown into the mix, right? Making our dream an impossibility. Except there aren't any pure luck-based duel minigames in this title. You heard that right. Every duel minigame in this lineup can be conquered through skill alone, mostly. There aren't even any button masters this time around, thus resulting in what I believe is the most skill-based set of duels in the series to date. So learn the strats, practice them, and nab the goods from your opponent after you clobber them. <laughs> Oh, you sweet summer child. This is Mario Party we're talking about. Did you honestly believe it would be that easy? In every previous title that had duels, you were given the option to bet however many coins you had up to 99, with some titles letting you bet a star or a certain amount of coins while your opponent bet a star. But in this title, you have no idea what you're going to receive until you roll the slot of stupendousness, or as I like to call it, the slot of stupidness. Why make it this way? Just just let the initiator bet what they want like normal. By making it random like this, it completely devalues what it means to win a duel minigame because all of your effort can result in a crappy reward. But hey, at least you get something every time you win, right? Except the devs thought it would be so gosh darn funny to make one of the results that appears frequently a dud. You get nothing. All that work you put into winning that minigame, screw you. It was a waste of time for both parties, lol. Yes, in previous titles, there are moments where a duels a waste of time because players can get forced to duel each other for only a single coin, but at least with that, both players know beforehand so they're free to joke around and not take it seriously, but here you have no idea what the roulette's gonna land on, so each player is given 
giving it their all until then, and for all that effort to result in a dud has gotta be one of the most mind-numbing decisions I've seen in the series. Mario Party 3's Reverse Mushroom was an item that simply wasn't balanced properly. Mario Party 4's Chance Time, while deceitful, succeeded in being luck-based. Mario Party 5's Sweet Dream Roulette was an event with too much of a kick to its reward. Mario Party 6's Chance Time favors the player on the right, but who gets placed there is luck-based. All of these decisions the devs made over the years were dumb in their own right, but they at least had some reasoning behind them. Faulty reasoning, mind you, but reasoning nonetheless for why they were done as stupid as they are. But this? This dud? The entire purpose of its existence is to waste everyone's time and nothing else. Maybe, just maybe, it could have been salvaged if it was at least funny like Mario Party 3's chance time with the single coin result, but you don't even get that here. I can say with full confidence that this deserves the title as the stupidest design decision in the main game mode out of all the Mario Parties released up until this point. There's nothing rewarding about it, nothing funny about it, and nothing enjoyable about it in the slightest. It is truly beyond redemption. Seems like that's terrible, but at least we have chance time, right? <laughs> What chance time? Starting with this title, chance time no longer appears in any more fully original titles in the series. It's gone! I'm glad that it exists in Mario Party Superstars as a throwback, but I really hope that it makes a return in further installments. Now, in all fairness, despite this stupid roulette having a dud and rolling too fast to time, there are some interesting things to note about it. The outcomes that appear on the roulette are based on the winner's current placing. First place does not have the steal two stars outcome on its roulette wheel. Fourth place does not have the dud outcome or the steal 10 coins outcome on its roulette wheel, and second and third place have all possible outcomes on their roulette wheels. If the loser of the duel has no stars to steal, then the roulette will only contain coin outcomes. This is also the case if you're playing on Windmillville. Only coin outcomes will appear on any duel roulette since that board has a hotel gimmick with stars. Each outcome on the roulette is placed in a random order each and every time, where the roulette will repeatedly roll through it at a speed too fast to time. Altogether, this means that it's much better to win a minigame when you're in fourth place than the higher placings. This is because you avoid the dreadful dud and the not so helpful 10 coin steal, leaving you with four pretty great results, either stealing half of your opponent's coins, all of them, one star or two stars. So if you're confident in your dueling capabilities and are currently in dead last, then aim for a duel space and target the threat. Should you win, you will get something good out of it, unless they're broke in which case you run the risk of getting nothing. So maybe choose someone who has stars and coins. If you're in a situation where you desperately need just coins and a lot of them, then you could duel a player with no stars but a lot of coins so that your roulette doesn't show the star outcomes, leaving only the steal half of their coins outcome and steal all of their coins outcome. This is a pretty evil move though, since if you're dueling someone who has zero stars but a lot of coins, they're likely not winning the game, but I'd leave that up to you. With this, we can see that the implementation of the dud seems to exist to balance out the placings a little bit, but gosh darn it, let players bet what they want to bet and go at it, that's the fun of it all. Landing on a DK space will spawn the friendly ape, who has an equal chance of giving you one of two events, single player DK minigame and multiplayer DK minigame. If single player DK minigame is selected, the player has to beat Donkey Kong to the goal in order to earn 20 coins, 30 coins, or even a star, randomly selected by a roulette before the minigame starts. However, in Windmillville, the possible results are only 20 coins and 30 coins, with no star outcome, again because of the hotel gimmick on this board. If multiplayer DK minigame is selected, all players participate in a minigame where they collect bananas. At the end, Donkey Kong gives everyone coins equal to the amount of bananas that they got by once, twice, or thrice, as he converts the bananas into coins. While the DK spaces are generally fantastic to land on, there are situations where doing so can hurt your game. Recall that the only events he provides here is a single player minigame and a multiplayer minigame. That's a 50% chance that he's going to be helping out your opponents gain coins in addition to you. If your foes need a little extra kick to their wallet in order to buy something that'll boost them up in the ranks, then avoid the DK space at all costs. The multiplayer DK minigames here are not difficult and very easy for even the 
worse players to nab some coins out of it. Landing on a Bowser space will spawn the King Koopa, who has a chance of giving you a single player Bowser minigame or a multiplayer Bowser minigame. If single player Bowser minigame is selected, the player has to face off against Bowser in one of three minigames. Losing will result in Bowser taking half the player's coins, all of the player's coins, or a star. Yup, Bowser certainly raised the penalty on losing his minigames in this title, which is partly why you may want to practice his minigames more so that you're less likely to lose out big. If multiplayer Bowser minigame is selected, then all four players participate in a Bowser minigame where by the end Bowser will take half of the loser's coins, all of the loser's coins, or a star from all of the losers. Holy crap does that make this event a scary one! You could be minding your own business just for Bowser to say, hey if you lose this minigame I take a star by the way. It's terrifying! What makes it worse is that the multiplayer minigames he puts you through are fairly difficult considering that one hit means you're out. Then you've got to deal with the unpredictable actions from your opponents who are trying to survive like you are. What this results in is a palm sweaty event where for a minute straight you are committing all of your focus to the screen trying to ensure that your character avoids each and every obstacle that flies by, knowing full well that if you make even a single slip up that it could cost you the entire game. It's kind of amazing, there's truly no other way I would have it, never change Bowser. Through repeated testing, I found that you're more likely to receive a single player Bowser minigame if your placing is high and a multiplayer Bowser minigame if your placing is low. In addition, your punishment for failing is more likely to be losing all of your coins or a star if your placing is high as opposed to merely losing half of your coins if your placing is low. These punishment preferences only apply to single player Bowser minigames by the way. He seems to have pretty rounded odds when deciding on punishments for multiplayer Bowser minigames regardless of your current placing. All of this means that it's much more dangerous to land in a Bowser space when you're in first place as opposed to fourth. Avoid it at all costs, because you are very unlikely to bring the others down with you and much more likely to face a trial yourself, with your best bet being no difference in your star or coin count. If you're in fourth place, then consider purposely landing on the Bowser space to hit your opponents with multiple Bowser minigames. If odds are in your favor and he chooses to take away all coins for losing or even a star, then you can target the threat to bring them down enough. Regardless, I would practice every Bowser minigame a lot. He is not messing around in this title, and you do good to respect him. In addition to Bowser spaces, we've got Koopa Kid spaces. The game always starts with Bowser tossing three Koopa Kid orbs somewhere on the board, and there are three more ways of adding additional ones. The first is by getting a Koopa Kid orb from an orb space, which Koopa Kid will use immediately. This event can be a bit of a bummer if you are hoping for a useful orb, but it's not all that common. The second is by by being forced to buy a Koopa Kid orb from Bowser's shop, which Koopa Kid will then use. This is rare, however, as it's much more common for the victim to be forced to buy a useless Bowser statue instead. The third is by someone getting the Koopa Kid Space Times 10 option during the Final Four Turns event, where Bowser will toss 10 Koopa Kid orbs onto the board. But without knowing what they do, it's kind of hard to gauge how dangerous this is. So let's take a look at all the possible events that can occur when you land on a Koopa Kid Space. Keep in mind that they are all equally likely. Give the player a Cursed Mushroom. This will cause you to roll a 1 to 5 dice block on your next turn. It is possible for this event to trigger on the last turn despite its effect not getting a chance to activate. What's funny about this is that Koopa Kid actually acknowledges that what he just did was pointless but proceeds to proclaim that Bowser will be happy with the job he's done. What a dunce. In some cases rolling a low number can actually be a good thing but I wouldn't aim for it by landing on this space considering just how many other events can trigger. Redistribute everyone's coins evenly. Hey wait a minute, this is just Bowser Revolution in disguise and you thought we wouldn't notice. This is the most powerful of all all Koopa Kid events, as one could guess. If you are heading coins by a lot, then it may do you well to try and keep other players from landing on a Koopa Kid space to avoid even the slightest chance of this event taking place. Make the player swap coins with someone via the roulette wheel. Alright, so the roulette for this event is some next level cringe. Here I'm stopping the roulette as it points in all different kinds of directions, after waiting a few seconds or a long while. And as you can see here, no matter where the pointer is when I stop it or how long I wait, the result always ends up on the same character each and every time. Now I know what you might be thinking, and no, the roulette doesn't predetermine a character. That's not exactly what's going on here. 
The way this roulette works is that each time it appears, it'll select a random zone of what looks to be about 120 degrees for the pointer of the roulette to land on whenever you stop it. It cannot land outside of the zone it selected no matter what. Sometimes this zone lines up really well with a single character, and other times it'll be overlapped on top of two characters. Either way, there will always be at least one character that you have a 0% chance of landing on. All you really need to know is that you ultimately have no control over where the pointer stops, and honestly, I can't even be mad at it this time because I really wasn't expecting such a unique curveball here. Just the kind of thing you'd expect from a Bowser event, or, or Koopa Kid event. <laughs> Use the Bowser pipe, a specially designed warp pipe to switch the player's position with one player via the same roulette we just discussed. In both cases, cross your fingers for the best result. Make everyone switch places with one another, just like the Bowser shuffle from previous titles. Man, can this event be a doozy if you were just within reach of a star or a desired space. Hopefully you have some movement orbs on your person to counteract the effects of this event. Shuffle everyone's orbs. On boards like Pyramid Park, where you're dying to hold onto your bone orb, an event like this can be a pain. Hence why mushrooms and super mushrooms are essential to guarantee your safety just in case. That makes six possible events for Koopa Kid to choose from. Due to the large number, I wouldn't recommend landing on Koopa Kid and hoping for a certain one of the six to pop up. It's just too unlikely. You're better off thinking of alternative ways to improve your game. Unless multiple of his events would benefit you, which is very likely if you're in last place with low coins. Then I'd tell you to go for it. Battle minigames periodically appear in lieu of a four-player minigame about 20% of the time. The amount of coins stolen from each player is determined via roulette. The possible results are 5, 10, 20, 30, and 50. The low values are more common during the first half of the match, whereas the high values are more common during the second half of the match. Once all coins have been gathered, every player will vote on which of the three battle minigames shown they would like to play. Whichever of the three receives the most votes is what's decided. If there's a tie, as in two minigames receive two votes each, then the game will choose the minigame that received zero votes, as though it's upset with you and your playmates' inability to cooperate. Instead of voting on a minigame right out the gate, wait for the other players to vote first. This is because if two players vote for the same minigame and another player votes for a different minigame, then you now have the option of either voting along with the two players to select the minigame they wanted, or you could vote along with the one player so that the game selects the minigame no one wanted. If you're stuck in a situation where no one wants to be the first one to vote, then it's probably because they've got a certain minigame that they want selected. Try seeing what people want and coming to an agreement. Regardless, you should be considering which minigame you have the best chances of winning for and aim for that one selection. This title has 29 items referred to as orbs for players to obtain. Every time an orb is used, there's a small chance that it'll contain some coins from as low as 2 to as high as 10. This occurrence is completely random and not dependent on placing or turn number from what I've seen. I feel it's better to treat these coins as more of a bonus than anything else. Hinging your game on them sounds like a disappointment just waiting to happen. When you really think about it though, using an orb every turn is already something you should be trying to do regardless because of the orb star, so focus more on that guy and less on the coins cheering you on. These eight are green orbs, these six are red orbs, these eight are yellow orbs, these six are blue orbs, and this one is a Koopa Kid orb. Each type has its own effects which will be expanded upon later. In this title, you can throw orbs five spaces ahead of you and five spaces behind you. Spaces that are included in this distance are blue, red, happening, Mike, dual, DK, Bowser, Koopa Kid, and character. Anything else on the board is not included in the distance count, such as star spaces, orb giving spaces, arrows, chests, you get the idea. You can only throw orbs onto blue spaces, red spaces, Koopa Kid spaces, and any character space, including your own. Every other space not mentioned cannot have an orb thrown onto it. Learn these rules for orb placement and how these mechanics function so that you don't get caught off guard. You'll notice that character spaces will depict the owner of the space, not what the orb actually is. This is good info to have since you'll know which player benefits from that space activating. This does, however, make it difficult to know what effect a character space has exactly, but that's where you should employ the forbidden technique of 
memorizing what orb was placed where. <laughs> Side note, the owner cannot activate their own orb space. However, if they land on one they own, they will receive five coins, yellow orb spaces only. The item tables return with one for each board. These tables supply info on how the item shop works as well as the orb giving spaces. These spaces, as you can guess, give you an orb and are not included in the distance count, nor can an orb be thrown onto them. You may have noticed that a few changes have been made to the item table. Whereas in Mario Party 6, the item shop price section groups second and third place together, Mario Party 7 here groups third and fourth place together. This makes it a lot easier for third place to catch up since it now benefits from the low pricings that fourth place has grown accustomed to. Six's item shop probabilities were divided by placing, with certain placements having a chance at seeing certain orbs, whereas here with seven, every placing has the same chance at seeing the same orbs, only differing between the first half and second half of the game. With those changes stated, let's go in depth with an example of an item table using Grand Canal. You'll notice that not all 29 orbs are on the table at once, and that's because only certain orbs appear on certain boards. Grand Canal here, like most boards, has around 13 orbs that have a chance to appear out of the 29 that exists. So knowing which orbs a board contains is imperative. It'd be pretty silly for you to try and obtain an orb that doesn't exist on the board you're playing. Like imagine if I wanted a metal mushroom here despite there being a solid 0% chance of it showing up. That'd be nonsense. The item shop will always hold 3 orbs. No more, no less. What it has in stock when you visit is dependent on luck and what half the game is in. For example, if you're in the first half of a game and enter the shop, the first orb in stock has a chance at being any of these orbs. These probabilities are applied to each orb in stock. Repeats are not allowed, except for mushrooms, but we'll get to that. The item shop's prices for each orb vary depending on your current placing. For example, if you're in second place and see a slow shroom in stock, then it'll cost you the base amount of 10 coins to buy it. If you were in first place, then it would have cost you the expensive amount of 15 coins to buy it. If you were in third or fourth place, then it would have cost you the discount amount of 10 coins to buy it. Some orbs will vary more and some will vary less, such as the mushroom here, which costs Cost 5 coins no matter which place you're in. The item shop will never have an orb in stock that you cannot afford. There's one critical piece of information that I discovered about the item shop in this game that really baffled my mind after I pieced everything together. Under normal circumstances, I would straightforwardly show you the quirk I found and we'd move on, but I think it'd be more fun for you to see the mystery for yourself and then have the answer revealed to you afterward. Alright, so let's take a look at an item table. Doesn't matter which one, so let's go with Neon Heights. You'll notice that mushrooms have a 0% chance of showing up in an item shop during the first half of the game. This is what's depicted on every board's item table. If you've played a fair share of Mario Party 7 before, then what I just said should strike you as nonsensical. After all, mushrooms show up quite often in the item shop during the first half of the game on any board. The item tables must be wrong then, right? That's what I thought too. I assumed that there was a mistake in retrieving the code for the item tables from the game's files, but upon taking a close look once more, that wasn't the case. The code was properly retrieved, interpreted, and placed on the table in front of you. It's all correct. My second assumption was that there was some other bit of code I hadn't seen yet that told the game to throw in mushrooms whenever it felt like, but as I looked to find evidence for this convenient explanation, I came up with nothing. It was then that I decided to start from square one and visit the item shop repeatedly in all different kinds of scenarios. Different boards, different placings, different coins, but there were three tests in particular that, when put together, gave me the answer I was looking for. All three, of course, were done during the first half of the game where mushrooms should have a 0% chance of showing up. For the first test, I only had five coins, and mushrooms constantly appeared. I couldn't get enough of them. For the second test, I had around 20 coins, and mushrooms started appearing less. For the third test, I had a high amount of coins, and for some reason, no matter how many times I visited the item shop, mushrooms would never appear. Not a single time. And if that was the case, then this all comes down to one thing how many coins you have. See, when you enter the item shop, it will only show you items that you can afford. You may assume that this means it'll only roll for the items that you can afford, right? I mean, that only makes sense. 
But that's not what's happening here. The way the item shop works is that it'll roll for each slot regardless of whether or not you can afford the item. If the item it rolled happens to be one you can afford, then it gets displayed in the item shop like normal. However, if the item it rolled is one you can't afford, then it defaults to, you guessed it, a mushroom. This explains why you never see mushrooms in the item shop during the first half of the game when you have a ton of coins. It's cause there aren't any items you can't afford and therefore no substituting for mushrooms. This is also why mushrooms are extremely common when you visit the item shop with a low amount of coins. If you're in Neon Heights for example, holding onto 5 coins in 4th place, you have a 50% chance for one of the items rolled to be something you can't afford. And if that hits, then the item gets replaced with the default mushroom, which is always affordable at 5 coins. This also solves the mystery of why mushrooms are the only item in this game that can repeat in the item shop. It's because the game tried to input multiple items that you can't afford, but since they default to mushrooms, it leaves you with an item shop full of mushrooms. This sucks because it reduces the amount of options you have. Like yeah, mushrooms are cool and all, but let me choose between a mushroom and two other items, not three mushrooms. Players stuck in last place with a low amount of coins have this even rougher because what would have been a nice visit to the item shop for an item that fits their situation so that they can go up in placing ends up as a dead end because their only options are freaking mushrooms! Players with a high amount of coins on the other hand will never see the item shop filled to the brim with mushrooms, meaning they're way more often than not given more options than those with low coins. Altogether, if you're using the item table during the game or are aiming to memorize it, pay attention to what orbs you can't afford before you enter the item shop so you know what the percentage chance is for a mushroom occupying a slot. If you have 4 coins or lower, then you will not be able to access the item shop. We've also got orb spaces to worry about, which grant any player that passes over one a free orb. The orb you receive from one of these spaces is dependent upon what turn the game is on and your current placing. For example, if the game is on turn 10 out of 20, then it's in the first half, and if you're in first place, then you'll receive one of these orbs, each having a higher or lower probability of showing up. Keep in mind that this is just one of six item tables. A lot of the numbers are different when you look between them, and you've also got to keep track of both the item shop and the orb spaces. The Curse Mushroom Orb is not included because it can't be obtained via the item shop or an orb space. Green orbs affect the player or the dice block when the player uses them. They cannot be placed on the board. Mushroom Orb lets you move using two dice blocks. If the player rolls double sevens, then they'll receive 30 coins. Rolling a double of any other number will instead yield 10 coins. This orb consistently shows up on every board, letting you know that you're not alone. Its pricing is always 5 coins, no matter what board you're on or what placing you're in. It's the second most common orb to obtain from an orb space. Getting beaten out by one we'll talk about in a moment. But just because it's a common orb doesn't mean you should use it just cause you can. Rolling two dice blocks is a big deal, so always be sure to count ahead on your possible routes whenever you have a mushroom in stock to see if giving yourself a boost would be a good play. An example for when it wouldn't be wise to use a mushroom is if you've been keeping track of the star spaces and know the next one will appear a few spaces in front of you. Using a mushroom here will undoubtedly cause you to pass the star space before the star appears there, whereas not using it gives you a chance to roll low so that the star can appear and then you can buy it on your next turn. The red orbs are your arch nemesis when using a mushroom because they'll activate the moment you step on them. If a thwomp orb was placed a few spaces ahead of you, then using a mushroom to try and roll high is pointless because the thwomp will stop you in your path. Imagine rolling high so that you can put more steps towards the running bonus star just for a thwomp to cut it short. This is why looking ahead and recalling what roadblock is what will help you out in finding the right opportunity to move the most amount of spaces you can. If there's no way to avoid a roadblock, then face it head on without using a mushroom and then use it on your next turn. We'll discuss the red orbs in detail soon. Super Mushroom Orb lets you move using three dice blocks. If the player rolls triple sevens, then they'll receive 50 coins. Rolling a triple of any other number will instead yield 30 coins. The Super Mushroom shows up on every board except for Windmillville, which is an interesting choice. Perhaps the dev thought the gimmick of this board would be dragged down if players rolled incredibly high with Super Mushrooms. Regardless, it's actually the most common orb, beating out the Mushroom for a higher percentage chance at 
method appearing from orb giving spaces and the item shop in most scenarios. The Super Mushroom costs 20 coins for first place, 15 for second place, and 10 for third and fourth place. You might assume that if you're in first that you probably have a lot of coins anyway, so spending 20 isn't a big deal, but there will always be those times where the player in first has a lot of stars, but no coins. If you're in this position, then spending 20 of them on a Super Mushroom may prevent you from purchasing the next star you come across unless you're confident that you'll win the next minigame or you're desperate for the shopping bonus star. The lower prices of 15 and 10 are much more reasonable, especially if you've got coins to spare. Blasting ahead with triple dice blocks is always fun, but not if you pass over an enemy's red orb space, so check the map in earnest beforehand lest you want to lose some coins or get stopped in place by a thwomp. Slow Shroom Orb lets your dice block roll slowly in ascending order, allowing you to choose which number you roll if you time your jump, which is pitifully easy to do. You've just got to jump a little before the number you want shows up. If you think that basically choosing what number you roll in a board game sounds broken, then you'd be right. If I get this dude, then I can hold onto him until I reach a space that could change the entire outcome of the game, like a mic space, a Bowser space, certain happening spaces, and just choose to land on any of them. Heck, I could land on a dual space and hope for the best. Even if there isn't a particular space I want to land on and I simply wish to roll high, I can nab an easy 10, no big deal. Granted, this orb did get nerfed in this title. Instead of showing up on every board with a mere 15 coins being the max price, it now only shows up on 4 out of 6 boards, with Windmillville hiking up its price by 5 coins for every placing. Its chances of showing up in an orb space were also reduced by a bit, with no more 20% odds and less 15% and odds as well. Was this nerf necessary? Yes, this orb is amazing. Does it make this orb bad now? No, not at all. Its cost on Grand Canal, Neon Heights, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno is still cheap, and absolutely worth purchasing the moment you see it. There is no other orb in this title that is more versatile. It simply covers way too many situations and scenarios for you to pass it up. It's the kind of item that can change games with a single dice roll, and in the hands of a clever player, will see them choosing their fate instead of letting fate choose them. Metal Mushroom Orb lets you encase yourself in metal and move without being harmed by rivals' traps. It doesn't matter which trap it is, the Metal Mushroom is unstoppable and will prevent any foe's red orb space from affecting you no matter what. A purely cosmetic quirk to this orb is that there are unique animations that play whenever you pass over an opponent's orb while you're in your suit of metal. Gotta love them. This orb is the ultimate line of defense against the red orbs that are out to drain your coins, hold your movement and send you flying. Unfortunately, it only shows up on Pagoda Peak, Windmillville, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno, leaving three other boards where you're left with no armor and must navigate the roadblock orbs in other ways. When it does show, it's 15 coins for first place, 10 coins for second place, and 5 coins for third and fourth place, at least for Pagoda Peak and Windmillville. The Inferno is a little more pricey, but it's still a fair amount and well worth purchasing if you can afford it, especially if you're in a tense situation where you have more to lose. When it comes to using it, do so when you feel that you're in real danger of stepping over a foe's trap. Only use it otherwise if you're adamant about raising your orb count for the orb bonus star. There will be some give and take here where you may want to use it at a poor time to increase your orb count, but would like to use it later when you're close to a trap an opponent laid out. As always, you've got to weigh the pros and cons, trying to determine which outcome would help you out in the long run. More often than not though, I'll find myself using a metal mushroom before moving towards a thwomp, twister, or war pipe space especially if it's preventing me from reaching my desired location. The Metal Mushroom does not protect you from any orb space that requires you to land on their space to activate them, so you can't defend against any yellow orbs, such as Hammer Bros, Kamex, and Spear Guys, to name a few. Just the red orbs that activate when you step on them. Flutter Orb lets you summon Flutter, who will fly you straight to the star space. This orb put the genie from earlier titles out of a job, so I'm not too fond of it, but at least it only appears on Grand Canal and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno, since they're the only board here without any gimmicky star spaces. Normally, lower placings have a higher chance of seeing a great orb in the item shop, whereas higher placings have a lower chance of seeing one. This is to balance out the game and give the lower placements a chance at catching up. But recall that this title's item shop doesn't care about placements, meaning that this incredibly powerful Flutter Orb shows up at the same 15% probability on Grand Canal no matter if you're in first place or fourth place. At least it's only an issue on Grand Canal since 
since it only shows up on orb spaces on Bowser's Enchanted Inferno, not the item shop. The cost is fairly high for an orb, so you have a lot to consider. Do you have enough coins to afford it? If so, will you be able to afford the star after? Is the star close by to where a threat is? If you answer yes to all of these questions, then you should buy it, especially if you're in third or fourth place since it only costs 10 coins to do so. The only times I wouldn't buy it in this situation is if someone would steal it from me the turn after, or if I was about to lose all of my orbs anyways. If none of those scenarios apply, then this orb's mine. Cannon Orb, it'll send you flying to the upper part of the board. This orb can only be found on Pagoda Peak, and is meant to help you close in on the star at the top by launching up as many spaces as possible. More details when we talk about the peak of Pagoda. Lakitu Orb, Lakitu will bring you a treasure chest. It can only be found on Neon Heights because that's the only board with this gimmick. The treasure chest it grabs is completely random, so don't think that by using this orb you have a higher chance at receiving the chest with a star. The only way you can guarantee that the Lakitu brings you the right chest is if there's only one unopened chest left. Then you know for sure what you're getting. It costs 30 coins for first place and a bit lower for the other placings. If you have the coins to spare, then it's a fantastic orb because it negates some of the luck that comes with this board's gimmick of, hey, which one contains the star? By all means, if a threat's approaching a chest and you don't know whether or not the chest contains a star, then you may want to consider using your Lagatu anyways if you can't risk the potential of them extending their lead. Snack Orb prevents a Chain Chomp from stealing from you once, lasts for three turns. Unlike Mario Party 6, the Snack Orb here is not used automatically. It is now a shield that you must activate beforehand, which lasts for three turns. This last for three turns part is completely misleading, by the way. With how it reads, you'd think it would work like this. You use the orb on turn three. It's now your turn on turn four. One turn has passed. It's now your turn on turn five. Two turns have passed. It's now your turn on turn six. Three turns have passed and the orb disappears. But what it does instead is count the turn you use the orb on as a turn and then starts counting like a sane person. So in our previous example, you use the orb on turn three, one turn has passed, stupid. It's now your turn on turn four, two turns have passed, this is so dumb. It's now your turn on turn five, three turns have passed, I'm gonna cry. Remember, this orb is a reactionary orb. It is only functional and useful during other players turns, but it only lasts for two sets of other players turns, not three, so saying the orb lasts for three turns and counting the moment you used it as a turn makes its description completely misleading and honestly frustrating. Regardless, it is a useful orb for what it's worth and can absolutely save you from a bad situation even if it only lasts for two turns and prevents you from using any green orbs on yourself during that time period. More on it when we get to Pyramid park. Red orbs take effect when an opponent either passes or lands on them. If a player lands on one, it'll still have the effects of a blue space or red space. The orb disappears once it's been activated. What makes these types of orbs so useful is that they cannot be replaced by other orbs, which means that they will eventually activate unless one was placed where a star spawns or on certain spaces that events take place on, which we'll cover later. Spiny orb. Any opponent who passes it will lose 10 coins. In Mario Party 6, this orb was a yellow orb only activating when landed upon, resulting in the victim losing 10 coins, which are then given to the owner of the space. In this title, it's now a red orb, meaning that to activate, it merely has to be passed. You may presume that this is a buff, but this orb now only makes the victim lose 10 coins without the owner of the space receiving a dime. For all intents and purposes, it's taken the place of the Potaboo orb. Despite this downside, it's a simple, albeit useful effect. You could place this guy behind a star space so that anyone moving towards one will suffer a 10 coin loss, potentially lessening their coins enough to the point where they can't afford a star. Using this orb on a player with a ridiculously high coin amount tends to not be worth it since they'll likely be able to purchase whatever they want even after getting minus 10. I'd only target the billionaire in the match if I needed to beat them out in coins by the time end game rolls around, otherwise I'd prevent other players from making moves that could threaten my game, such as purchasing a star, riding a chain chomp, or buying certain orbs. This shell can be found in all boards except for Pagoda Peak and Neon Heights, with a fair chance of showing up across the board. It's incredibly cheap at the item shop, so keeping one of these in your inventory just in case is well worth it. Zap Orb. Any opponent who passes it loses three coins for every space they move past it. Oh, looks like our buddy here got nerfed. In Mario Party 6, it caused a player to lose five coins every space they moved, but here it's been reduced
reduced to 3. While it's less powerful, it's still pretty solid. If you were to place this orb directly in front of a threat and they roll a 10, then they'll lose 3 coins 10 times in a row for a total of 30 coins lost. There is a chance that they may just roll a 1 or a 2, thereby minimizing the effects of this orb, but in that case, they just rolled a really low number, so either they go nowhere or lose a bunch of coins. A win-win. Due to the severity of this orb's effect, it can also act as a deterrent for mushroom and super mushroom orbs. Very few people will willingly choose to roll double or triple dice blocks knowing that every space they move with such a high roll will delete three of their coins, thereby pressuring them into not moving a high amount of spaces and just rolling normally so that they don't zap away their entire wallet. Granted, they may go the distance in case they want to up the count on their running bonus star, so there's a bit of a risk involved. Obviously, zap orbs aren't effective at all against players that already have zero coins, so just don't place them in front of broke players. The only real counter to this chad is the Metal Mushroom, which can save you from the excruciating pain of losing so many coins. This orb shows up on Pagoda Peak, Windmillville, and Neon Heights, the first two of which also contain the Metal Mushroom, meaning you should always stock up on it for protection against this zapping menace, especially because it's a fairly common drop from orb spaces. Item shops, on the other hand, don't see it popping up nearly as often. It's a fair 10 coins for first place on Pagoda Peak and and Neon Heights, whereas Windmillville hikes up the price to 15 coins. Despite this, the overall price is down from the static 20 coins it costs in Mario Party 6, likely because of its nerf of only deleting 3 coins per space instead of the previous 5. Regardless, I still opt in for purchasing it whenever I can. Tweester Orb. Any opponent who passes it will be blown away to another space, and by that it means any blue space or red space, no other types. It appears on Grand Canal, Pyramid Park, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. Placing it behind a star can devastate an opponent's chances at seizing a lead, because even if they have enough coins to purchase one, they'll get thrown somewhere else entirely. The only way to brace this tornado is by using a Metal Mushroom beforehand, but Bowser's Enchanted Inferno is the only board where the Metal Mushrooms appear alongside the Tweester, meaning that for every other board, there is no way to avoid getting Tweestered other than simply choosing a different path or having the proper character orb. This lack of counters is what makes this orb so powerful. Sure, there's a possibility that it'll launch your opponent towards something else they want, but having a high chance of negating their number one option is fantastic. It cannot be found in the item shop during the second half of the game, meaning that at that stage, you'll only start seeing it from orb spaces. I try and at least buy one from the item shop during the first half of the game, just in case I can prevent a threat from taking the lead. If you're playing with people that aren't too good at the game, then grabbing this orb will probably be a little overkill. Thwomp Orb. Any opponent who passes it will get thwomped and must stop moving. This orb orb is a jerk, and you should feel like one for using it like I do. It appears on Neon Heights, Pyramid Park, and Windmillville. Unfortunately, none of these boards have traditional star spaces, so that great feeling of watching an opponent get thwomped right before a star has all but faded away. Except with Neon Heights, if only one chest is left, but you know what I mean. On the other hand, you can now place thwomps behind doghouses, which is arguably more powerful than placing one behind a star, since a high roll on a chain chomp can potentially take up to three stars and preventing that from happening with a single thwomp is a huge win. There is the possibility that the thwomp doesn't stop anyone in the event players avoid the doghouse, but those are risks that you've got to take. In Windmillville, where pass alternate each time one is taken, placing a thwomp before the pass can help you alter which one will be available to you by the time you reach them. This prevents you from getting screwed out of going the wrong way for multiple turns, subjecting one of your opponents to that fate. For Neon Heights, placing a thwomp behind a chest can be risky since you never never really know which one contains the star. This creates a situation where you may end up inadvertently saving a threat from the fate of getting bombed, letting a different player take the punishment instead. You can either take your chances or try saving it for whenever the chest with the bomb is claimed, so you're guaranteed to prevent a player from opening a chest with either coins or a star. This orb, sadly, is pretty rare, not showing up in item shops or the first half of a Windmillville game. And when there is a chance it can show up on an orb space, the probabilities aren't as high as they can be. All this means is that whenever you happen to nab a thwomp, think hard about when to use it, where to place it, and who will be affected by it when you do. Warp Pipe Orb. Any opponent who passes it will be warped to the space where they started their movement. This orb was originally a green orb that one used on themselves to switch placements with another 
your player, whereas here it got the red orb treatment and in an interesting way. Instead of swapping places with another, it causes the victim to fling back to where they started their turn. This doesn't end their turn, mind you, they can still move the remaining number of spaces they have. It appears on Neon Heights and Pagoda Peak. The game's code lists it as an orb on Grand Canal and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno as well, but its probabilities for appearing are set to 0% across the board. While I considered removing it from the table because of this, I've decided not to just in case there's a reason why it's there that hasn't been discovered yet. My guess is that they simply forgot to take it out, but if you find a different compelling reason, then let me know in the comments so I can add the info. Using the warp pipe orb on Neon Heights can backfire if you place it a few spaces ahead of a splitting path. Imagine one of your opponents arrives at a junction and wanted to land on one of these happening spaces but doesn't have the right space count. If you placed your warp pipe on the upper path here, then they can purposely go up, get flung back to where they began their roll, and revisit the same junction where they can now land on the space they wanted. Instead, use this orb right behind one of the chests or on the main route to reduce the chances of a foe using it to their advantage. If you're facing a warp pipe yourself, then always consider how it can potentially help your game if it's directly after a junction. Pagoda Peak doesn't have the same junction problem that the other boards do because it's a straight line, so place it after some crappy spaces to delay a foe's movement if that's what you desire. The Warp Pipe Orb cannot show up at an item shop, but it can show up on an orb space. Be very mindful with this orb lest you accidentally help your opponent. The Bomb Orb. Any opponent caught in the explosion will get thrown for a loop. This orb only shows up on Pagoda Peak, and this is because its true effect is that it'll send you to a lower part of the board if activated. Its details are, as you may have expected, heavily tied to the board itself, so we'll talk more on it when we get to Pagoda Peak. Yellow Orbs take effect when a player lands on them. If the owner lands on the space, they receive 5 coins. During the final 4 turns event, the owner will receive 15 coins if the coins times 3 roulette was chosen. Hammer Bro Orb, take 10 coins from any opponent who lands on it. This orb functions exactly the same as the Mario Party 6 version of the Spiny Orb, meaning the 10 coins it takes away will be given to the owner of the space. It has potential to deal some damage if it gets activated multiple times over the course of a game, but there are other yellow orbs that do its job way better. It shows up on Grand Canal, Neon Heights, Pagoda Peak, and Windmillville with a likely chance at popping up from an orb space but an average chance at appearing in an item shop. Its cost there is fairly low, but I prefer many other orbs, so I don't buy this one too often. It's definitely fun to use on Pagoda Peak though, since players are forced to take a singular path the entire time, making it likely that yellow orbs will get landed on often. Piranha Plan Orb Any opponent who lands in it must give you half of their coins. It appears on Grand Canal, Neon Heights, Heights, Pyramid Park, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. Oh boy, here we go again. How in the world is this plant growing in this literal inferno, but not the grassland? Are piranha plants just built different? Come on. This orb is a bit inconsistent with how often it shows up, sometimes popping up from orb spaces more, and other times the item shop. Either way, it's an incredible purchase, able to obliterate an opponent's wallet with the good old slash in half. It's even useful against players that barely have 20 coins, since having that amount prevents them from buying a star. It's a fantastic all-rounder orb that you want to find the absolute best placement for to receive its maximum value. Speaking of receiving, don't forget that you receive half the coins the victim loses, making the decision of where to place it an even spicier one. Its main downside, as with all yellow orbs, is that it can get replaced. So don't throw it down within 5 spaces of someone or they'll just end up saving themselves the trouble of dealing with it. If you see a Piranha Plant Orb up to 5 spaces ahead of you, then replace it unless you need to hold on to the orb in your inventory. Losing half of your coins is already awful, but doubly so when given to an opponent. Spear Guy Orb Any opponent who lands on it must give you coins equal to a dice block roll. He appears on Pagoda Peak, Pyramid Park, Windmillville, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. The dice block can roll a 5, 10, 20, or 30. The amount you get when you hit the block is predetermined, so no amount of waiting is going to change what you get, but it looks like there's an equal chance of it choosing any of the results. 
Like the Prana plant, this orb is just a better hammer bro. While there is a chance that the 5 coin amount will be selected, the opportunity to steal 20 or even 30 coins more than outweighs the downside. He shows up pretty often in the item shop and even orb spaces. You do well to buy him and other coin stealing orbs nice and early in the game so that you can gain the maximum value from them, especially if you're playing a game that's more than 20 turns. When we get into the board section, keep your eyes peeled for the main path since that's where you'll want to throw down this guy to reap the benefits from your opponent. Kamek Orb. If an opponent lands in it, you can take over up to three of their character spaces. To see how effective Kamek is, we've got to take a look on the boards it appears on. Pagoda Peak, Pyramid Park, and Windmillville. Starting with the mountaintop, the possible orbs that you can steal are Hammer Bros, Spear Guys, Kameks, Zaps, Warp Pipes, and b bombs Wow, what a lineup! It's especially impressive on a board like Pagoda Peak, where landing on a character space is incredibly common due to there only being a single path for players to take. Sometimes you can't avoid them. Having this ability to then take three of those character spaces and making them your own is powerful, and elevates this orb to a must-buy in my book if I ever see it here, unless I'm desperate to move some more spaces. On Pyramid Park, we've got Piranha Plants, Spear Guys, Camix, Toadies, Pink Boos, Spinies, Tweesters, and Thwomps, an even longer lineup. While character spaces can potentially be avoided here, unlike Pagoda Peak, this orb is still powerful in how it reduces your opponent's ability to hurt your game. Reduce may even not be the right word, it's more like a reverse card cause now you're the one in control. Windmillville has Hammer Bros, Spear Guys, Kamix, Bandits, Spiny, Zaps, and Thwomps. With how this board's hotel gimmick functions, coins are imperative, meaning that reducing the amount of coin stealing orbs on the board is a great help in keeping your amount as high as possible. From what it looks like, no matter which board you're on, a Kamek is super useful. If there's no orb that fits your current situation and you see him in the item shop, then grab him. If you're playing with people that are new and aren't using orbs at all, then feel free to ignore this guy. Toady Orb. Take an orb from any opponent who lands on it. If a player has multiple orbs in their inventory, then the toady will take one at random. If the orb is yellow or red, then toady will throw it onto a random space on the board on the owner's behalf. But if the orb is green or blue, then toady will trash it. This is different from Mario Party 6's toady who simply gave the orb to you. It's available on Neon Heights, Pyramid Park, and and that's it. Which is unfortunate, because keeping your opponent's orb stock low is great for reducing their chances at getting the orb bonus star. Or, if you took a mushroom or super mushroom from them, the running bonus star. I wish it was available on Pagoda Peak, since then it could cripple the competition by reducing their movement options even more, but alas, it's a bit stubborn. So stubborn, in fact, that it doesn't even show up at the item shop. It only pops up from orb spaces, so if you get one, place it in the best spot you can. Mr. Blizzard Orb. If an opponent lands in it, they'll lose all of their orbs. It appears on Grand Canal and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. He can't be purchased on either board. Heck, the orb spaces have a low probability set for him appearing, so it's unlikely you'll see this orb used in game too often. Try placing it a little ways after an orb shop to increase the odds of it actually getting rid of an opponent's orbs. Banded Orb. Whoever lands in it will lose coins from a windmill. It'd be better for us to cover the complexities of this orb after we learn everything there is to know about Windmillville's gimmick later on. Pink Boo Orb. A foe who lands here will lose a star. If the foe doesn't have any stars when they land here, they lose 20 coins. This orb shows up on Grand Canal, Neon Heights, Pyramid Park, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. Oh man, what an orb! The value of this thing cannot be overstated. I mean, how could it be? If an opponent lands on it, they lose their star and give it to you. A single activation alone makes this orb worth it, but it stays on the board permanently unless it gets replaced, meaning that you have a chance of multiple multiple players landing on your pink boost space and granting you multiple of their stars, shooting you up into the ranks. And if they don't have any stars, then this orb is still useful because pink boost steals 20 coins from them instead. It's incredibly useful on all boards, but Neon Heights in particular is a noteworthy place for it considering it's a little more difficult to gather stars on that board due to its gimmick. So if you manage to get a player with a star to land on your pink boo, then the value of that individual star is higher than if you had stolen it on a different board. You'd think that the chances of this ore popping up in the item shop would be fairly low, 
but not really, as it averages a 10% chance of showing up. It can even reveal itself from an orb space, still with a reasonable chance of appearing. Its overall cost in the shop is the highest in the game, sure, but if you're placing it on the main route away from any player trying to replace it, then this is a great orb to grab. If you see this orb space up ahead and it's within your throwing orb range, get rid of it as soon as possible. If it's not within your orb range, but you still have a chance of landing on it, then consider using one of your movement orbs to reduce the odds of landing on it because it is seriously a game changer, especially if the person that placed it down already has a lead. Blue orbs, also known as character orbs, function just like green orbs, but each one can only be used by a specific pair of characters. If you, for example, walk up to an item shop as Mario and the 10% chance of the character orb hits, then you'll see Mario's character orb, the Fireball. If you were playing as Waluigi in this scenario, then you would have instead seen his character orb orb, the vacuum. Character orbs show up on every board in the game and always cost the same amounts at the item shop, with their average probability of appearing at item shops and orb spaces being roughly 10-15% to without much variety. Before anyone says anything, yes, the existence of these character orbs means that some characters in this game are better than others. Let's get into it. Fireball Orb, Mario and Luigi's Character Orb, hit an opponent in front of you to steal their coins. The effect of this orb lasts three turns, including the turn that you use it on. While in effect, your character will have swirling fireballs surrounding them, and whenever you're about to pass over or land in a space that already has a player on it, you'll set them ablaze and steal 10 coins. If multiple players are on the same space in this scenario, you'll steal 10 coins from each player. Looking at this orb on the surface level, it doesn't appear to be half bad, but it's all bad, mainly because of how situational it is. First, there needs to be an opponent close by in front of you. Second, to gain maximum value from this orb, said opponent needs to have at least 10 coins. Third, you need to actually roll high enough to reach the opponent you're stealing from. Even if all that lines up, you're only getting 10 coins. To get more than that, you've got to be in a pretty lucky situation where multiple opponents are lined up in front of you and you're rolling a decent amount. But hold on a sec, let's remember that this orb lasts 3 turns, including the turn you use it on. Meaning that you've got 2 turns where you can use an orb like a mushroom or a super mushroom to extend the range of your wrath, right? Well. No, because you're not allowed to use any orbs on yourself while under this fireball orb's effect. And if you think that means only the mushrooms can't be used, then you'd be mistaken because not only do the mushrooms get locked out, but the entire green orb lineup. Flutter, Cannon, Lakitu, and Snack Orb included. This is an incredible downside for multiple reasons. The more obvious one being, what if you're in a fantastic position to use one of your green orbs and can't? Screw you, I guess! The less obvious one being, what if you need to increase your orb count for the bonus star and the only orbs you have left in your inventory are green orbs? Again, screw you! These drawbacks wouldn't be a huge deal if the fireball orbs effect was substantial, but as we already went over, it's pretty situational, and even if you do manage to get its effect off, all you're gonna steal is 10 coins per player. I can admittedly see this orb doing a lot of damage on Pagoda Peak though, where players can be found lined up in a row often, but overall, it's kinda crappy. Flower Orb, Peach and Daisy's character orb. Spaces ahead of you will change to flower spaces, letting you ignore traps. You get 3 coins for every space you move. Its effect functions similar to the Metal Mushroom, where the user isn't affected by any traps they pass by. The key difference here being that the Metal Mushroom wastes the trap by activating it and moving on, whereas the Flower here doesn't activate the trap at all, leaving it for other opponents to suffer its effects as the user passes safely on by. While some may disagree, I believe that the Flower Orb's effect is the better one of the two. With the Metal Mushroom, you eliminate the Roadblock Orb entirely, clearing a path for anyone behind you that may have suffered from its effect. Whereas with the Flower Orb, you don't have to suffer the effects of the Roadblock, but the other opponents still do, edging you up in the ranks ever so slightly. Where the Flower Orb may backfire here is if no one activates the Roadblock you skipped and you loop back around to it, now having to suffer the consequences that would have otherwise been avoided by the Metal Mushroom, but this situation is pretty unlikely unless your opponents are purposely choosing to not take the path with the Roadblock. Regardless, it's a great effect, especially when you consider that one of the downsides to the Metal Mushroom is that it doesn't appear on Grand Canal, 
Neon Heights, or Pyramid Park. But since our flower buddy here is a character orb, it can be found on all boards, letting you sneak past annoying roadblock orbs that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to avoid. And we haven't even talked about its coin effect yet, where every space you travel with it, you gain three coins. The least amount of coins this orb can give you is three if you roll a one, with the most being 30 if you roll a 10. Traps aside, if you're coming up on the star and don't have enough coins, then you can simply use this orb to fill in the gap. If you roll low, then yeah, you won't get many coins, but it's unlikely that you would have reached the star to begin with. How about using this orb before an item shop so that you can purchase an orb you may need, or using it before one of the windmills? The versatility of this orb is crazy, as you'll find situation after situation where the added coins will be useful, with the only downside being the possibility that you roll low, making purchasing this orb a little bit of a risk, but the pros more than outweigh it. Ego Orb, Yoshi and Birdo's Character Orb. Eat character spaces and symbols in your path and turn them into eggs. Eggs will become orbs after moving. They can eat the regular yellow orbs that are placed down, the red roadblock orbs, Koopa Kid orbs, and their own orbs. That last detail kinda hurts this orb a little bit. It was already situational that you've gotta be behind some opponent's orb spaces for it to be worth it, but knowing that you can accidentally get rid of your own orb spaces too makes things a little tricky. What if you'd like to delete some annoying orb spaces in front of you, but say a pink boo orb you place down is in the way. That really sucks. Yes, you do get all the orbs that you ate up, but you can only hold on to three, so you're gonna end up having to throw away some orbs that you otherwise might have wanted to keep. I'm sure taking away your own orb spaces can be useful in certain scenarios like maybe you want to place them somewhere else, but in that case, just make sure you're certain about where you place it the first time. This orb's ability to avoid roadblock orb's effects makes it yet another variation of the Metal Mushroom Orb, where you instead steal the roadblock orb for yourself, letting you cause havoc on the person that attempted to pull something on you. Let's not forget about how this orb lets you eat up Koopa Kid spaces as well. Unfortunately, doing so doesn't grant you a Koopa Kid orb. It simply deletes the space and moves on. Would have been cool. The potential returns in this orb can be massive. Lots of players love to place their orbs one after another, making a lane of doom, as some may call it. If they foolishly decide to do this against a Yoshi or Birdo player, then they may see their entire empire fall before the egg orb's wrath. Even getting rid of a single amazing orb space like someone's pink boo orb and taking it for yourself can be a great play. Pagoda Peak is where a lane of doom is going to happen whether you like it or not, so if you know this board's going to be selected, then Yoshi or Birdo's a fair pick. Pick. Vacuum Orb, Wario and Waluigi's Character Orb. Spin the wheel and take away whatever number you end up with from your opponents. With previous roulette wheels in the series, there tended to be a consistent timing you could apply to get the result you wanted, but here the roulette is just about as random as a dice block. Even when I repeat the same situation over and over again, trying to press the A button as quickly as possible, I'm rarely able to get the pointer to land on the same spot multiple times in a row. It's almost as if frame by frame, the game is calculating a new new random position for it to land on. Previous roulettes also shared a similar quirk in that after a minute of no input, the roulette would stop on its own with the pointer in the down position, meaning if your desired result happened to be in the down position, you could just wait a minute and get what you want. But here, the roulette won't stop after a minute of no input, but 10 minutes of no input. Don't worry, that doesn't mean you've got to wait 10 minutes for the slider to guarantee point in a certain direction, because even that was changed. It's purely random. The only honest part about this roulette is that it equally divided the results. 1, 3, 5, and 10, which I'd say is accurate and bad. Like, really bad. The cheapest you can buy this orb is for 10 coins. You have a 25% chance of stealing 3 coins, a 25% chance of stealing 9 coins, a 25% chance of stealing 15 coins, and a 25% chance of stealing 30 coins. 50% of the time you use this orb, you are losing more coins than what you spent on it. And that's looking at the cheapest price you can buy it at. If you're in first place and grab it for 15 coins, then you only have a 25% chance of actually gaining coins when using it, assuming your opponents have enough coins to steal to begin with. I'm sure that if you get lucky and use it in the right situation, then it can help out a lot in boosting your wallet, but that's a big if. This thing's at its most valuable when you get it for free from an orb space, but so are the other character orbs. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think this orb is worse than the fireball orb. While yeah, it does lock you out of the green self orbs for two turns, at least you can make
make a decent play with it if you're patient enough. With the Vacuum Orb here, the absolute best you can hope for is stealing 10 coins from each player with a high probability of gaining next to nothing or outright losing value. It's honestly kind of pathetic. Fitting for Waluigi in particular. <laughs> magic Orb, Boo and Dry Bones character orb. Use powerful magic to turn invisible and double your dice block rolls for two turns. Turning invisible allows you to bypass roadblock orbs, meaning this is yet another orb that's a variation of the Metal Mushroom. This bypass works identically to the Flower Orb, with the difference between these two orbs being that one grants you three coins for each space you move, and the other doubles whatever number you roll on your dice block. While I dogged on the Fireball Orb, for locking you out of green orbs for two turns, I won't do the same to the magic orb here because one, it only locks you out for a single turn, and two, the doubling dice block effect is more often useful than the fireball effect. The ability to travel long distances without being interrupted at all is powerful, and something scary to behold as the user can quickly close the gap to a star without any roadblock stopping them. This invisibility grants no protection against regular character spaces though, so don't go thinking you're invisible. Invincible, or invisible. <laughs> its versatility is great and when used in the right situation can be game changing. Truly a fascinating orb. Triple Shroom Orb, Toad and Toadette's character orb. Use the power of three mushrooms to double your dice blocks for three turns. Simple, but effective. For three turns, you get double dice blocks able to travel wherever you want, racking up your space count for the running bonus star, reaching item shops to stock up and get your count up for the shopping bonus star, and close in on objectives. The obvious downside here is that whole lockout mechanic we talked about earlier, where you won't be allowed to use an orb on yourself for two turns. While this is the same length of time the fireball orb locks you out, it's not as detrimental since, again, the fireball orb's effect isn't as good as the orb it's competing against. Double dice blocks are that good. When trying to choose between the triple shroom orb and magic orb, you've got to consider if the chances of rolling high for an extra turn is worth losing the ability to bypass roadblocks, and that'll probably come down to the board you're playing. If the board is a little more closed off like Pagoda Peak, Windmillville, and Neon Heights, then it's harder to avoid roadblock orbs, making magic orb more useful. But if the board has a lot of junctions like Grand Canal, Pyramid Park, and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno, then avoiding roadblock orbs is easier so the Triple Shroom Orb is a safer bet. Frankly, both of these orbs are so great that you can use them interchangeably on these boards and still see success, but I found that they excel a little more in the boards I mentioned for each. Koopa Kid Orb. It shows up on every board with no chance to see it in an item shop, only being obtained by orb spaces. I say obtained in quotes because, as we know, Koopa Kid will swoop in and use it himself, which again does not count towards your orb star. This will cause a Koopa Kid space to form wherever he threw it. An interesting detail to note here is that Koopa Kid orbs do not show up in orb spaces on the first two turns. It's possible that there might be a way for them to appear in these first couple turns, but from my exhaustive testing, I could not find one on any board until turn 3 hit. So despite the item tables here listing the Koopa Kid orb as 5% and 10% chances, keep in mind that those odds are 0% for the first two turns of the game, probably. Once four turns remain, the final four turns event will commence. The event is hosted by Bowser who makes Koopa Kid give the current standings and then lets the player in last place spin the roulette wheel, which again rolls too fast to time, giving them one of the following. Blue spaces and red spaces are worth triple the number of coins, so characters gain or lose 9 coins, as well as gaining 15 coins when landing on their own character spaces, yellow orb spaces only. If this gets selected and you already have a decent sum of cash, then start spending more at the item shop to up your count for the shopping star. The boost in profits from blue spaces will make up for the extra coins you'll be spending. Not only that, but if you're grabbing super mushrooms, then you'll also be able to move more spaces for the running star. Receive 40 coins, as in last place gets 40 coins. That's it. I guess if you're in fourth place, then this ain't a half bad result, especially if you're playing on Pagoda Peak, where stars can get costly, or Windmillville, where coins are essential to your survival. 10 Koopa Kid spaces are added to the board, landing on any blue space, red space, or character space. Yes, including your own if you're the one that triggered this event. 
pretty unfair if you ask me. If this event gets selected while you're way behind in coins, then it can be a plus for you considering one of Koopa Kid's events is Bowser Revolution. Other than that though, you landing on a Koopa Kid space while in last place can still hurt you a bit, so this event isn't the nicest to the person that rolls the roulette. The price of stars is halved, only appears on Grand Canal and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. This event is so straightforward that sometimes players will forget it's even active at times. Make sure you remember that the star's cost is now 10 coins instead of 20 so that you don't accidentally skip the item shop thinking you need to save up more coins than you actually need. The price of riding chain chomps is halved, only appears on Pyramid Park. This event is kind of bonkers. Considering that the gimmick of this board has you potentially stealing multiple stars at a time, reducing the cost to you said gimmick can definitely cause some chaos. What may have been an aw oh man moment where you don't have enough coins to capitalize on players in front of you turns into an opportune time to obliterate them. Hence why this roulette result is actually pretty good for last place since they likely don't have many coins to work with. All red spaces become Bowser spaces, only appears on Pagoda Peak, Windmill, Ville and Neon Heights. You can see upward of 11 red spaces turning into Bowser spaces if you're on Neon Heights, which is absolutely insane and incredibly scary, but fun. So much fun to the point where I wish the Final Four Turns event lasted longer. I love seeing people panic as they land on the Bowser space in this game. If this event gets selected, then avoid the new spaces like the Plague by using as many movement orbs as possible. Or don't hope you get a multiplayer Bowser minigame and watch your opponent and squirm. I glossed over it earlier, but I do want to repeat that the Bowser Roulette here, like all the others, goes way too fast to time, so it's not really worth talking about. Bowser Time! Bowser Time is an event that only appears in this title, occurring every 5 turns. The gauge always starts at 0% when the game begins, and each turn after every minigame, the gauge will increase by 20%. The process repeats until the gauge is full, at which point Bowser will show up, do something sinister, and the gauge resets itself at 0%. When the game winds down to its last 4 turns, the gauge does not appear or fill up. Depending on the number of turns in the match, Bowser time may occur only once or up to 9 times. There are many different events that can occur during Bowser time, many of which are specific to each board and will be covered in each board section respectfully. There is one Bowser time event that occurs on all boards except Bowser's Enchanted Inferno. Bowser will take a picture of the players and make them pay 10 to 20 coins for it. The amount he selects is isn't based on anything but good ol' RNG, and the chances of each option being selected is based on the flip of a coin. Every now and then, Bowser will photobomb the picture as it's taken, which doesn't affect the event at all other than giving you and your homies a laugh. Regardless, he won't give you the photo at the end of the event, so no matter what, it's a ripoff. We'll go over how dangerous this event is on each board as we talk about each one. Speaking of which, before we move on to the board section, I should let you know that most of the advice I'm gonna give will pertain to the board itself. There are millions upon millions of different orb space combinations that can pop up in different games, and we quite literally do not have the time to talk about each one. This doesn't mean I won't be covering certain orb space layouts in the boards at all, just that I'll be honing in on more notable placements that you should look out for, whether you're the aggressor or the victim. What will make the biggest difference in your games is keeping track of what each orb space's effect is. Recall that in this title, the face of the orb space depicts the owner, not what orb it is, making it crucial that you memorize what an opponent placed down so that you know what you're dealing with. Imagine landing on an opponent's orb space thinking that you're only going to lose 10 coins to a hammer bro when in reality the orb was a pink boo and now you're losing an entire star, so make sure you do your best to memorize. If that fails, then try asking everyone but the owner of the space what was placed down. Hopefully they're truthful. We've sailed into Grand Canal, here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of red spaces at 9. It's time to remind ourselves once more how the star space works. Oh man. On Grand Canal and Bowser's Enchanted Inferno, when you buy a star, the star space itself will move to another random location. However, only certain spaces have been programmed to host a star. We refer to these spaces as star spaces. When a star space isn't active, it'll look like an average blue space. Let's say you're in the middle of a jolly old game. You remember that these 7 star spaces have been deactivated activated and you notice that the current active star space is this one. With that being the scenario, where do you think the next star will pop up? 
it's here, since all the other spots are either currently deactivated or will deactivate after its star has been purchased. This title retains the star space quirk present in Mario Party 6. Let's say this was the order the star space is activated in. Once they've all been activated, the game will simply repeat that same order over and over again. It'll randomly activate one star space after another, but once they've all been activated, that same order will keep repeating. But there's one curveball this title throws into the mix. A star cannot spawn on the space that a player is standing on. In other words, the star will skip any star space that is currently occupied by a player and move on to the next star space in the cycle. Let's say the star cycle went in this order. You see that the star is currently on star space 1, and you just purchased it. Normally, it would move to star space 2, right? But because another player is on that space, the star will skip that space and will instead move to star space 3, the next one in the cycle. The same is true if more than one player is on a star space. Let's say you just purchased a star on star space 3. Normally, it would move to Star Space 4, right? But because Star Space 4, Star Space 5, and Star Space 6 have a player occupying each of those spaces, the star will instead pop up at Star Space 7. This mechanic definitely mixes things up for better and for worse. Let's start with the latter. If stars skip star spaces that players are on, then figuring out what the cycle is becomes more difficult. Let's say you're on the early turns and you just purchased the first star of the game here by the docks. You see that the second star spawns by the bridge. Now, normally, you can assume that the star you just purchased is star space 1 in the cycle, and the star that popped up is star space 2 in the cycle. But here's the twist. One of your opponents was currently on this boat, where a star could spawn. See the problem? You have no way of knowing for sure whether the second star space in the cycle is by the drawbridge or on this boat and was simply skipped just now, thus making it more difficult to use the star cycle to your advantage. What if when you purchase a star, multiple players are on different star spaces at the time? In that case, there are dozens of possibilities for what the star cycle could look like. Everything gets screwed up. This doesn't mean the star cycle is a hopeless endeavor, though. You can still make educated guesses based on what you've seen and how quickly the cycle repeats, but man does it get a bit messy. In the event that the star cycle is tampered with a little bit or not at all, and you have a good idea of what it looks like, then not only can you simply predict where the star is going to pop up and move there like normal, but you can do something else. Here's the situation. One player is likely going to buy the star on their next turn. You know that when they purchase it, that the next star in the cycle will pop up right in front of you. Unfortunately though, you don't have enough coins to buy it when that happens but the threat behind you does. The current star gets purchased, the next one appears in front of you, as expected, and the threat laughs as you walk past the star broke as a joke, and they get to purchase it, furthering their lead. Could this have been avoided? Yes, with a technique I like to call star blocking. To pull it off, you need a slow shroom or some luck. Same situation, one player is going to buy the star in their next turn, the next star is going to pop up right in front of you, you have no coins, the threat behind you has a lot of coins. Instead of accepting defeat and walking past the star so that the threat can gain a greater lead, use your slow shroom and purposely land on the star space in front of you so that you block it from spawning there and force it to go to the next spot in the cycle, thereby successfully preventing the threat behind you from getting the star. If an opponent of yours knows this technique and executes it on you, then you first want to thank them for watching this video for me, and then focus on moving towards where the star is now going to pop up. Last thing, don't throw your orbs onto star spaces, for they will be wiped clean the moment the stars appear on the space. I didn't think star spaces could get any more complicated, but this title really went and upped the ante. It is for this reason, among others, that the slow shroom is extremely powerful. Never forget that. Here's this board's item table once more. The happening space on this boardwalk here makes you do a coin game, where the snotty shy guys throw a total of 20 coins along with spiny eggs at ya. This event will normally result in the player receiving about 10 to 15 coins if they perform well. Getting all 20 is a doozy due to how the spiny eggs can sometimes overlap with the coins themselves. Couple that with how quickly the coins despawn after hitting the ground, and you may as well not even bother trying to get all 20. I mean, it's not like there's some secret reward for doing so, right? A star. Yup, if you collect all 20, 20 coins in this event, the shy guy will offer to trade what you collected for a star. I didn't know this for the longest time, and that's probably because I've never seen someone gather 20 coins in this event. 
Seriously, it is a struggle. You need to make sure you dart towards any coins that hit the floor as soon as possible, bouncing between them without any detours. The spinies make this difficult but doable if you're constantly charting out a route to grab coins and following it to a T without getting hit once. You heard me, not a single hit. For if you endure one, then your chances of getting that star is completely gone. Don't even think about it. The coin and spiny layout of this event is different each time, so even if you practice it, you can get some pretty unfair setups like multiple spinies and coins being within one another. Don't feel bad if you can't manage to grab them all when you're dealt that kind of hand. I do recommend training at this event a lot though, since 99% of players cannot do it consistently, and if you're part of the 1%, then this happening space is a free start to you, and just a sum of coins to others, which is a great advantage to have. It's not even like you have to trade all the coins you collected for a star anyways. You can say no, so there's no downside to gathering all 20. If you can land on this event, then you've got to consider whether or not the item shop is worth visiting, since you'd be skipping it by taking this top path. Do you need an orb right now, or do you need some coins? That'll depend on your situation. Landing on the happening spaces near the gondola houses makes a shy guy come out asking if you want a ride. Accepting this takes you to the gondola house on the other side of the board, collecting coins on the way. Again, if there's a total of 20 coins you can collect from this event, and again... I'm just kidding. Collecting all 20 coins does not net you a star. Would have been cool though. That golden 20 amount is the same whether you're heading right on the gondola or left. The most straightforward strategy to employ here is button mashing. If you do it well, then you'll gain about 15 coins out of 20, which ain't half bad, but we want more. Your aim should be trying to jump in between two coins at a time. Doing this will result in you collecting pairs within each jump. If you miss the first coin in a pair, then you jump too late. If you miss the second coin in a pair, then you jumped too early. Practice this timing so that you can consistently receive 20 coins each time you encounter this event. Even if you happen to miss a pair or two, you'll still be left with around 15 coins. And if you're awful at it, then you can always go back to button mashing the jump button instead, so there's no reason to try the strat that nets you more. While the coins are definitely tempting, you should take a good look at the map before deciding whether or not to move to the other side of the board. There may be a star up ahead on your path that's calling your name, but on the other hand, there could be a star on the opposite side doing the same. So look out for the star's positioning or next position and decide if landing on the space with a slow shroom is a solid move or not. This happening space looks like it's on the leaning tower of Pisa, but it doesn't seem to be- oh, there it is. Activating it will cause cheap cheap after cheap cheap to squirt at you all the way back to the start without fail. This can be immensely frustrating if you were trying to reach one of the two star spaces up here, or if you were just minding your own business vibing on the top side of the board. While I can't get too mad at upping my happening count, this is certainly an event I normally don't like, unless I need a certain orb from the item shop down here, or if the star happened to spawn behind me, but that's fairly unlikely. A slow shroom can guarantee that you don't land on this happening, but I'd much rather save it for landing on one of the many powerful happenings on this board. Instead, try using a mushroom or a super mushroom to skip it, or just hope you don't land on it entirely. The happening space in front of the juggling blooper activates a guessing game, where blooper juggles four chests that have a star, a coin bag worth five coins, a dark star, and nothing. Receiving a dark star will cause you to lose a star. If you don't have any stars, then nothing happens. Participating in this happening event is mandatory if you land on the space. You can't say no. So if you have a star that you need to hold on to, then you best make sure that you execute this game properly. It'll start out pretty lax, with the blooper slowly tossing around chest after chest. What normally happens here is that players get comfortable with this speed and then get blindsided by the sudden difficulty spike, where the blooper throws the chest around very fast before asking which one you want. Be prepared for this. Anticipate the speed up and keep your eyes locked onto where the star chest is going. There is no predetermined outcome or luck for us to identify. It is a straightforward, watchful eye game, and it's one, like the 20 coin shy guy event from earlier, that you'll want to practice since, again, you can nab a star from it. Theoretically, if you just keep grabbing slow shrooms and consistently land on the snobby shy guy and blooper event performing well at each, then you can rack up the stars that way. Sounds fun, but not doable unless you get good at each of them. If you land on either of the two happening spaces on the stone drawbridge, then it'll open and send every player that's on the bridge to a random red space or blue space on the board, including character and Koopa Kid spaces, except for the two spaces on the drawbridge itself. 
multiple players launching does not mean that they will land on the same space. The game treats each launch as its own thing. As you can imagine with an event like this, it varies a lot on how useful it is. On one hand, you could be launched and land behind a star, whereas on the other hand, you could land in the middle of nowhere. There's really no telling where it's gonna send you. This event is best used when you have a mushroom or super mushroom in stocks that you can negate the potential of landing somewhere you don't want to be. Landing on this space unprepared will often result in disappointment as it throws you into one of the worst positions imaginable. It's certainly not a happening space that I would purposely land on with a slow shroom. There are much better ones on this board to use it for. Bowser time! Bowser will do one of three things, all having an equal chance of occurring. The first possible event is that photograph event we talked about earlier, where he'll take 10 to 20 coins from each player. The second possible event is that he'll flatten one of the two orb shops on the board and replace it with one of his own, where any player that passes it will be forced to enter and pay 20 coins for a worthless item or a Koopa Kid orb, which immediately gets thrown onto a random blue space or red space on the board. After a single player loses coins at the Bowser shop, Bowser will leave and the shop will return to normal. If you have zero coins when visiting the Bowser shop, then he'll pity you and give you 10 coins. This does not cause him to leave because he's here to cause havoc and he ain't going till someone loses some coins. In rare cases, you'll purposely want to visit the Bowser shop to either boost your shopping bonus star by 20 coins or to be gifted 10 coins by the big brute. Otherwise, it's generally something you want to stay away from and let someone else bite the bullet for. The third possible event is that Bowser will blow up the main three bridges on the board and replace them with his Bowser bridges that contain three Bowser spaces each. We went from a board with zero Bowser spaces to nine. That's kind of scary. Funny enough, if you're on the bridge when he blows it up, you'll remain in the same spot that you were before. No going back to start for you. It's this event's existence that prevents me from placing orb spaces anywhere on these bridges. What's the point of throwing them there if they're just going to get replaced by Bowser later on? It's a much better move to place your orbs on this reverse L-shaped path here. That's because if players go for this star space, this one, this one, this one, this one, or the blooper happening, then they will eventually walk through here, making it the number one spot to craft your lane of chaos. There really isn't any other spot on the board that's more viable. The bridges kind of are, if not for the potential Bowser event, and there are a couple spaces here and there that players can't avoid eventually moving towards, but other than that, this lane's your best bet. We already spoke about this junction and how most of the time the item shop's the way to go, but this junction is where things get more complicated. The top path has three star spaces, whereas the right path also has three, and with the second and third junction within this one, letting you adapt to situations that may pop up. The top path, on the other hand, is a huge commitment, totaling 35 spaces that you're locked into before reaching another junction. That's the same length of spaces that the longest route in Bowser Nightmare is. While this path certainly does boast the blooper and gondola happening, it, unlike the right path, has no item shop nor way of altering your path, except the gondola, after taking it, making it rather risky if you don't have any orbs on hand to help out. If you're considering which path to take, then seriously keep in mind the star cycle and what your chances are on reaching one of the stars should you make this hefty commitment. The bridge junction will often see you taking the lower route since it leads to the item shop and two star spaces, whereas the higher route leads you to the never-ending path. Not much reason to take that path unless you're desperate for DK. This lower junction's right path has an instant item shop and orb space, and two star spaces close by with a DK space to boot, quite a display, whereas the bottom path is quicker by over half the spaces with a dual space to tease you with. The right path should be safe in the early games, but near end game it can be scary with the amount of orbs that have been thrown about there, so watch out for them. The item shop is always great to visit, and grabbing another ore by the end is a great boost too. This is normally the route you'll be taking unless you're trying to take the shortcut and speed ahead your opponents. I'd save mushrooms and super mushrooms for whenever you have to take the top path. Slow shrooms are fantastic to land on the amazing happening spaces here. Flutter is best used when sniping a star from your opponent, especially if it's one of the stars at the top of the board that they committed themselves to. You should prioritize throwing all the yellow orbs in the bottom right corner here as discussed earlier. 
Spiny can do damage just about anywhere, whereas Tweester should mainly see usage right before a star or before a star space that's about to contain a star. The Fireball Orb struggles here due to players often being spread out because of all the branching paths. The ideal situation would be if all players committed to the top path. That way, they can't run from getting burned. The Flower Orb shouldn't be used on Spinies too often and should instead be saved for the more chaotic Tweester. The Egg Orb will likely be used down here where orbs tend to go most of the time. Slurp them up. Vacuum Orb the Magic Orb and Triple Shroom Orb are amazing on the top route since they reduce the astronomical amount of time you would otherwise spend there. Overall, Grand Canal is full of a billion different strategies to employ with its many useful happening spaces, star spaces that are scattered everywhere, and wide selection of orbs to place down on tons of different locations. Practice the happening events here and be on the lookout for good opportunities to crush the competition. You've arisen to Pagoda Peak, here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, that has the least amount of total spaces out of any board in the first seven Mario parties. I never would have guessed that considering how tall it is. Here's this board's item table. The Koopa Master will give a character who reaches the peak of the mountain a star for the number of coins shown above his house. 10, 20, 30, or 40. Each time someone trades coins for a star from him, the price of each additional star will go up by 10 coins to a maximum of 40 coins. After a star is bought for 40 coins, it resets back to 10 coins. You need to manage the amount of spaces you have as you attempt to reach the mountaintop while the coin amount required is at its lowest. Purchasing a star for 40 coins while a threat does it for only 10 is rough, and there may be instances where you're helping a player reach the mountaintop first so that your threat gets the higher amount when they reach it. There's a lot of back and forth that can happen here, but none of it matters if we don't know how the happening spaces work. Landing on the one near the start lets Toadsworth ask if you want to use one of his bottle rockets. Accepting lets you choose which one to ride on, where you'll then be taken to this space higher up or back to the start. The chances of each result are about 50-50, and it doesn't actually matter which rocket you select since both of them are rolling between the two results anyways. The first result gives you an insane boost of 20 eight spaces up the board that can absolutely flip the game on its head as you snatch the star from a player that thought they had it in the bag or to avoid the many orb spaces that players have scattered everywhere. The downside of going back to start is basically non-existent since it's only four spaces away. I'm unsure why the devs didn't place this event a little higher up the mountain. I feel like it would have made the decision less obvious and add some more risk, because as it stands now, this is an event that you almost never want to say no to. Maybe you'd say no if the price of the star is super high and you can't afford it, or if you need to buy an orb at the item shop up ahead head, but more often than not, giving it your best shot is the way to go. There are two gongs of fate on the board, one up top and one down below. They both function the exact same. Above a gong, you'll see the current price of a star. Landing on a happening space next to a gong will cause that price to roll like a roulette. You must then decide when to bash the gong, for once you do, the number the roulette stops on will become the new price of a star. When the roulette starts rolling, you will not be given the option to hit it until it makes one full revolution. Only then will the prompt to press A show up. This would make the gong predictable and easy to manage, but unfortunately after you hit the gong, there's no telling how many results it'll cycle through. Sometimes it's 7, sometimes it's 9, there's no pattern for what it decides, meaning it's ultimately random. You are more likely to change the price than to keep it on the current one just due to basic probability, but even that doesn't mean all too much when there's no real way to purposely land on a gong space. Recall that this board is a straight line with zero junctions. On top of that, the slow shroom is not available here, so you have minimal options if you want to land on a certain space. I keep an eye on what players are next to gongs as you scale the mountain. If you're about to reach the star while the price is low, but someone's next to a gong, then use your mushroom or super mushroom to prevent them from screwing you over. At the end of the gong event, the Master Koopa will gift you 1 to 10 coins. At the happening space next to the waterfall, you'll be tasked with grabbing the coins that appear from the hole at the top of the falls. Pressing A, no matter how long you hold it, will cause you to jump kick to the other side. The goal is to collect as many coins as possible while avoiding the logs. There will always be 10 coins to collect in this game, no matter what, and if you manage to collect all 10, then you will be given a star. In Grand Canal, getting a star from one of the happenings is great, but getting one here in Pagoda Peak, where stars are often 30 to 40 coins a 
pop and require you to travel an entire mountain to reach them is amazing. And luckily, this event is super easy once you get the hang of it. You obviously want to avoid the log since running into one will stun you and cause one of the coins to slip on by. When collecting the coins, stop jumping so late. If I have to see one more person jump super late for a coin, then I'm gonna lose my mind. Their late jump will either result in them missing the coin entirely or barely getting the coin, but due to the late jump, they can't jump again in time to get coins that appeared right after. The reason why players jump so late in this event is because they underestimate just how high their character goes when in the air. So take a good look at the height reached here, practice the timing to this fairly easy event, and you should be able to consistently obtain star after star whenever you activate it. The happening space next to the Blazing Lion statue has you attempted to put out the flames by mashing A. Depending on how quickly you start your mashing, the amount of button presses required to put out the flames is between 60 to 70, meaning at worst you need to be averaging 7 button presses per second to clear it. The possible rewards are a coin capsule, which will grant you 5 to 20 coins, a Master Koopa t-shirt, which is worth nothing, or a star. Here are the probabilities for each reward based on repeated testing in different conditions. What sucks here is that the Do Nothing t-shirt has a 20% higher chance to show up than the star, and while that is frustrating, that doesn't mean you should just give up whenever you land on this space. Make sure you mash as fast as possible just in case you get super lucky with the star or just regular lucky with some coins. Landing on the happening space on the dragon's tongue will have you spat all the way back to the start, a punishment you do not want to suffer if you're looking to reach the star that's only two spaces away from said happening. Use your mushroom or super mushroom at the ending section here to avoid this from happening. Bowser time! Bowser will do one of four things all having an equal chance of occurring. The first possible event's the photography one. It can be a bummer to deal with if you're at the top of the mountain and lose just enough coins to not be able to afford a star. The second possible event is the replacing orb shop one, which unlike Grand Canal, can't be easily avoided since you're on a straight line, so you'd better hope that someone else reaches Bowser City first. The third possible event is that Bowser will leap off the mountain and smash through one of the three bridges. Any roll that would normally take you over the bridge will instead stop at the space before it instead. The bridge reappears at the start of the next turn. If you're behind a bridge that's destroyed, then you could throw one of your orbs onto the space before it. This way, if any player next to you rolls high enough to reach the bridge, they'll be forced to land on your space. Even if no one else is around, increasing the odds of landing on your own space is always nice. This bridge destruction, oddly enough, prevents you from throwing an orb over the broken bridge. Weird. In a situation like this, the cannon could be of great assistance so that you aren't left behind by your opponents. The fourth possible event is that Bowser will, again, leap off the mountain, but this time he'll land on a lower area, causing a tremor that'll send all players falling to a lower part of the board. This event functions very similar to the sneeze happening event on Towering Treetop from Mario Party 6. And just like that event, this one comes with a good old guide that'll let you know where a player will fall depending on which space they were on when this event triggers. For example, if you're on this space when Bowser lands, then you'll end up back at the start. If you're here on this red space, then you'll end up down at the first gong. While most of these paths make intuitive sense, some don't, such as this red space by the waterfall. You would think that the player would simply fall down onto the happening space directly below them, right? But nope, it launches them down and to the left onto one of the dual spaces. Strange. You'll also notice that some spaces share the same landing spot, such as these three that'll throw you to the aforementioned red space or, wackiest of all, the first gong happening space, which sends you all the way back to the start. The more you look at this guide, the more it becomes clear that not all spaces are made equal, which makes some parts of the board scarier to be on when Bowser time strikes than others. All that aside, we talked before about how there aren't any junctions on this board, which means that which orbs you purchase and how you use them are critical here. The cannon orb can only be found here on Pagoda Peak. When used, it'll launch you up the mountain. It can only shoot you to a blue space space, red space, character space, or Koopa Kid space. Nothing else. The average amount of spaces it'll send you is around 10 to 15. This amount can be as few as a single space if, for some reason, you decide to use it on the second to last space of the mountain, since it can't shoot you any higher. And if you use it on the tip top of the mountain, 
Well, it'll malfunction, blow up, and keep you on the same space, you dork. It's pretty dang useful if you pick it up from an orb giving space, but it's not something I'd personally purchase for 20 coins if I was in first or second. Use it like you would a metal mushroom to avoid annoying orbs like the zap. Just keep in mind how many spaces away an item shop is, because if one is 10 spaces away, then you're gonna accidentally skip it. Yellow orbs in particular have a massive buff on this board since players can't detour to a different path to avoid them. Almost every spot on the board is a great place for them because of this, but certain spots are worse than others. I would avoid placing any yellow orbs within 5 spaces of the starting area, since two events, the dragon happening and rocket happening, can cause players to end up there, making it easy for your opponents to simply replace your orb. Those events aside, players will often use their mushrooms near the top of the mountain to ensure they reach the star. Because of this, they'll often roll past the first 5 spaces after start, again making this section less useful. The few spaces after this space or great candidates to have some orbs on them since they're the few spaces that someone using the rocket happening can't skip. Other than those two spots, pretty much every other area is fair game for yellow orbs. The zap orb is fantastic when used in front of a player, but even better when it's used in front of a player getting ready to use a mushroom at the top of the mountain. Unless their wallet is huge, they will lose a ton of coins as they scale. Concerning the warp pipe orb, do not, under any circumstances, place this orb within the first 10 spaces of the starting spot. Doing so can cause a situation like this. Player 1 throws down a warp pipe a space ahead of the starting spot. Player 2, who is at the top of the mountain, rolls and reaches the top, where they purchase a star and are taken down to the starting spot. They then move their remaining spaces, and oh, look at that! The warp pipe sent them back to the space where they started their movement. Under normal circumstances, this would be a dandy way of wasting someone's time, but here, this player gets to visit the mountaintop again and purchase another star. So I will say once more, do not throw a warp pipe within the first 10 spaces of this starting spot. Also avoid placing it directly after item shops to prevent players from visiting the same item shop twice. The Babam orb only shows up here in Pagoda Peak. When a player activates it, they'll be sent down to a lower part of the board. This orb's effect functions exactly like Bowser's Tremor event during Bowser time, except only towards the player that activates the orb, meaning that, thankfully, the same guide applies. Any space you'd fall on due to the Tremor event is the the same space you'd fall on due to activating a Babam. The only difference between the Babam guide you see right now and the Tremor guide from before is that this only includes blue spaces and red spaces, and that's because you can only throw a Babam orb onto a blue space or red space. Memorizing the overall guide will give you a great advantage, especially when it comes to throwing down Babams since you'll know which spaces do the most damage to a threat's position, like this section up here which will send your foes far down the mountain. Keep in mind all the different kinds of outcomes and you can manipulate your opponent's placements to a scary degree. The Fireball Orb is most effective on this board since it's small and has no junctions, leaving opponents little room to run away from your flaming fury. The Flower Orb can avoid devastating drawbacks such as running into a Zap Orb with a high roll or getting thrown back by a Babam. Don't use this orb willy-nilly though, since some Babam placements, as we discussed earlier, aren't all that bad and are worth getting hit by if it means holding on to your Flower Orb, and some Warp Pipe placements can actually help you in either buying a second item at an item shop or better yet reaching the star again, so make sure that the roadblock orb you run into will actually hurt your game a lot before deciding to flower past it. The egg orb is pretty great here since it can delete the many orb spaces you'll inevitably come into contact with throughout the course of the game. Find the longest line of them and make them yours. The vacuum orb should be used when players have a lot of coins, obviously, but even more so if the star's current price is at 40 so that you can prevent other players from purchasing it while you stay in the lead. The magic orb and triple shroom orb are great all-rounders for climbing the mountain, but be careful when using the triple shroom, for if there's a zap orb on the mountain, then you have no way of avoiding it, so look ahead before you make a foolish action. Overall, Pagoda Peak is an incredibly linear board with few options available to the players to make an impact, which is why it's vitally important to make sure you know which orbs are more useful to grab, when and where to use said orbs, and how to properly execute the waterfall happening for an extra star, which will greatly help out your game. You've traveled to Pyramid Park, here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most average space layout out of all the boards in this game. Here's this board's item table. Each player
player starts with 5 stars or more depending on the star handicap, and the objective is to steal stars from other players via riding chain chomps. There are 4 dog houses on the board, and when a player reaches one, they have the option of paying coins to ride a chain chomp. The 3 dog houses on the right side of the board lets players ride on them for a price of 10 coins for 1 dice block, 5 during the final 4 turns, or 20 coins for 2 dice blocks. 10 during the final 4 turns. The regal looking doghouse on the left is home to the red chomp, which lets players ride him for a price of 10 coins for 3 dice blocks, 5 during the final 4 turns. This makes the left part of the board infinitely more dangerous than the right, for even players that are low on coins are able to burst ahead in placements for basically nothing at all. You'd think that reaching a junction while riding something as unwieldy as a chain chomp would result in a random direction being chosen, but nope, you can choose which way you'd like to go where wherever you want, except for this Womp here who requires you to pay 10 coins to take this path, which we'll cover later, but other than him, you can go wherever you want. You don't have to pass a player to steal a star from them, landing on their space is good enough. If you come across multiple unfortunate souls that are on the same space together, then you'll steal a star from each of them, which can be fantastic if you manage to pull it off, although unlikely with how many branching paths this board has. If you pass a red orb space while on a chomp, then it won't activate. The same is true if you land on its space after riding a chomp. I really thought they would change this detail for Mario Party 6, but I guess not. Landing on a regular orb space after having ridden a chain chomp will activate its effect, so don't think you're safe from these guys. While using chain chomps to pass over the effects of red orbs is great and all, that doesn't make these orbs completely useless on this board. Your aim shouldn't be to place them randomly in the middle of paths, but to disrupt other players from using chain chomps to steal your stars. You could place a twister or thwomp orb right behind one of the doghouses to either whoosh them away from hurting you or delay them from doing so by one turn. The spiny isn't as effective at stopping mayhem from ensuing, but placing it right before the red chomp on the left side of the board can definitely help you in preventing someone with barely enough coins from going on a rampage. When considering who to target while on a chain chomp, look at how close everyone is to a doghouse, how many coins they have, and think about their likelihood of gaining any stars in the upcoming turns. This will help you determine who looks like a big threat now versus who could be a huge threat in the near future. The snack orb mentioned a while back prevents a chain chomp from stealing from you one time. It will not get rid of the chain chomp, but will instead force it to skip the space you're on free to steal stars from anyone else it comes across, unless they have a snack orb too. This means that if you're riding a chain chomp and approach a space with multiple players on it, and at least one of them has a snack orb active, then it'll protect everyone on that space from losing a star since you're now forced to skip to the next space. While this can suck if you're the aggressor, it's something to take advantage of if you're on the defensive. Imagine a player behind you is ready to steal a star of yours, but a player ahead of you has a snack orb active and has already moved that turn. If you're able to land on their space, then you can guarantee your safety even if the snack orb isn't yours. Unfortunately, there is no slow shroom on this board, so purposely landing on spaces here is difficult, but the situation might pop up considering this board's many junctions. Landing on the happening space in front of the oasis lets you swim in it while desert goombas throw out coins. However, clap traps are also present, and if you get bitten by one, then you can lose up to 3 coins per bite. These guys are fast, and basically impossible to avoid at times since you can't outswim them. If you thought this event was anything like the Shy Guy one in Grand Canal, then you'd be mistaken since gathering all 30 coins here is a pipe dream. Even if you somehow manage to pull off gathering them all, you won't, the desert goombas don't give you a start for your efforts like the Shy Guys do. When the timer hits 10 and 7, a coin bag worth 5 coins will drop down. Make sure you prioritize grabbing it above all else. It's unlikely that 5 or more coins will be gathered in one spot at the time of this bag dropping, so it's definitely the most important objective. While the clap traps are fast, you can avoid them by doing a quick swim around, but even then your efforts can feel like they're in vain. Keep on the lookout for large pools of coins, swim towards them, and do your best at this unfair event. Then. Landing on the happening space in front of the Bowser Sphinx awakens it, and it's not feeling very nice. It'll accuse you of trying to steal its treasure and subject you to what it calls a curse. There are three possible outcomes. The first is that it'll divide all the player's coins equally, just like Bowser Revolution. This can be amazing if you're low on coins, and since all these events have an equal chance of appearing, is absolutely worth landing on this space for if you're looking to even the playing field. The second is that it'll turn all blue spaces into red spaces 
spaces and all red spaces into blue spaces for two turns. This sounds like nothing until you consider that there are way more blue spaces than red spaces, resulting in a board full of red for the next two turns. And by two turns, I mean right after two minigame cycles have passed. The third result is that it'll allow the Chain Chomp rides to be half price for two turns, said two turns working the same way we just talked about. This price slash can be a brutal event to endure as it allows players with basically nothing to obliterate people in front of them. Take a good look at where everyone is after activating this to see if you may need to use a movement orb to get to a safe spot. All of these events, whichever you get, have their own uses, but in order to take this route in the first place, you've got to pay this Womp 10 coins to pass. On a board where 10 coins is what it takes to ride on a regular chain chomp for one dice block, this amount can be overkill at times, so you've got to think about the possible outcomes that the Sphinx will put you through and whether or not they'd assist you. The Sphinx aside, there's an orb giving space here along with a dual space and Bowser space, so maybe it'd be worth taking this path for those, but running through here will cause you to skip the red chomp at the top of the board who can be a game changer. If you're gonna take this route then you'd better have a good reason going into it. And and there is a reason that you may have not considered. Recall that players can't enter this path while on a chain chomp, so if a threat is about to use the red chomp above you and is aiming on stealing your star, then this route is your safe haven, denying your opponent of the steal. Not bad. The two happening spaces above the quicksand on either side of the board causes all players in the spaces above the quicksand to sink in. The players are then spat out on the other side of the board, one space ahead of the respective quicksand pit. This event reminds me of the quicksand pit in Spiny Desert from Mario Party 3. If a threat's attempting to reach a chain chomp and you can purposely send them and yourself away from the chomp so that they can't get any stars, then that sounds like a good move to me. Just be careful that you don't put them in an even better position than before. After all, this quicksand pit is only a few spaces behind the red chomp. Seriously, try visiting this guy as much as possible. A single dice block is not very reliable, but three is insane. Don't underestimate estimate him. Landing on the happening space in front of the jars gives you the option of playing a whack -a cobra game. Simply tilting the control stick in the direction you like will cause you to swing that way. You'll get a coin for every cobra hit, but if you hit Monty, then the game will end immediately. But you'll still earn coins for every cobra hit, regardless of what color they were. The amount this game offers varies between about 12 and 16 coins. It's pretty easy as long as you avoid hitting Monty and doesn't require much practice to get good at, so consider this space as a free 10 coins, just trust in your reaction time. Bowser time! Bowser will do one of four things, all having an equal chance of occurring. The first possible event's the good old souvenir photograph, where getting 10 or 20 coins deleted can be absolutely painful if you were right behind a chain chomp ready to wreak havoc, so make sure you're saving up. The second possible event is the Bowser Shop Takeover, which can be skipped if you're riding a Chain Chomp, so don't think you're totally screwed if you're on your way there. The third possible event is Bowser summoning a Sandstorm to destroy both bridges. What does he have against bridges anyways? All players are then stuck on the side they were on for three full turns. All character spaces and Koopa Kid spaces that were on the bridges will return when the bridges are built, so no worries there. Any players that get caught in a bridge as it's destroyed are sent back to the start. Since all of the orb shops on the board are on bridges, you can't buy any orbs for the duration of this event. If one of Bowser's shops is on a bridge when it gets destroyed, then his shop will remain even after the bridge gets repaired. How kind of him. There's a lot to take in with this event, but your approach is simple. Do not get stuck in the left section of the board with a madman. I've seen some horrors play out where players are begging to get to the other side of the board for safety, while one player just keeps zipping around in a circle with a red chomp. If anyone's gonna be doing that, you want it to be you, not another player. Be extra careful when this event plays out and choose your paths carefully, for you and the other players are now on a much smaller board with much higher potential to steal from one another. The fourth possible event is Bowser stealing a star from first place and giving it to Koopa Kid who will move to one of five spots on the board. Meeting up with Koopa Kid normally results in nothing happening, because in order to get the star he has, you've got to follow the gimmick of the board and slam him with a chain chomp like any other player. This event can suck if you're the one in first place and can even ruin games at times if it comes down to the wire. If you and another player are first and second and have the same amount of stars, then you may want to consider staying 
staying just under their coin amount so they're in first place and they suffer from this event should it pop up. The junctions themselves will vary greatly on their usefulness depending on where each player is. What would normally be a fantastic path based on its spaces could end up being a terrible decision if there's no one there, so keep that in mind as we go through each one. The first junction's left path lets you grab an orb on your way to the left side, which will eventually have you reaching the Red Chop, a pivotal player in reigning over this board. That is, if you don't detour. The top path keeps you on the right side and can be quite useful at the beginning of a match if you're rolling last and multiple players are ahead of you. As a good rule of thumb, if you're rolling before everyone else at the beginning of the game, you should probably head left so you don't get immediately screwed over by someone behind you. The top right junction's top path brings you to the top right doghouse, where you'll want to be if there are any players on the outskirts of the right section of the board. If no one's there, then head right to not waste any time. This Junction's got three happenings on its path along with a doghouse at the end, which is very tempting, but do keep in mind that going on the right side here leaves you open to any players up above. You should also consider how much quicker heading down is if you need to get over to the left side of the board where the other players are. This path also has a DK space for good measure if you need some coins or a star if you're lucky. We covered the junction including the Womp earlier, so let's talk about the top left junction, where you should almost always be going up. Reaching this part of the board takes a while and the reward for doing so is grand with the red chop. There are not many reasons to go right here other than simply having an empty wallet or if the doghouse to the right is a better move. The red chop is that good. Well, I guess DK's here too. Thanks, big guy. The last junction next to the top bridge takes you over to the right side, which is a decision that comes down to where everyone is. Most of the time, you want to position yourself behind as many players as possible and obliterate them with a chain chomp, then return behind them quickly. If heading right helps you accomplish that, then that's your move, and item shop never hurt anyone. Staying on the left side of the board can also be good if players are there, but if there aren't any, then you're going to be suffering from a low orb count. This is because you aren't visiting the item shop and there's only one orb giving space out in the open on this side as opposed to the right sides too. The other orb giving space on this part of the board is on the Womp Path which is most certainly not out in the open considering you have to pay to go through. And even if you didn't have to pay to take this route, the orb giving spaces are separate from one another, making this section a little less useful when it comes to getting your orb count up as opposed to the right section, where there's more potential for stockpiling. Mushrooms and Super Mushrooms here double as an offensive and defensive tool. Use them to quickly close the gap to a chain chomp that players are right in front of so that they don't have enough time to get away from you. On the other hand, use them to escape from dangerous situations where opponents are about to reach a chain chomp that's directly behind you. If the red chomp is about to be activated by a threat and you're worried about them rolling high and reaching you, then you could mushroom to the womp path to protect yourself. These guys are incredibly versatile here and are absolutely worth purchasing whenever they pop up. Second, only to the snack orb which guarantees absolute protection. The main path for this board is incredibly short with only 5 spaces for you to place your yellow orbs on. Every other space on the board can potentially be avoided if players really want to so this is your best bet. This doesn't mean that all other placements are poor, however. Throwing strong yellow orbs such as the Piranha Plant or Pink Boo right behind the Red Chomp can be a great deterrent from players using this powerful tool. Not everyone's going to be willing to lose half their coins or a star to use this guy. Spear Guy's cool and all, but the aforementioned Piranha Plant is better in almost any scenario. Kamek's great for securing opponents' annoying orb spaces, but Toadia is a lot more useful for the sheer potential that you could delete someone's snack orb. The Fireball Orb struggles a ton here due to the many branching paths players can take, which reduces the odds of stealing from multiple players in a row. Couple this with just how fast players can run from you via riding chain chomps and you won't have much fun burning people here. The flower orb is still incredible even in a place like this, who would have guessed? Having the ability to skip any tweesters or thwomps that opponents place behind doghouses is huge and lets you steal a star or stars when you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. The extra coins helps you keep your count up to use the doghouses as well. The agorb is also great at tackling the inevitable roadblock orbs behind doghouses, except 
except with it, you can use the annoying orbs yourself to flip the script on whoever tried to screw you over. Having the ability to claim any pink boo or piranha plant orbs that were placed down is a great bonus. The vacuum orb grants little protection from this board's gimmick. Just hope that you suck up enough coins from your rivals so that they can't afford a chain chomp, I suppose. The magic orb and triple shroom orbs are amazing here as they help you zoom from doghouse to doghouse, dogging on your foes left and right. And if you're not on the offensive, then you're running clean away from any threats. If you've got the magic orb in particular, then those pesky red orbs players place down are of no threat as you walk wherever you please. Overall, Pyramid Park, more than most sports, requires being acutely tuned to where everyone else is on the board. Your opponents, in essence, are moving star spaces that you can only obtain after riding a chain chomp, so keep observing how close everyone is to a doghouse, manage your mushrooms, and choose your paths carefully. Now arriving at Neon Heights, here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most total spaces. Here's this board's item table. Let's talk about this board's star gimmick. There are three treasure chests that can appear on a potential chest space, of which there are eight on the board. If you reach a chest, you have the option of paying 10 coins to open it. One chest contains a star, another contains 20 coins, and the last contains a bomb, which will blast you back to the start. Once the chest with the star has been purchased, three new chests appear. There is no star cycle whatsoever with these chests. They seemingly bounce the stars around at random, but there are a few quirks about the chest that can help us out a little in predicting them. When the chest with the star has been purchased, the three new chests that appear will always show up in spots that the previous three chests were not in, meaning that at no point will a chest show up in the same place twice. A chest location has to rest for at least one cycle before having the potential to show up again. In addition, just like the regular star spaces, any character orb that was placed on a chest space will be removed upon a chest spawning there. The star itself is completely content with bouncing between a couple or few chest locations multiple times in a row. It does not care about following any kind of order, and the same goes for the 20 coins and the bomb chests. So unfortunately, there is an element of luck here, but we'll do our best to identify it. If you visit the movie set area, you'll be given the option to play a coin game where you have 10 seconds to shoot as many of the 15 Koopa Kid targets as possible. However, you must avoid shooting the Toadsworth targets, for doing so will end the game and leave you with nothing, no matter how many Koopa Kids you shot down. Since each Koopa Kid is worth one coin, the maximum amount of coins you can gain from this game is 15. There are three lanes that the targets can pop up from, the front, middle, and back. The lane does not determine how fast a target will move. When trying to hit something in the back, you need to shoot a little earlier than you would for something in the front. Obviously, if one target is behind another, you're gonna hit the one in front, so keep that in mind as you fire to try and hit as many as possible. It is absolutely doable to hit all targets in this game every Every time, since the layout isn't the exact same every time, but it's pretty dang close. The only differences I've been able to spot between variations of this game is that sometimes, instead of going from left to right, certain targets will go from right to left. It seems like the devs didn't want to make a bunch of different versions of this little game, so they decided that reversing the direction targets came from would be easier. Either way, play this game enough and you'll certainly get used to the shenanigans and be able to pull ahead with some bonus coins. Just avoid hitting Toadsworth at all costs. One cute quirk about this game is that the director Shy Guy will refer to you by a certain title based on what character you're playing. Here's what they are for each character. These don't affect how the game gets played, they're just meant to be a neat little nickname. On the opposite side of the board is a baseball field. Here you have the option to participate in a home run contest coin game. The shooter will send five baseballs your way, each worth two coins if you manage to smack them out of the park, meaning ten coins is the maximum amount you can earn from this game. The speeds vary from really slow, to somewhat slow, to medium, to fast, to super fast. There's no telling which speed it's going to choose since sometimes it'll do multiple slow ones in a row just to mix it up with a super fastball. These quick pitches are the ones almost everyone can't hit consistently, and that's because people tend to look at the baseball as it comes out of the shooter and determine from there if it's a slow ball or fastball. And let me tell ya, this is not the way to do it. It's simply too slow and will result in you barely missing fastball after fastball. Stop looking at the ball and focus on the machine itself. 
Notice how whenever it's about to shoot, it'll puff up in size a bit. If it takes a long time to puff up, then the pitch will be slow. And if it puffs up quickly, then the pitch will be fast. This is the indicator you need to be looking at if you want to consistently hit all of its pitches every time. Don't be bummed if you can't fully get the hang of it, because even though this strat grants you some extra frames of reaction time, the super fast ball is super fast, so I don't blame you for missing. Little pointers, the game will never start off with a fastball and will always pitch you at least one fastball. It seems like these quick boys are more often than not dealt in the final two pitches rather than the early ones, but again, that's just what's likely. It ultimately comes down to you recognizing what pitch is coming next and reacting accordingly. The happening space at the top of the board will give you the option of shooting for the stars. Here you've got to pump fuel into a rocket for 10 seconds, and when you're done, you'll board the rocket and blast off, hopefully collecting coins, a coin bag worth 5 coins, and the illustrious star at the top not. Although there is a star at the top, you cannot pump enough fuel into the rocket to make it fly high enough to collect it. Your timing could be absolutely impeccable with your up and down, up and down, but no matter how hard you try, you will always come up short. Is this some kind of joke then? Is the star up here impossible to obtain? No, for when you inevitably don't reach it, the shy guy that runs this establishment says, I'd bet you'd climb even higher with a co-pilot. What he's referring to is this game's team battle mode, where you and another player, CPU, or friend can move together from space to space, and if you two land on this space, then you'll both be pumping fuel into the rocket at the same time for the 10 second duration. If each of you keep a good rhythm with your pumps, then obtaining the star becomes an easy task. Why the developers didn't edit this happening by bringing the star lower for a single pumper is beyond me. The fact that the Shy Guy has a line specifically alluding to team battles tells me that they were fully aware that a single person couldn't get the star and decided to just tease him with it. For my attempts, it seems like the coin bag is the highest one can go. Maybe a coin higher if their pumps are really accurate. When pumping, do not button mash. Just hold A, release A, hold A, release A at a quick pace. After that, about 11 coins will be yours for the taking. Not a bad event, just a mean one when you know the details of it. The happening space in front of the screen will give you the option to play a matching game, where you have to match as many panels as you can. If you miss a match, then the game ends and your reward is calculated. One pair gives you 5 coins, two pairs gives you 10, and matching all four pairs grants you a star. If you accidentally select the Bowser face that the game ends and you lose 10 coins. The possible matching icons are green shell, red shell, fire flower, egg, cloud, and cheap cheap. After you accept to playing the game, you'll see every panel individually flash for an instant, one after the other. It'll cycle between all panels twice before you begin your selections. Getting a star from this game is huge considering the random nature of how the star gimmick works on this board. When everything starts flashing, quickly dart your eyes everywhere and do your absolute best to memorize what each panel is. When you begin selecting, start by matching the ones that you know for sure. Afterwards, you'll be left with a pair, maybe two, of images where you can't remember where both are, but only one. In this case, select a panel that you don't remember the picture of, then, after seeing what it is, select the matching panel with the one you memorized. If you instead selected the one you memorized first, then you'd have to do a blind pick between panels that you don't remember. And while you can still succeed in doing this, your odds are better if you start with the one that you don't recognize first so that you can adapt based on what you get. There will always be the chance of you accidentally selecting the Bowser panel if you haven't memorized everything, so much better than these little tricks I'm talking about is practicing this matchmaking game and getting so good that even a couple flashes of the panels are enough for it to stick in your head. I wish I could tell you there was a huge trick with this whole deal, but the shy guy here really seems to have outdone himself with randomizing it. Landing on the happening space to the left of the Statue of Spaghetti or to the right of the right elevator makes a UFO come and scramble the locations of the chests. They will always be moved into completely new locations, exactly like how the chests react when the star chest is purchased. This is fantastic news because what it means is that if a threat is on their way to the chest with a star in it, you can try and purposely land on this space to deny them of the opportunity, and if you're lucky, give yourself an advantage considering there's a potential chest spawn on each of these spaces' respective paths. Bowser time! The first possible event is taking a photo with your friends. Losing 10 or 20 coins here isn't as punishing
punishing as it is on other boards like Pagoda Peak, considering that the chests here only cost 10 coins to open. The second possible event is Bowser will steal 10 coins from all of the players and put them into the chest that contains 20 coins, meaning the maximum amount of coins a chest could contain is 60 if every player had at least 10 coins in their wallet. This doesn't really change your game plan all that much. You should already be trying to reach as many chests as possible in the quickest time possible. One of the chests containing a ton of coins doesn't mean much considering you don't know which one it is. One interesting detail here though is that if the chest containing the star is opened before the chest that contains everyone's coins, then those extra coins are lost. The chest will go back to merely containing 20 coins. The third possible event is that Bowser will steal a star from first place and put it in the chest that contains a star, thereby making the star chest now contain two stars. This really sucks for first place. At least with Pyramid Park's version of the screw first place event, you knew where your stolen star was via Koopa Kid's location, but here your star could be in any of the three chests with no way of knowing. On top of that, whoever takes your star will also get the regular star reward. If you're in first place but only buy a few coins, then purchase an orb at the item shop so that your placing drops down to second, thereby preventing this event from screwing you over. The fourth possible event is that Bowser Bowser will put a dark star in a chest, where whoever opens it will lose a star. This replaces the Babam chest until the dark star is obtained or if the chest with a star is obtained. If you have a great lead in the game, then it honestly might be better to just opt out of buying any chest to avoid losing a star. You can always return to buying chests once someone else buys a star since the dark star will be gone by that point. Oh, by the way, these chest events can happen simultaneously. It's totally possible for one chest to contain a dark star, one to contain everyone's coins, and one to contain two stars. Just remember that the moment the star chest is bought, that every other chest event is gotten rid of. The left path on the starting junction merely continues onto the main path without any delay, whereas the right path detours quite a bit, but not without good reason. There are two chest spawns here, an orb giving space, and the matchmaker happening. Even if you end up opening the coin chest here instead of the star one, you'll be back on your way towards the main path on your very next turn with an orb to boot, so I'd say there's no harm in taking this route, especially if both chest spawns are here simultaneously. If no chest is on this path, then you're better off going left and onto to the main path where you'll eventually reach the left elevator junction. Both paths appear quite similar at face value, considering they each contain a happening space, a chest spawn, and an orb giving space. The crucial difference, however, is that the top path will eventually lead you to the right elevator junction, where you can continue to head right and either snatch a chest, visit the item shop, or land on DK. The bottom path, by comparison, stops you a little early, not allowing you to access the right side of the board. If a path reduces my options like that, then it better have something amazing to make up for it but unfortunately, this path just doesn't. It only saves you two spaces, and its UFO happening event isn't one you want to trigger all the time, whereas the rocket happening on the top path is always useful. I almost never go this way unless one of the chests is spawned here. This junction has a Koopa Kid toll on this left path where you have the option of paying 10 coins to take it. If not, then you'll be forced to enter the baseball diamond. The right path takes 14 spaces to reach the main route, whereas the shortcut takes 10, a force space save, which as we know can be significant under certain circumstances. But while this sounds great, consider the fact that going this way will cause you to skip the baseball coin game and an orb giving space as well. If it was just a normal path, then I wouldn't have many qualms with this, but the fact that you've gotta pay 10 coins to take it makes it much less desirable for me. I wouldn't cough up any cash here unless I had a great reason for doing so, like grabbing one of the chests, landing on the matchmaker happening, or to visit my good path. DK if I need him. The right elevator's junction leads to this junction we just talked about as well as the roundabout route to the right, where you've got an oddly placed item shop. Considering how out of the way it is, most of the purchases players make will be from the left item shop instead, which might be a mistake considering we're about to see just how powerful the orbs on this board can be. Mushrooms and super mushrooms are always a great grab and here is no different. Zip around the board from chest to chest, making sure you reach them before your opponents do. The slow shroom can assist you in landing on the matchmaker happening if you're good at it, or one of the UFO happenings if you need the chest to rearrange themselves in your favor. Other than those two situations, the slow shroom doesn't offer as much as it does on other boards. The rocket happening for sure isn't worth landing on considering the payout is poor when solo, and purposely landing on the matchmaker happening can be a bad move too if you're, well, 
bad at it. This isn't to say that the slow shroom is completely useless here, it's just more situational than on other boards. But don't worry, we've got the Lakitu orb to pick up the slack. It made its first appearance in Mario Party 5, where it would steal an orb from the player selected, but it wasn't invited to Mario 6 Party. That's okay though, cause it's back in different than ever. <laughs> Instead of stealing orbs, using the Lagatu orb here will cause you to steal one of the three chests. And before you get any funny ideas, the chest is picked randomly, so there is no guarantee that he'll grab the one with the star in it, but that's okay. You're about to see why this orb is pretty dang good. For starters, any chest it brings to you will open automatically. You do not have to pay any money to do so. This is a good plus because you'll likely get this orb from the shop instead of an orb giving space considering it doesn't show up in the first half of the game on those. Not to mention its price ain't half bad either, so long as you're not in first place. If all three chests are on the board when you use it, you've got a 1 in 3 chance of netting the star, the most desired result, a 1 in 3 chance of netting 20 coins, which is pretty much breaking even, and a 1 in 3 chance of getting sent back to start. These odds on their own aren't that bad, and keep in mind this is the worst setup. What if a player's already opened up the bob chest? Then you've got a 50-50 chance of napping the star or breaking even? What if both the bob chest and the coin chest was open? Then you've got a 100% chance of reeling in the star. And what's more, you can wait until the other players waste their turns getting close to it just to take it for yourself at the last moment. In some cases, the lack of two nabbing the bob chest may not even be a bad thing. What if you're at the top of the board and one of the chests is down here? Receiving the bob chest in this scenario will cause you to get closer to this lower chest spawn. The fact that you can roll after getting getting bob like this makes the strat perfectly viable and well worth considering if there's a chest or two down at this lower level. Where things can get really hectic with the Lakitu is when you start taking into account the Bowser events. If one of the chests gets filled with a Dark Star, then maybe save your Lakitu until after the Dark Star is gotten. On the other hand, if one chest has two stars thrown into it, then use your Lakitu and hope for the best. The main route has eight spaces for yellow orbs to get thrown onto making this board a pretty fun one to use them on, especially because players will find themselves looping back towards this spot pretty quickly in cases where they decide to take the shortcut paths. While Hammer Bro, Piranha Plant, and Toadie are all great here, Pink Boo is an absolute monster that you need to take advantage of. I have seen game after game decided by Pink Boo, and not just any old Pink Boo, but Pink Boo on one of these spaces. But not all eight of these guys were made equal. Some spots are better than others. This one here, for example, has potential for a chest to spawn on it, and considering three out of the eight chest spawns become active whenever a star is purchased, any orb someone throws here will undoubtedly get wiped away pretty quickly. The first three spaces or so after this junction aren't the best either, because if an opponent of yours reaches this junction with a few spaces left and sees that they're about to land on your pink boo, then they can simply head right to avoid it. The number one space you want to occupy with a pink boo is this guy right here. It's 10 spaces away from the first junction, and unless one of your opponents has a 10 or higher, then avoiding the chance of landing on this guy is very low. Oh, did I say 10 spaces away? I meant 9 if this chest is here. You might assume that the distance of this space being altered by 1 is no big deal, but I assure you it absolutely can be. I've seen players have a 9 at this junction and head left because they have it in their head that this deadly space is 10 spaces away just to find out that crap, it's 9 now because this chest is here. It's a small detail for sure, but one you shouldn't underestimate, especially if you're currently at this junction yourself. These few blue spaces down here are also great candidates for Pink Boo and your other orb friends if you manage to fill them up. If you see that an opponent has started crafting their kingdom here, then do your absolute best to knock it down orb by orb. I assure you that their Pink Boo will reap them rewards with enough patience. And if you're playing a game longer than 20 turns, it's just a matter of time before your star gets stolen. While these spaces are certainly incredible candidates, they are very prone to getting replaced by skilled players who know how good 
good they are, which is why you may want to consider playing anti-meta with these four spaces. They are not on the main route and can be skipped if a player pays 10 coins to head left at the toll junction, but this is irrelevant to why they're so powerful. To learn that, let's compare scenarios between each set of spaces. In our first scenario, your pink boo is on the mountain range and your opponent's about to roll. They do not want to land on that guy, obviously, so they're either going to replace your pink boo if they're close enough or use a movement orb to waltz on by if they can. In cases like these, you can't do much and kind of just have to take the L. In our second scenario, you have a pink boo orb on one of these four spaces and your opponent's about to roll, except they are currently nowhere near that space. So what do they have to worry about? They roll, buy a chest, and BAM! ba -bomb! They get blasted back to start and are now suddenly in great danger of landing on your pink boo space. This ba -bomb strat is so effective because the counterplay is minimal. You can't throw an orb more than 5 spaces away from you, so if your opponent has a pink boo space next to start and you're about to buy a chest, you have no way of deleting that space in the event you get blasted over there. Your best bet in a situation like this would be to have a high roll when you come across a chest, but that's leaving it to our pal Luck, and he doesn't play nice all the time. Even if opponents approach your orb spaces normally by simply walking towards them from the baseball diamond, they're still going to be in a bit of danger because there aren't any junctions close by to divert them away from your lane of chaos. Between the mountain range and this boulevard, both lanes are great placements for yellow orbs and ideally having a pink boo on each would be awesome, but that doesn't always happen, so you're going to have to make a decision depending on which routes players are taking and whether or not they're prone to replace orb spaces. The Metal Mushroom ain't here, so red orbs get to have the time of their life, mainly the zap orb, but don't expect to reduce a threat's coin so much that they won't be able to afford a chest. Remember, chests only cost 10 coins here, and there's multiple events for players to freely gain coins, but hey, if there's an opportunity to nail someone with a huge coin loss before some chests, then go for it. As said before, thwomps are good when stopping players before the star chest and can easily backfire if you saved a threat from getting hit by a ba so be very cautious of when and where you place them. Same goes with the warp pipes, which we mentioned earlier too. Just focus on not letting players take junctions multiple times. They can all still be helpful in particular situations, but it definitely seems like yellow orbs are better this time around since their efforts are valued almost all the time, especially if you threw down a pink boo or piranha plant in the areas we talked about earlier. The fireball orb, as expected, doesn't do the best here because of how many junctions there are, but it can deal a lot of damage if players are clumped up by this mountain range, which can happen quite often. The flower orb isn't as overwhelming here as it is on other boards, and that's because the red orbs it skips don't end up in as many game-defining moments. The coin to grant you, while nice, aren't as valuable considering it only takes 10 coins to open a chest, and how the existence of the shooting and baseball game grants you a steady stream of coins anyways. It's still awesome to rack up coins and skip obstacles with this orb, but I wouldn't say it's the best one to use here. The vacuum orb struggles in finding meaning yet again, for this board full of coins and low-cost chests just doesn't pair well with this frankly atrocious item. Part of the reason the magic orb is so good is that it not only doubles your roll for two turns, but lets you phase through any red orbs on the path. But since red orbs aren't as big of a deal on this board, I'd say that the triple mushrooms are the best to use here. They'll let you quickly go from chest to chest faster than any other character orb, gaining a quick advantage by covering the most ground. Just don't try and use it when a thwomp's in your path. Overall, Neon Heights throws a curveball by giving us stars that bounce around all over the place, but if you make sure you path your way between these chests well, place down yellow orbs in great spots, and excel at the events here, then you'll do just fine in show business. Your next stop is at Windmillville. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of happening spaces at two. There are not many boards in this series with this low of an amount, but don't get it twisted. Things do certainly happen here. Here's this board's item table. This board's gimmick is all about purchasing windmills. The owner of a windmill will get a specific number of stars specified by the amount of stars on the front. There are four one-star windmills on each corner of the board, 
two two-star windmills, one on each side of the board, and one three-star windmill, found in the middle of the board. You're given the option to deposit coins into a windmill whenever you pass by one on the board, and a windmill, along with the stars inside it, is owned by whoever has deposited the most coins in that windmill. This means that the stars you gain are not permanent. They can be lost if someone else puts in more coins at one of the windmills you own, and vice versa. If there's a threat with a lot of stars, then you can steal them by depositing more coins into their windmills. You can see who owns what windmill by viewing the map. You cannot deposit the same number of coins as the owner of the windmill. The option to do so is grayed out. The maximum number of coins you can deposit into a windmill is 100. If you manage to hit that number, then nobody, including yourself, can deposit any more coins into that windmill. Anyone passing by it will be told to hit the road. It essentially becomes off the market. There are a few ways for a player to lose ownership of a windmill mill they deposited 100 coins into, but we'll get to that a little later. The maximum number of stars one can attain on this board is 11 if no handicaps are turned on, meaning there aren't any happening spaces that grant you stars, nor will landing on DK ever give you the option of winning a star from one of his minigames. That result is omitted when on this board. Likewise, Bowser minigames won't ever result in a player losing a star. Same goes for duels. Normally, we talk about the star gimmick and how to overcome it here, which tends to involve talking about the junctions and which paths to take, but on this board, there are no junctions. Yup, none. Instead, this place is full of interchangeable tulip paths that shift every time a player passes through. There is no decision making between pathways. You are forced down one route or the other. This can be painful at times, where you just want to visit one of the windmills but can't because players ahead of you keep shifting the tulip paths, causing you to go the wrong way. The middle windmill, where three stars, is this problem dialed up to a 10. In order to reach it, you need to to take this left tulip path and then another left tulip path. Sounds simple enough, right? Except no, this design decision causes the three-star windmill here to be near inaccessible for most of the game. Watch. First try, the windmill can be reached. The player takes both left paths, which now both shift to right paths. Second try, the windmill can no longer be reached. The player takes the first path headed right, which now shifts to left. Third try, the windmill still cannot be reached. The player takes the first path headed left, which now shifts to right, and then takes the second path headed right, which now shifts to left. Fourth try, the windmill still cannot be reached. The player takes the first path headed right, which now shifts to left. Fifth try, the windmill can now be reached again as both paths are pointing left. This essentially means that the three-star windmill in the middle is only available every fourth time a player goes down these paths, and considering your roles are random, of course, there's no guarantee that you'll be in the right position at the right time when both of the left tulip paths are available, resulting in games where I've seen a single player visit the middle windmill, deposit all of their coins into it, and just run away with three stars since the other players struggled to even reach it. While a pain to deal with, there are countermeasures we can take. For starters, mushrooms and slow shrooms. I cannot emphasize just how important these two are on a board like this. Want to take a tulip path headed toward one of the windmills before an opponent shifts it? Use your mushroom to get there first. Are you about to take a tulip path that you don't want to take? Use a slow shroom and purposely roll low so that the player behind you can shift the paths so you can be on your way. And in the case of the three-star windmill, you can use Use the mushroom to blast ahead if you see that both left tulip paths are available, or you can use the slow shroom to slow down if you need other players to shift the pass for you before you get there. If you try playing this board without the use of these mushrooms, then you are subjecting yourself to the whims of luck as some players roll high and some roll low, throwing you from path to path without any decision of your own a fate I don't want you to endure. Thwomps, while not orbs that affect your movement, are incredibly useful here as they immediately stop the movement of others. If someone's ahead of you, about to shift the tulips, then you can throw a thwomp just a space away from them so that you can reach the tulips first, or heck, throw the thwomp behind you so that they don't steal the path that you want to take. This lug, along with the mushrooms, are certainly the mainstays of this board that you need to make great use of if you want to win. There is another method to reaching this 3-star windmill 
besides simply walking there, and that'll be explained when we cover this event here, where you have the option of paying 10 coins to ride a floating flower, which will randomly send you to one of three spots on the board. The first is directly behind the bottom right windmill, the second is directly behind the top left windmill, and the third, and you'll find this of crucial importance, is directly behind the middle windmill. Even though this event is random, it's still not half bad considering that all results have an equal chance of occurring no matter your placing or what turn the game is on. Paying 10 coins can suck, but if you have an excess amount, then this service can be a great hand in stomping your competition. But before deciding to take this flower or not, you should really take a look at what path you're about to take. If both of the left tulips are available and you can simply walk to the three-star windmill, then ignore this service and invest some coins for stars. If the right tulip path is online and few overall coins have been invested into this two-star windmill at the top right, or you just really need to extend your lead on it, then consider skipping the flower service to do so. If the path to the three-star windmill is unavailable or you haven't been able to visit the two-star windmill at the top left yet, then consider taking the flower since you have a 66% chance of landing next to a windmill you want and investing your coins properly. If you get unlucky, then you'll end up at the one-star windmill down here, which can be a bummer, but at the very least, the flower will have helped you skip some spaces if you were going to take the right path anyways. Landing on the happening space next to the sheep pen will force you to a game for coins, where you have to herd as many sheep as possible back into the barn on the left until the 10 second timer runs out. You'll receive one coin for each sheep you herd, and will receive no reward for managing to herd all 10 despite how how difficult it is, cause these sheep are mean. You could have a nice juicy group of them headed towards the barn, and one or two will just kind of run past it if you're not in the perfect position. My advice is this, when you're just about to make the sheep enter the barn, do not run towards them. Simply run straight down if you were headed that direction, or simply run straight up if you were headed that direction. Players will often underestimate their circle of influence in this game and think they need to get closer to the sheep than they actually do, which one, wastes time, and two, is ineffective because getting close to the barn when running vertically would have been enough. Is this a happening you should practice a lot? Compared to others in the game, the best reward you can get here is frankly pitiful at a mere 10 coins, so I wouldn't sweat it if you just can't get the hang of hurting these guys. The next happening we're about to talk about is miles more important and is one you're more likely to trigger anyway because it's on the main path at the top of the board. Landing on it will force you to play a trampoline game where you've got a ground pound to spring up and collect coins or coin bags worth 5 coins that float from the flower at the right. If you manage to collect all 20 coins, then you'll be rewarded with 50 more coins by the shepherd, except you have a 0% chance of collecting all 20 while on your own, since this happening event functions just like the rocket happening from Neon Heights, where the big reward can't be obtained by a single player and is only possible if you're playing a team battle. Unlike the rocket happening, the shepherd here doesn't say anything about bringing a partner, so it's understandable why some players may assume that they screwed up if they didn't get all the coins. The only hint you're given is that there's a second leaf trampoline, and that's all. Merely jumping or ground pounding low to the trampoline won't grant you enough height to reach any coins. You need to do it with some height. Speaking of height, the coin banks tend to float higher than the coins do, so when you see them floating along, prepare a strong ground pound to launch yourself up towards them. Missing a few coins to do this is worth it since coin bags are worth 5 coins. When timing your ground pounds in general, you want to hit the trampoline as soon as one of the coins is about to float right above you, similar to the timing you do for the gondola happening in Grand Canal. If done properly, you should earn at least 10 coins from this event, which is nothing to scoff at considering how important coins are on this board. I was mean to the sheep happening for its 10 coin reward due to how much more difficult it is to complete. And with that, we've covered all the happening spaces here. There's really not that much going on, but now it's Bowser time! The first possible event is, you guessed it, pictures, with y'all paying 10 to 20 coins depending on Bowser's mood. Getting a slash on your wallet on a board where the gimmick has everything to do with coins ain't fun at all, but it's not the worst Bowser time event. That belongs to the second possibility. Bowser destroys one of the windmills along with all of the coins invested in it. A new windmill is then reconstructed in its place. 
No, he does not just target first place's windmill. He has an equal chance of destroying any of the seven windmills on the board, regardless of the owner. Heck, it can have no owner, and he can still choose to destroy it. I'm not a fan of this event in the slightest, as it can hurt even players in lower placings, which is just dumb. The most you can do to prepare for this event is to not put all your eggs in one basket. There are seven windmills here. Don't get into a bidding war with an opponent over a single one of them without good reason. Try and have control over multiple, especially the two star ones on each side which are a little harder to reach. The third possible event is Koopa Kid will rob coins from one of the windmills at random. You would think that when he enters the windmill that he would always just rob the owner of the windmill, but nope, he can take any of the coins that anyone's deposited there. The only reason it looks like the owner of the windmill is targeted by him is simply because they have more coins to take and it's therefore more likely that when Koopa Kid sticks his hand into the vault that he'll be stealing from the person with the most amount of coins. What this means is that it's entirely possible for Koopa Kid to not steal any coins from the owner of the windmill at all. When it comes to determining how many coins he steals, he'll tend to take around 30% total. He cannot take all the coins in a windmill, meaning if there's only one coin deposited total, then he'll come back empty-handed to Bowser's frustration. In addition, it's entirely possible for him to randomly select a windmill that has zero coins invested into it, resulting in nothing happening. Koopa Kid will never steal enough coins from the owner of the windmill to cause them to lose ownership. This means that if he steals from one of your windmills and you're a single coin above the person below you, then he cannot steal more from you than he does the second person, nor can he steal an amount that causes you and the second person to have the same amount of coins since only one person can own a windmill. Just like with the windmill crushing event, the best countermeasure to this is simply diversity diversifying your investments. If you're bad at Bowser minigames and the Final Four Returns event ends up turning all red spaces into Bowser spaces, then consider depositing larger chunks of your coins into windmills. It would be an absolute shame to have a ton of coins in your wallet and lose them all to Bowser when they could have instead been invested towards obtaining stars. Talking about each path isn't as meaningful here since you can't exactly choose where you go, but let's brush up on each of them anyways just so you aren't caught off guard. This left tulip's left route has an orb giving space and bowser space, along with one of the flower drop-offs. The right route has an item shop and a DK space, making it a little safer than the one with bowser, albeit with no windmill. This right tulip's right path leads to the other two-star windmill and grants a dual space along with an orb giving space. The end of this path has a flower drop-off as opposed to the other windmill path having its drop-off at the beginning. The bottom path for this tulip leads you closer to the next tulip path with an item shop in between. The middle tulip's left path leads to a bowser space, dual space, and the grand three-star windmill that you've gotta aim for when you can. The bottom path leads back to the beginning where you'll see the sheep herd happening and mic space. We've gone over how useful the mushrooms are, so let's talk about the yellow orbs that are having an absolute bull last year. Look at this enormously long string of blue spaces and red spaces that you can fill to the brim with your town of terror. Both this bottom area and the top area have a never-ending amount of spaces you can use as your fertilizer for fun. The only spot I really wouldn't place a yellow orb down is this route by the three-star windmill because of how little it gets visited. The other splitting tulip paths aren't amazing but still good if you manage to throw some there, especially if you do so after the flower drop off so that players don't skip what you set up. Between the top and bottom string of spaces, I'd say the top is better to fill up since players cannot avoid them, whereas this bottom string of spaces can be avoided if someone takes the three star windmill path or uses the flower service and ends up landing at the left drop off or middle drop off, a 66% chance of avoiding the bottom route. The banded orb is a yellow orb that only shows up up on this board. Opponents that land on this space will make a bandit appear who will randomly visit a windmill that they've deposited coins into. This windmill does not have to be owned by them. He seems to take around 30% of the player's coins, just like Koopa Kid, except he's completely content with reducing your coin total in a windmill down to zero. This means that if you're the only one who's deposited coins into a windmill and you land on a bandit space, then there's a chance he can empty out said windmill, causing the ownership to go from you to no one. 
just like how it was at the start of the game. If you land on a bandit space without having deposited a single coin into any windmill, then he'll choose a random one to steal and take nothing because you have nothing. If it wasn't already obvious, this guy is a great find and you should be grateful anytime he pops up. I say find because he can't appear in the item shop, only orb giving spaces, and thankfully he shows up to the lower placings more often than the higher placings. Place him well like you would any other yellow orb. The spiny is decent at reducing an opponent's coins, as always, but the zap is fantastic here. Unless your opponent has a metal mushroom or a character orb to avoid it, you can reduce their coin count by a ton since they can't purposely detour away from your zap if you place it before a tulip path. The fireball orb ain't half bad here. Players are often lined up along the top and bottom sides of the board, and even if you only hit one or two targets, stealing coins can mean a lot when the gimmick is all about investing them. The flower orb will let you skip those pesky zaps and thwumps, as well as help you gain coins for investments. Truly a wonderful pick. The egg orb can suck up tons of the yellow orbs that will undoubtedly get placed on the top and bottom parts of the board use it wisely. This is probably the Vacuum Orb's best board due to its coin-centric nature, and even then, it being based on luck prevents it from reaching its true potential all that much. It's so sad. I'd say this is the Magic Orb and Triple Shroom Orb's weakest board. The former less so because you can benefit from bypassing some red orbs, but doubling your dice block for two turns, or rolling double dice blocks for three turns if we're talking about the Triple Shroom, can really backfire on you. Imagine if there's a certain tulip path you don't want to take but now can't avoid doing so since you locked yourself into rolling high for multiple turns. This board favors adaption in your rolls, and these orbs kinda go against that. Despite these downsides, they aren't all bad and can absolutely help you in going from windmill to windmill granted your rolls are on the lucky side. Overall, Windmillville is where you want to be if you're great at minigames and not so much if you're awful at them since it often rewards the player with the most coins. Even if you get down in your luck during the game, you can still boost ahead by using mushrooms, thwomps, and yellow orbs at opportune times to keep your investments high and your opponents low. To your demise, we're taking a detour to Bowser's Enchanted Inferno! Had to scream it since the exclamation point is a part of the board's title. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of happening spaces at 11. And on top of that, there's a great variety of events too. Here's this board item table. The way the star cycle works in this board is like that of Grand Canal. It'll randomly appear from one of the available star spaces to the next, and once it reaches the end of its cycle, it'll start again from the beginning. Simple enough, right? Well, this board does throw in a twist via Bowser time. Instead of selecting between multiple events at random like on every other board, Bowser's Enchanted Inferno only has a single Bowser time event. Bowser will sink the island that is currently hosting the star. Any players that are on an island when it sinks will lose half of their coins and are sent back to the start. Any character spaces that were on the island at the time will still be there when the island reappears. They do not disappear. The star, however, will relocate to a different island. If the island with the bridge is the one that sinks, then a new bridge will be built leading towards one of the other islands. If the island with the bridge is not the one that sinks, then that bridge will remain. But we have to consider the fact that this whole island sinking deal impacts the star's cycle greatly. What happens if, say, the bottom island is currently sunk, but that's where the next star in the cycle wants to appear. Don't overthink it, it simply skips that space in the cycle and goes to the next, just like how a star will skip a space if a player is currently occupying the one it wants to move to. This island sinking event wouldn't be that big of an issue if it happened less often, but the fact that it's the only Bowser time event that occurs on this board and it popping up every five turns makes it a pain to figure out what the star cycle is. Bowser sinks an island, five turns later he does it again, five turns later he does it again. Throw in the fact that the star cycle can get messed up by other players as well and you'll probably be near the end of the game before you figure out what the star cycle is for sure and that's if you're playing more more than a 20 turn game. If you're playing just the standard amount, then it's highly unlikely you'll know definitively what the star cycle is because you probably won't see enough stars appear to be sure before time is up, so don't fully rely on predicting star spaces this time around. Landing on the happening space next to the 
pedestals over the lava will force you to play the Happy Hopscotch Grounds game, where you've got to jump along three pairs of pedestals in a row. You'll choose which pedestal you want to jump toward each time, the top one or the bottom one. Choose wrong and the pedestal will sink into the lava, causing you to lose 10 coins. There is a 50-50 chance of selecting the correct pedestal each time, so to get the star you've got to win a 50-50 chance three times in a row. The odds of that happening is 1 in 8, or 12.5%. Just like the rocket happening in Pagoda Peak, it doesn't matter which option you select. The game simply rolls the 50-50 chance no matter where you land, so feel free to just select the same ones in a row to save time. What can I say about this happening? It's a 1 in 8 chance for a star. I personally wouldn't take it too often and opt in for consistency instead, but if you're a fan of luck, then go for it. Landing on the happening space next to the roller coaster forces you to ride it down to this space by the lava fountain. You can collect coins as it travels down there, much like the gondola happening in Grand Canal, except here you can't collect all 15 coins alone since your jumps aren't fast enough. It's only possible if you land on this space when playing a team battle. Don't worry though, the layout of the coins is the same every time, so whether you're duo or solo, you can practice this one to get as many as possible. Your jumps during this event will always be high, so feel free to merely tap the A button when you need to leap. For the first coin, jump early so that you can be ready for the next pair of coins which are close to one another. Ignore the fourth coin, you can't get it in time. For the fifth, jump as soon as the fourth coin is past you. Ignore the sixth coin and jump for the seventh at the bottom of the drop. It's gotta be quick because of how fast you're going. Spam the A button after grabbing this guy so you can get number eight. If you miss him, then you jump too late for the seventh coin. Next, you see three coins in a row. You can either grab the first two coins as a pair or the last two coins as a pair. I opt in for the first two because of the easier angle, but you might prefer the latter two since they give you more time to prepare. It's up to you. Regardless of which you jump for, be ready for the coaster to slow down at this part, otherwise you may jump early expecting it to still be fast. 12's an easy grab no matter which pair of coins you got before. 13 can't be obtained because of how fast you're going. 14 and 15 though can both be gotten nice and easy since the coaster's slowing down. Follow this guide to a T and you should be able to nail 11 coins consistently. If you happen to miss one, don't jump out of panic. Remember what you've got to do and stick to it. Some coins are better than none. Landing on the happening space on the right side of the left island or the top of the bottom island will cause Klepto to appear and take the star to the next available spot in the star cycle. For all intents and purposes, it's as if someone bought the star, so Klepto can't take the star to a star space where the island is down in the lava or if a player is occupying the star space. This event can speed up how long it takes for you to learn the star cycle of the board if it's landed on a few times throughout the game, but I wouldn't count on it. Instead, think about how you can use it to your advantage. If someone's close to the star and you're within range of one of these happening spaces, then use a slow shroom to purposely land on it and get that star out of there. Alternatively, you could activate this event in hopes that the star will appear right in front of you. Always be ready for the worst case scenario though. Summoning Klepto when a huge threat is right behind a star space can be a big risk. I'd only do this if I remember the star space in front of them having already activated recently. If not, then Klepto was a no-go. Landing on the happening space in front of the Mecha Bowser flamethrower will make it way wake up and blaze the 5 spaces in front of it. Any player fried will lose 10 coins, simple as that. This punishment isn't huge, so if you need to up your happening count, then consider using a slow shroom to purposely land on this happening. If you can wait to do so though, then I'd land on the pedestal happening instead. Sure you can also lose 10 coins from it, but at least you have a 1 in 8 chance of getting a star. Landing on the happening space on the left or right side of the top island forces you to fight Koopa Kid in a sumo match. Pushing him off the platform awards you 20 coins coins, but you'll lose 10 coins if you get pushed off. This is an all-out button masher, and I mean all-out. It's borderline cruel how good you have to be at button mashing in order to pull this one off. It even says mash furiously on the bottom. If you're not a fast button masher, then at best you'll tie, and at worst you're gonna get pushed off. Even if you're great at mashing, sometimes he'll just push you back for no reason and reset your progress a bit, resulting in you being so close to knocking him off, but not close enough. 
Is it a little inconsistent? Yeah, but 20 coins is pretty nice, and you'll tie most of the time if you're fast at mashing anyways, so purposely landing here with a slow shroom is a decent move. Every island has a happening space next to a cannon, where if you land on one of them, then you'll get blasted to a random blue space or red space, character spaces and Koopa Kid spaces included, found on one of the other islands. Considering that most of the game there will only be three islands on the board at once due to Bowser time, this event can be incredibly helpful. If you're currently on one of the three islands without the star, then that means one of the two remaining islands does have the star, obviously. So if you land on the cannon happening for your current island, then you have a 50% chance of getting blasted to the island with the star. Even if you happen to unluckily land a little in front of it, the islands loop, so you can simply walk walk around in a circle to grab the star that way, or if you recognize that despite your efforts, another player will reach the star first, you can just detour at the next junction. Combining these happening spaces with mushrooms and super mushrooms is awesome, because no matter where you land, you're likely going to be in a better position than where you once were, and with a happening space count to boot. You're going to want to avoid these spaces if you'd rather stay on the current island though, so feel free to use anything that increases your dice roll if you're worried about landing on one. The junctions on this board are fairly unique unique in that their design allows you to move clockwise or counterclockwise around the board. You'll see this when looking at the bridges, where junctions point at one another, so one player can move down the bridge one turn and a different player can go up the bridge another turn. It's up to them. While moving within an island is clockwise, the ability to adapt to which island you'd like to visit next is great, so don't forget how many options you have. Only two islands have orb giving spaces, the left and the right, but what they don't have are item shops like the top and bottom islands do. So if you're looking for some more choice in what orbs you receive, then heading to one of these two ladder islands is a great option. The left island is only 12 spaces long, making it slightly better than the right island when it comes to orb farming, since it's 13 spaces long. This difference is pretty negligible and not something I'd bet my game on, but it's neat info to have. The bottom island has a DK space, something no other islands have, so if you reach this junction low on coins and are hoping to turn your luck around, then give DK a chance or perhaps the 1 in 8 star happening here. The left island's coaster happening is great for keeping your coins up, while the right island's Mecha Bowser happening does the opposite. I'd say this is the island I'd visit the least, considering it has no DK space, no item shops, no useful happening spaces, and not to mention it's the only island with two happening spaces, whereas all the others have three. Stay away from here if you can, unless you're aiming for a star. The top island is popping off with a dual space, an item space, a mic space if you haven't turned on, and three happening spaces, two of which can earn you 20 coins if you're an amazing button masher. Its two star spaces are also fairly close to junctions, meaning you can get in there and get out quickly. The metal mushroom won't see much use here considering the only red orbs are spinies which get rid of a mere 10 coins, and tweesters, which can be bad if they throw you off track, but on a small board like this, they aren't really a big deal. Remember, only three islands are active at a time past turn 5, meaning that this board's total total amount of spaces gets low. When the left island sunk, the total's 44. When the right island sunk, it's 43. When the top island sunk, it's 41. And when the bottom island sunk, the total gets to a whopping 40, easily making it the smallest board from Mario Parties 1 through 7. We found that Pagoda Peak totaled at 42, but half the time this board is lower than that. For comparison, Western Land from Mario Party 2, the board with the most spaces ever comes in at 114. That's almost three times as much as this board's lowest total. It's this puny size that makes me recommend mushrooms and super mushrooms to a massive extent. They are beyond powerful here, as even a decent roll on a mushroom, or good lord a super mushroom, will let you travel at least half the board if not more. It's so crazy in fact that it makes purchasing yellow orbs a less than ideal move. Why throw down orbs to screw over other players when you can just buy orbs that let you zip around this tight space with ease. Yeah, any orbs you throw onto an island will still be there when the island reappears, but that's five turns that the orb you place down is doing nothing, which is a huge bummer. This isn't me saying to not purchase any yellow orbs while here, there is Pink Boo who's still incredibly powerful, but you do need to be mindful of when and where you place them. Don't 
throw down an orb on an island that's about to get sunk by Bowser time. That's the opposite of value. Instead, throw down your yellow orbs onto islands that you deem low risk for being sunk sometime soon. So, not the one that's hosting a star that's about to get bought. All that being said, Pink Boo is the main one I'd be looking out for. Piranha Plant's great as well, but I've always got to give it to my Boo Bro. Flutter is a wonderful orb to have, but it doesn't show up at the item shop here, and instead only appears to second, third, and fourth place during the second half of the game. Consider yourself lucky if you pull it and use it wisely. Keep in mind that there are no toady orbs on the board, so you aren't at risk of it getting stolen. But Mr. Blizzard is on the board, which gets rid of all of your orbs if you happen to land on him. Thankfully, he doesn't show up in the item shop either and has a low chance of appearing from orb giving spaces, so feel free to hold on to your flutter until the most opportune time, such as when the threat's about to seize the star or if you're in it to waste players' turns. The fireball orb normally does poorly on boards with a lot of junctions, but this board is so small that it doesn't really matter. Use it to nab coins from players that don't have enough room to get away. The flower orb doesn't have any big red orbs to skip here, but the boost of coins can be great in a board like this one where multiple events can burn your wallet. The egg orb is in a weird spot here, because there may have been a lot of orb spaces in a row for you to gobble up just for the island that contained them to go down. But that's okay, be patient and wait for the best time to nab other players' orb spaces. You never know when they may come in handy. The vacuum orb serves as an additional annoyance to a board where you're already going to be losing some coins, but other than that, it's not going to be doing much unless everyone already has low coins to begin with. The magic orb doesn't have as much fun here as it normally does due to the red orbs not being a especially common nor powerful. You're better off grabbing the triple shrooms here as they'll let you blast around this small space with incredible speed, stocking up on orbs and pinging between stars before other players can grab them. Overall, Bowser's Enchanted Inferno requires you to think carefully about whether you want to keep circling around on the island you're on or leave to a different island. Repeatedly making good decisions at junctions here, along with multiple movement orbs in stock, will be more than enough to crush the less fortunate. This title has 73 minigames that all have a chance to pop up in party mode, 63 if mic minigames are turned off. There's 18 4-player minigames, 5 of which are mic minigames, 14 1v3 minigames, 5 of which are mic minigames, 12 2v2 minigames, 5 battle minigames, 12 dual minigames, 6 Donkey Kong minigames, 3 being single player and 3 being multiplayer, and 6 Bowser minigames, 3 being single player and 3 being multiplayer. This would be everything if we were only covering party mode, which is usually the case for identifying luck, but I have a huge feeling that a lot of people will be sad if I don't cover the 8 player minigames in this title, so I decided why not, we'll cover all 12 of them too. 4 player minigames, Big Dripper, collect the honey that drips from the ceiling, but watch for swarms of killer bees. If no one collects any honey, it's a tie. If all players have the same amount of honey by the end, it's a tie. If 2 or 3 players have the same amount of honey by the end, they win together. You want to be selfish here. The moment you see a shadow on top of one of the honey puddles, move there and don't let anyone shove you. Pushing players like this can work if you're on the offensive, but only if they're not expecting it or just flat out don't know how to push back. In most cases, all it takes is a simple analog stick tilt towards whoever's trying to push you, and your character should pretty much remain in the same spot. This is why I don't recommend pushing as a strategy. You're better off searching for groups of honey puddles where multiple drops are falling. Take that group's part seriously, by the way. You'll notice that some honey puddles are closer than others, so if you run around the few that are close, you have a higher chance of collecting more honey than if you ran around the ones that are further from each other. Every now and then, you'll see the hives on each side start to rumble. When they do, there's a chance that a huge swarm of bees will come out. You have to duck by holding A to prevent yourself from getting stung, for if you do, you'll be stunned for 4 seconds, a brutal punishment you need to avoid. As said before, the hive's rumbling only has a chance of the swarm of bees appearing. Sometimes nothing will happen. From what I've seen, there isn't any tell to when it's doing a fake out and when it isn't. It can bring out the bees every time or not much at all. This shouldn't matter too much in the grand scheme of things since you don't have to duck before the bees come out. That might sound weird, but it's true. You're given a half second grace period when bees fly out of the hive to duck, so you won't even get stung even if you're a little late. The same is true for the opposite. You can stop ducking as 
because they're leaving without worry of getting stung. You may flub up the timing when trying this at first, but get some practice in and you'll just feel for when you need to duck and when it's alright to stop. Mastering this will result in you having a few more seconds overall in the minigame of movement, which of course can be huge when it comes to earning points. You can collect honey while ducking, so make sure you're standing under a honey puddle when bees come out for the potential to increase your points while everyone is stationary. You can't collect while stunned though, so don't try it. Bubble Brawl Punch your rivals to force them out of the floating water bubble. Whoever's the last one standing wins. If the timer runs out and two or three players are still in the bubble, then they win together. But if all four players are in the bubble when the timer's up, it's a tie. This is a survival minigame. Too often will people treat it like a point-based one where the more people you get out, the better, but nope, you are trying to be the last one swimming, and that means ensuring survival as your top priority. Stay in the middle as much as you can near the beginning, punching those that attempt to knock you out of the spot. If there's an easy knockout available to you, then go for it, otherwise don't risk it and stay where you're safe. When one or two people are out and it's time to go on the offensive, press B as soon as you're within range of your opponent. Mashing B can work, but you run the risk of punching too early, missing your opponent entirely if they're further away. It's better to get in the habit of hitting B as soon as you recognize they're about to get within your range. Mastering this will allow you to knock out less skilled players without any chance of them retaliating. If you find yourself getting overwhelmed by a flurry of punches, then do not immediately punch back. This is the number one mistake I see players making this minigame. They get punched repeatedly and then try to punch their aggressor back as soon as possible while moving towards them. This will make it so much easier for an attacker to knock you out since you're doing half the work for them by approaching. Your punch will not come out before theirs if they're button mashing or simply good at the timing, so what should you do if you're getting pummeled? You've got to follow an old piece of advice, roll with the punches. When one connects with you, immediately hold your analog stick the same direction you get sent. If done correctly, then your character will begin swimming away in that direction, and if your aggressor was button mashing or was trying to time a follow-up punch based on what people normally do, then they will miss. As soon as you start swimming away and see their punch miss, quickly slam your analog stick towards them and begin your assault. There are two situations where you don't want to employ this swimming with the punches strategy. The first one is obvious, don't swim away from them if you have nowhere to swim to. So if you're at the very edge of the bubble, then you've got to fight back and hope that your opponent screws up their timing. The second situation where you may not want to swim away is if your opponent is aware of this strategy. Instead of trying to punch as fast as possible, they could instead punch you, wait for you to swim away a little, follow, and then punch again. A great countermeasure to the strat and with more reward than a regular punch since you're now even further away than where you want it to be. But the counter to them waiting for you to swim away and punch after is for you to instead not swim away and immediately retaliate with a punch. In essence, it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors, but only if you're playing with someone that's aware of it. In most cases, your opponent will just be moving towards you and pressing the punch button over and over. I have I haven't seen anyone bait the swimming juke and then punch before, so unless this countermeasure picks up steam, feel free to safely swim away and then punch after they whiff. Catchy tunes! Run around and collect the falling musical symbols. You must collect one of each kind to win. If no one gets all of the required symbols, then it's a tie. There are five types to collect. The red 8 note, the two indigo beamed 8 notes, the green treble clef, the blue sharp symbol, and the yellow bass clef. None of them have any special properties or attributes. They all behave exactly the same as one another, and the spots they appear in are all random as well. It just so happens that sometimes a note will move a little fast, and sometimes it'll move a little slow. When the game starts, make sure you are holding down the A button when you jump. Merely tapping it will give you some pathetic jumps that aren't gonna go anywhere. Hold that sucker and reach for the stars, landing on your opponent's head when able. I would not focus on harassing people though, because this is a minigame that can end quickly. Look for groups of notes and upon collecting one or a few, take a quick peek at what notes are not lit up by your character portrait. Those are the ones you still need to grab. Scan the arena over and over for the ones you need and head to them as they appear. Do not assume that you can let one drift off and that another will spawn quickly. There are times where a certain color you need will unfortunately take a while to pop up, while a different color may keep reappearing. It happens. The piano keys at the bottom of the arena are at a lower elevation than everything else, so jumping from there is no good. Either jump in the middle of the arena or on the xylophones and drums, which are a little
little higher up. Cointagious, a coin minigame. Hit the dice block to earn the same number of coins as the number rolled. The possible numbers the block can roll are 0, 1, 2, and 3. There is not a set pattern for what numbers the dice block rolls beyond every other number being a 1. This may sound unhelpful, but we can use this to our advantage. If every other number is a 1, then that also means that every other number is a 0, 2, or 3. So, if you manage to hit the dice block only when it rolls a 0, 2, or 3, then you have a 66% chance of receiving more than one coin, which means this is your ticket to getting more coins overall in this minigame. Except, the dice block rolls way too fast. If you could somehow find a way to make sure you press A while the dice block above your head has a 1, then you're gonna hit the dice block when it rolls a 0, 2, or 3. But this kind of reaction time is nigh impossible and is more suited for cheats. I tried button mashing and using a turbo controller to see if I could find any consistency with hitting the dice block as fast as possible, but came up with nothing. It really seems like you either get lucky with your timings, somehow manage to press A when 1 is on the dice block above you, or cheat by pausing the game, and not the way you think. Fun run! Run for the finish line at the top of the tower, but don't hit any obstacles. If multiple players reach the finish line at the same time, the winner is determined at random. If five minutes pass without anyone knowing how a race works, it's a tie. The spiny layout is pretty much different every time you play the minigame, with some similarities when you get outside. Every other obstacle's placement is the exact same though. The indoor is incredibly straightforward, literally. Just hold straight and don't move left or right. Doing so will unnecessarily slow you down, whereas simply holding straight and just jumping whenever a spiny is in your way will allow you to move at max speed. Once you get outside, just keep holding forward and jumping if a spiny gets in your way. You'll eventually reach multiple trap doors which will cause you to fall upon stepping on them. There will always be two of them on the left, three on the right, and only one in the middle. This is another reason why not moving left or right and remaining in the center is optimal. You only have one trap door per section to time your jump over, and said jump is pretty forgiving. Just make sure you're holding the button down for maximum height. If you run in front of the punching mechanism, then it'll shove you off the tower, where, just like the trap doors, you've got to wait to recover. When you see the punching mechanism around the corner, stop moving as soon as you get close to it. This will cause it to activate without hitting you. Quickly jump over it and return to your fun run, avoiding spines, more trap doors, and more punching mechanisms. This is the standard way to play this minigame, and perfecting this will let you beat most players. But there is a way to go even further beyond and complete this minigame in record time. What if there was a way to run past the punching mechanism without waiting for it to activate first? Is it possible? Trying to run past it doesn't work and neither does jumping. It just comes out too fast. Well, what if you run along the very edge of the tower? Doing so will cause the punching mechanism to miss you when it activates, allowing you to simply keep running without wasting any time waiting for it. Do this all three times you come across a punching mechanism and you save yourself a whole two seconds, which is huge in a race. So what's the idea here? Anytime you reach a punching mechanism, you run to the edge. Your placement has to be so precise that doing so three times in a row can result in you falling off, not to mention the time wasted going back and forth. The solution to this is simple. The moment you get outside, run to the edge and stay there the entire time, playing it out the same way you would as if you were in the middle. If there's a spiny in your way, jump. A trap door, jump. And when you reach the punching mechanism, you can simply keep running to avoid it, or better yet, jump as it activates since this will give you a few more frames of leverage to avoid it than running would. Once you get past the third punching mechanism, you have to move a little to the left in order to touch the finish line since the edge has a pillar that blocks it. This edge runner strategy, when mastered, is the number one method to play this minigame, but it requires a lot of practice to do consistently. Certain characters have visual indicators which make it easier to know where exactly you are on the edge, such as Peach and Daisy. But someone like Boo, who just kind of floats there, is a bit more difficult to line up properly. Sorry, dude. Again, save this strat for when you're playing against good players. You always run the risk of falling off when you attempt it, and that'll cause you to lose against someone who played this minigame normally. Use your head. Ghost in the Hall. Ah, a haunted house. Run for the exit and get out before everyone else. If multiple players reach the exit at the same time, the winner is chosen at 
random. If no one can escape the haunted house by the time five minutes passes, it's a tie. The physical layout of the house is the same every time, but the many traps laid about it are random each time. Every player receives the same layout. The two types of traps are doors, which swing open and stun you for a moment, and booze, which automatically force your character to run back a little. Both traps will continue to block the path you encounter them on even after you've activated them, so don't think that you're safe to walk on by after you've activated a trap. You must take an alternate route. There's also no way of knowing whether or not a door will swing open or if a boo will appear. It's pure luck. But thankfully, the random trap layout you're given is the same across all players. While we can't guarantee ourselves a win on this minigame every time due to luck, we can figure out which paths are better to take than others based on how many potential traps they contain and how much time is wasted moving between routes. Here's a graph I made of the entire house. It's not perfectly one-to-one -one distance wise, but every route and trap is accurate in relation to one another. Red lines are door traps, pink lines are boot traps, and green lines are paired traps. It is impossible for both traps in a pair to activate in a single minigame. Only one of the two will. Some of the traps, as you can see, are lone traps, meaning that they are not tied to any other traps. With this in mind, I found two different routes that are near equal in their consistency, but one is more complicated than the other. I could just show you the simpler one, but it's better if I show both in case I'm wrong about their consistency and one is actually much better than the other. For the more complex route, head straight up. If this door doesn't fling open, then you can freely move through the hallway and straight up once more. If the boo doesn't appear, then set foot at the halfway point marked by the red carpet. If the boo did appear, then you can instead take the left path to reach the halfway point without worry of running into that path's boo since these traps are paired, which again means only one of them will activate per minigame. If this door at the beginning hits you instead, then don't get upset. It's actually not a bad outcome. It and the boot to the right are paired, so you can freely head right and walk in a straight line upward without any chance of a trap activating on you. Playing with this routing in mind will cause you to end up in one of these three spots. As to not repeat myself a ton of times, let's take a look at this left section here, which consists of multiple 50-50s, where we can see three pairs of boozling together in a row. Regardless if you pop down the far left or middle left, you should be heading up. If you run into a boo here, then head left and up. If you run into one here, then head right and up. It's a simple matter of heading up and hoping you don't run into anything, but if you do, you dash towards what whichever path the trap you activated is paired with. If you end up at this door, then do not go down its path, just head right and up. This door is a loner and not paired with any trap, meaning there's a possibility that it can activate and one of these boos can activate too, stunning you twice at worst case scenario. But if you ignore the door and try for one of these two boos, then you can only get stunned once at worst case scenario. Now let's consider the best case scenario, where this door doesn't activate compared to this boo not activating. As you can see, you will reach the goal at the same time, meaning there is no good reason to take this door's path, as it has the same reward value as the boo paths with a greater risk value. If at the halfway point you instead pop down the right here, then head straight up. If the door doesn't activate, then keep heading up, and if the boo doesn't activate, take the long hallway and head up once more, where you'll either get a straight shot to the goal, or or if the boo appears, we'll have to head left and go around. If this door back here does activate, then simply hug the right wall and head up. If the boo by the wall appears, then you can go up that long hallway mentioned earlier. Otherwise, just try out this 50-50, and if you fail, head for the other route. Alright, that was the complicated pathing, which again, should be near equal consistency with this more simple route we're gonna dive into right now. At the beginning, head all the way to the right until you hit the corner, then head straight up. If you didn't run into a boo, then keep going up and you'll be at the halfway point. If you did run into a boo, head left and then up to the halfway point. Here we've pretty much got the same scenario explained earlier, except one possibility is that you start at the very right. It doesn't really matter, just head up and switch paths anytime you run into something like before. If you get a good picture of this minigame's physical layout in your head and keep in mind the trap pairings, then you'll have a consistently higher chance of winning over your opponents. Recall that every player receives the same layout, so if someone who's taking a similar route to you is a little further ahead and runs into an obstacle, then quickly detour to the correct route. Just remember 
that at the end of the day, even a beginner can beat you at this minigame if they happen to get really lucky. So don't fret if you still lose. It just means it wasn't in the cards. Cartwheel! To get behind the wheel and race around the figure eight track. The first player to complete five laps is the winner. If two players pass the finish line at the same time, then it'll select the winner at random. If five minutes pass without anyone figuring out how to drive their carts, then it's a tie. A lot of this is getting used to the controls. No amount of tricks is going to be able to top someone who's comfortable with how the carts feel. Steering is as simple as holding left to make your character turn their wheel left and holding right for them to turn their wheel right. A quirk about these carts is that they can't go backwards, so don't worry about screwing up that bad. The carts turn on a dime, so don't hold the analog stick for a long time each turn or else you're going to go straight into a wall. Instead, tap and hold the analog stick over and over again quickly. Get a rhythm going with it. You'll know you're doing it right if you manage to stay near the center of the track. Avoid the walls at all costs. Running into them or even driving alongside them will kill your speed and allow other players to pass you up easily. If you manage to get a decent lead, then the only way the others can really catch up is hoping you slow down by running into a wall, so spend extra care making sure that doesn't happen. Treat your opponents as mini moving walls. They may not slow you down as much, but running into them will prevent you from doing the turns you need and cause you to run into a wall. The worst position you can possibly end up in here is in front of an enemy while you're sideways. This happens when someone's against your bumper and you attempt to turn. This outcome is something neither player wants. The one that's bumping into the other can't properly execute a turn, and the one being bumped into is stuck until the other one shakes them off. Avoid this situation by not driving directly behind or in front of other players. Picture this. Turn the picture book pages to find the matching image. The first player to match three images wins. If nine rounds pass without a player reaching three points, it's a tie. If multiple players select the correct image at the exact same time, the player who gets the point is determined at random. This means that if multiple players are one point away from winning and they select the correct image at the same time, then the winner of the minigame is chosen at random. There are three stories the minigame will choose from at random, all of which are 30 pages long. I recommend doing your best to memorize each and every story, knowing exactly when certain parts come up so that you can quickly flip through the picture book to earn points with ease. The first story is about a driving car. It departs a red house in the daytime, waits for a cow to cross, drives around a purple car in the evening, and goes down and up a hill at night before parking at a house. The second story is about a blooming flower. A seed is dropped, after it lands it gets watered and slowly blooms into a flower. A worm shows up right before it's done blooming, and a butterfly shows up right after it's done blooming. The third story is about two snails caught in a thunderstorm. They're vibing on a couple leaves and see a bird fly by. Then a couple clouds swoop in. One raindrop falls on the left snail, and the thunderstorm begins, causing them both to fall off the leaves. The clouds depart and a rainbow forms. Once it's done forming, the left snail reappears alone. No matter which story the game chooses, all players will begin at the first page. Do not follow the minigame's tooltip of pressing and holding the triggers to turn pages. It's too slow. Instead, tap the triggers fast to flip through the story as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the downside to this is that there is a little bit of lag, so unless you know the story down to each page, it's likely you're gonna end up going past the part you meant to stop on. But no worries, just back up a page and spam A to secure your point. In terms of memorizing each story, Story, I'd say the flower one is the easiest because everyone knows what a growing flower looks like. If it's taller, it's in the later part of the story. If it's shorter, it's in the earlier part of the story. The driving one is intermediate, I'd say. The sky is a good indication of how far along the story is, with blue being the beginning, the reddish hues being the middle, and the purple look being the end. I'd personally use these colors as additional help in finding the right page and not your main source of information. Memorizing the events of the car ride, such as leaving the house, seeing a cow, etc. are more precise. The snail one is definitely the hardest. Yeah, clouds coming in, raining, and leaving a rainbow is straightforward, but relying solely on that will spell your doom, because then you might accidentally interpret this image as the clouds getting ready to start raining when in reality they just finished. In addition to memorizing the clouds, you have to memorize the snails. They vibe with the bird, they get rained on, clouds depart without them, and a rainbow forms with one snail there. 
Get that down, and you should be good. Pokey Pummel. Send the Pokies flying by whacking them with your hammer. The first player to smash all of them wins. If multiple players finish off their Pokey at the exact same time, then the winner is chosen at random. If no one obliterates their Pokey within three minutes, it's a tie. Here's your button masher. Every player gets a Pokey 13 segments high. It takes five hits to knock off a segment for a total of 65 hits or eight presses to win the minigame. Button mash like your life depends on it, and good luck. Snow Ride. Catch air on your snowboard as you race downhill, but don't hit any obstacles. If multiple players cross the finish line at the same time, the winner is chosen at random. If five minutes passes with no one managing to reach the end, it's a tie. The layout is the exact same every time, so feel free to practice it till you get it down. Even without practice, this one's a walk in the park. The gates you have to ride through will alternate from side to side, making it incredibly easy to know which way you've got to go next. The twist is that they start getting closer and closer to one another, providing you with less time to shift to each side. You will kill your momentum and likely your chances of winning if you run into one of the gates, so avoid that at all costs by slipping and sliding through the openings properly. Prioritize not bumping into anything, including the warp pipes that appear every now and then. The ramps aren't an obstacle and are more so a marker for how far you've gone. With each ramp, there's a notable decrease in time provided to move between gates. So if you wanted an indicator for that, well, there you go. There's no better way to ensure you get good at this minigame than by practicing it considering the layout's always the same. Take me home. Jump over the high voltage sparks to avoid being tossed from the ring. Multiple players can win. If all remaining players are knocked out at the same time, it's a tie. During seconds 30 to 20, only one thwomp will slam down at a time. This should be a piece of cake. All you've got to do is simply jump over the single spark and you're good. You can jump in place, but it's better to jump towards where it's coming from so that you can clear it faster. Holding down the A button will let you jump higher, but even tapping it is enough if you time it well. There's not much reason to just tap the A button since the sparks don't go fast enough and frankly aren't dangerous enough to require you to be all over the place, so feel free to hold down the A button for safe higher jumps. If you get jumped on, don't panic. Your jump height remains the same. It's your movement speed that you got to be careful about. Just do what you did before. Jump when the sparks get close. You won't be able to jump towards the spark when squished like this, so don't jump too early. One jump on your head is manageable, but if you're trying to leap and people are all on top of you, then you may not get the height you desire and will get shocked because of it. I'm not kidding when I say that your opponents are more of a threat than the spark is, so keep your distance from them and encourage everybody to separate, especially as you all make your way into stage 2 of this minigame with seconds 20 to 10, where two thwomps can now slam down at the same time. If you're directly in the middle of the two slamming down, then do one high jump and clear both sparks at the same time as they intersect. If you're close to one of the two slamming down, then do a quick jump towards and over the spark closest to you and then turn and jump over the spark that was further away. It all depends on the distance each spark is from you, so be aware of that as you enter the third stage, seconds 10 to zero. Here, I won't say that three thwomps all slam down at the same time, but the intervals at which the thwomps are slamming is definitely shorter. Make your way to any thwomp that's about to slam down, quickly jump over its spark, then handle the others. You can still stay in the middle and jump over all the sparks at once if you find where they intersect, but this is risky and requires more strict timing. There's also the problem of other players, since people tend to gather at the middle in this minigame more often than not, and getting hit on your head during this stage is not a good situation. You can by all means harass other players by jumping on their heads and try to get them out, but I found that this can mess up my jumps if done wrong, so I prefer playing it safe. Target Tag Fly into the floating targets to earn points. The player with the most points is the winner. Multiple players can win if they all have the highest score, but if all players have the same amount of points, it's a tie. There are five target types. 5 points, 10 points, 30 points, 50 points, and Bowser. Hitting each target will net you the respective amount of points, but hitting a Bowser target, which is a lot bigger than the others, will result in all of your points going down the drain. No point in hitting that one! The layout of the minigame is random each time, but there will always be 12 5-point targets, 10 10-point targets, 
eight 30-point targets, three 50-point targets, and two Bowser targets. For a total of 550 points players can earn in this minigame. When you begin, you'll realize that your character is sluggish. You don't got much control of the air, so you've got to scope out where the high-value targets are and dive towards them before anyone else. If multiple players hit a target at the same time, the points are awarded to the player that was closest to the middle of the target. So make sure you keep yourself centered and don't let anyone push you out of the way. If you see someone trying it, then stay calm and keep your analog stick pressed against them so that you're closer to the middle. This detail also applies to Bowser targets, by the way. So if you can't get away from one in time and another player is in the same position as you, then make sure they hit the Bowser target closer to the center so they lose all of their points instead of you. Hitting the Bowser target doesn't matter if you don't have any points to lose though, so if you see a high value target positioned right behind a Bowser target, then flying straight through is a good move. Just make sure you keep your eye out for the 30 pointers and 50 pointers and you should be taking this one home. Track and yield, jump over the hurdles on the conveyor belt. The last player standing is the winner. Multiple players can win, including everyone. If all the remaining players get eliminated at the same time, it's a tie. The goal is to survive all 30 seconds or until all of your opponents fall off. The layout is randomized each time, but every player will receive the same randomized layout. There are two types of hurdles, normal and electrical. Touching a normal one will not hurt you. You're free to brush up against it all you like. Touching an electrical one, however, will stun you for an entire second, which is a long amount of time in a minigame like this. You're unlikely to get eliminated after receiving a shock near the beginning, especially if you're further ahead on the conveyor belt, considering it and the placer start off rather slow. Both will speed up every 5 seconds. From seconds 30 to 25, the game is very simple. Move forward and jump over the hurdles. You can even walk if you want. Getting hit by electricity here will not mean death unless you were right near the edge. From seconds 25 to 20, walking won't cut it. You need to pick up the pace to a jog and time your jumps well. Electrical shocks are still manageable if you're not near the edge. From seconds 20 to 15, it's pretty much the same deal as the earlier section, but your jumps need to be a little more precise. Electrical shocks are a teensy bit more dangerous, but still manageable if you're jogging at the halfway point of the conveyor belt. From seconds 15 to 10, you need to be halfway up the conveyor belt, because if you aren't, then you won't be in a good position for seconds 10 to 5. Getting hit by an electrical hurdle here means death no matter where you are, so it's crucial that you avoid all of them. Do not get anywhere close to the placer. You cannot react in time to what it puts down. At this speed, you will no longer be able to safely move forward on the conveyor belt. You'll instead find yourself jumping so fast that your position will remain where you are at best. This is why it's so important to start this section further up. If an electrical hurdle catches you off guard, you have leverage to move backwards to avoid it and then jump forward, something you wouldn't have been able to do if you were close to the edge. During the final 5 seconds, everything gets so fast that you're going to start slowly moving towards the edge over time. But don't panic, you aren't doing anything wrong, it's completely normal. Oftentimes, players will fight moving towards the edge by jumping forward to get further up on the conveyor belt, but this always results in them getting shocked and eliminated. You need to move towards the edge a little bit for leverage jump, and then clear the electrical hurdle. If you started these final 5 seconds in the middle of the conveyor belt, then these leverage jumps shouldn't kill you if you're performing them right. But what if you didn't start at the middle of the conveyor belt and are instead near the edge? Then these jumps are gonna eventually kill you if no other players get eliminated first. Are you screwed? Not necessarily. There's one other quirk in this minigame that we've yet to cover for these final 5 seconds, and it's the double hurdle jump. At this speed, it's possible to jump over not just one, but two hurdles, but only under one circumstance. There have to be two hurdles that are close to one another, and I mean close. This will do. This will not. In addition, the first of the two hurdles needs to be a normal one. If you perceive this layout, then immediately run towards the first hurdle. Make sure you're up against it, then hold the A button down for the highest jump possible while firmly pressing the analog stick towards the second hurdle. Doing this will ensure that you clear both hurdles and grant you more room on the conveyor belt where you can perform more rolling jumps without worry of falling off. In most cases, the double hurdle jump won't be necessary since players often die within these final 
5 seconds, but against skilled players, this is an ace up your sleeve you really want to master in the event you see two hurdles close to each other, with the first one being normal. Remember, if you employ this maneuver and don't clear both hurdles, it's because you attempted it on a pair that was too far away from one another, or your jump was simply off. Practice getting a feel for how close they need to be, and you'll get the hang of it. 4 player mic mini games, Balloon Busters. Say bigger into the mic to inflate the giant balloon and stop to stop. If the person after you pops the balloon, you win. In other words, if the balloon pops while you're behind the shield here, then you'll win. Players can inflate the balloon up to 5 times per turn, and they must put in at least one breath before they can choose to stop. If the timer runs out during a player's turn, it doesn't mean they don't got a blow. It means they automatically blow into the balloon up to the max number of times. The balloon will never pop before the 14th blow. On the 14th blow, all the characters will start cringing in anticipation for the explosion. At this point, the balloon can pop whenever. It could be one blow from now or 20 from now. You have absolutely no way of telling. Not even the balloon size really helps us out here, because sometimes it just feels like popping even if it's on the smaller side. Near the beginning, feel free to put in a lot of inputs, and even when characters start cringing at input number 14, don't be too afraid to put in a few. It's only after that that you want to put in as few inputs as possible while your friends put in more. Doing this can be as easy as cheering them on or whatnot, but odds are everyone's going to put in the least amount they can until some lucky soul manages to be behind the shield when it blows. Let's hope it's you. Clock Watchers! Stop the timer as close to the target time as you can. The player who comes the closest to their target time wins. Multiple players can win, even all players if everyone manages to land on the same time away from their target. If a player does not stop the clock within 20 seconds, they are disqualified. If all four players are disqualified, it's a tie. Each player will be given their own time to aim for, from as low as 7 seconds to as high as 11 seconds. No two players will receive the same target time. When you begin, you'll see the clock start ticking up. After exactly 3 seconds, the timer disappears, forcing you to keep track of the time yourself in your head as you attempt to stop the timer as close to your target as possible, regardless if you do it early or late. It's obviously much better to get a lower target number, but we can't do much about that, so let's think about the best way to keep track of time. If you have a metronome on standby, then that'd be pretty cool, but I think turning on a metronome app on your phone during something like this would probably look bad, so I recommend looking intently at the first three seconds of the timer. Get a feel for when it ticks up again and again, then repeat the same thing in your head over and over rhythmically until BAM! You reach your target number. Not much else to say on this one unfortunately, cause it all comes down to your timing. Dart attacks say fire to blow a dart at the moving targets. You can launch up to 5 darts. The player with the most points by the end wins. Multiple players can win, including everybody. If no one gets any points, it's a tie. There are 5 possible targets to hit. 10, 20, 30, and 50. The higher the point value, the further away and faster the target is. If a dart misses all four targets, then it'll hit the zero panel by default, resulting in no points gained. The maximum amount of points a player can earn here is 250, but getting that amount is a high bar considering the lag when it comes to shooting darts. You could be using the GameCube controller and even when you select fire, there's this weird half second delay that ruins any kind of timing you want. Wanted. It's certainly something you should practice if you want to get good at this one, because it's not intuitive and will definitely throw you off playing it for the first time. Most of the minigame really comes down to observing the positions of all the targets and shooting a teensy bit earlier to make up for the lag. Yeah, right! The targets move in a stupidly predictable pattern every time you play this game for every player, meaning there's a way to hit the 50 point target all five times. Before we get into that though, keep in mind that if you're using the GameCube controller, you can hit the trigger and prepare to fire another dart immediately after you've shot one. You do not need to wait for the dart you just fired to land. Doing so will waste time and likely cause you to be late on some of the shots I'm about to talk about. So get comfortable with hitting the trigger and preparing to fire darts as soon as you shoot one. Alright, right as you begin, look closely at the 10 point target. Shoot your first dart the 
moment your yellow shooter lines up with the zero part of the 10. Doing so will result in an easy 50 point target hit, something that most players will only attain by sheer luck. If you hit the 20 point target, then you were a little late with your shot. If you hit the zero panel on the back, then you were too early. This is a walk in the park to hit consistently once you do it a few times. For the second shot, be patient. Wait for the 10 point target to go all the way to the right and then all the way to the left. As it's on its way back to the right, you're gonna do exactly what you did for the first shot. Fire as soon as the zero is lined up with your shooter and bam, another 50 points. For the third shot, wait until the 10 point target goes all the way to the right. As it starts moving to the left, keep your eyes on the red handle directly below it. Fire the moment you see the red handle smack dab in the middle of this orange pole and your yellow shooter another 50 points. For the fourth shot, wait for the 10 point target to finish going all the way to the left. As it starts moving to the right again, repeat exactly what you did for the first and second shot. Just fire as soon as your yellow shooter lines up with the zero. This shot is done pretty quickly after the third, so you need to make sure you're ready for it. Another 50 points. For the fifth shot, wait for the 10 point target to finish going all the way to the right and then all the way to the left. As it moves back to the right, again, you're gonna fire when your yellow shooter lines up with the zero for your final 50 points. As you can see, four out of the five shots you make are gonna be the exact same, so perfect the timing on it as best you can. The shot is easy to master with a little practice, so don't worry about having to grind. The third shot out of the five is the only one that's different, but it's just as straightforward with its timing of simply lining up the red handle between your shooter and the orange pull. If you do happen to miss one of the 50 point shots when playing out the minigame, then don't sweat it. Simply try for the next one. Even landing two of them will bring you up to 100 points, which is pretty great against players that don't know what they're doing. Alternatively, you can ignore all the timings I talked about here and try to time everything yourself, but Good luck with that. Math Mortician. Say a number into the mic to fire at the square. If you hit a pink boo, you'll earn points. Whoever gets the most points wins. Multiple players can win. But if everyone gets the same amount of points, it's a tie. Regular boos are worth one point, while those wearing crowns are worth three. The number setup each player gets is different from one another, so don't attempt to memorize where another player's numbers are. It won't be of help to you. This minigame should be played differently depending on whether you're using the mic or a GameCube controller. If you're using the mic, then quickly say the number that's behind each boo. You should be able to nail most of them as long as you prioritize the ones that are about to leave over the ones that just arrived. The directions each lane of boos go are randomized, but are the same for each player. Besides that, never let crown boos get away since they're worth two more points than regular boos. It's when you play this game on the GameCube controller that it becomes painful because you can't react nearly as quickly to boos that appear due to the menu being, uh, yeah, long. <laughs> By the time you get to a number, the boo you were aiming for is already on to the next one. What I like to do here is just focus on the middle column numbers and quickly switch between them. It's a lot easier to manage than all nine numbers where I just find myself scrambling between them and getting nothing. By only focusing on the middle column, you'll be ready to react to boos no matter which direction they come from, and won't miss any of the crown boos when you choose to focus on them. Alternatively, you could also just focus on numbers one, two, three, 9, and 8 since they're the ones that are closest to your cursor when you pull up the menu to select a command. Either way works. Oil Crisis. Drive your cart by shouting commands into the mic. Don't run out of fuel before you cross the finish line. The player who gets the farthest wins. Multiple players can win, including everybody. This one is pitifully easy once you know what to do. You'll see your fuel on the right side of the screen slowly decrease over time. In order to make it to the end, you've got to collect the fuel cans one after another because if your fuel goes empty, then you stop. To do this, simply move your cart towards the fuel cans you see on the road. If you're using the GameCube controller, then get used to the menu. The top one is right, the middle is left, and the bottom is mushroom. Moving right and left is very responsive. Your car will turn almost immediately upon receiving the command. You can even input a command as your car is turning, and it will execute it as soon as the current command is done, making multiple turns quite easy. Avoid the oil spills at all costs. They will 
kill your speed, increasing the time it takes for you to get from fuel can to fuel can and most likely resulting in a loss. Using a mushroom in this situation will blast you ahead at top speed for a couple seconds before returning to normal speed, ultimately negating the slowdown that oil spill gave you. If you use the mushroom right before you hit an oil spill, then you'll blast over it and immediately return to normal speed, which is cool but you lose the couple seconds of boost it provides by doing this, so if you're gonna run into an oil spill, then just take it and then mushroom. While at top speed, you can still move left and right, so there aren't any worries there. By all means, you can use the mushroom whenever you want, but considering that the oil spills are really the only way for you to not get a perfect score in this minigame, I recommend you hold on to the mushroom in case danger approaches. All it takes is a couple attempts at this one before you realize how much of a breeze it is. Oh, and the layout of the oil spills and oil cans is different for each player, but everyone gets the same amount, so no worries there. 1v3 minigames, Balloonatic. One player flies a hot air balloon and tries to dodge incoming fire. The other three attempt to bring him down. If you're the solo player, then keep in mind that your opponent's cursors move slightly faster than your balloon, but their shots are a little delayed, meaning that unless they shoot ahead of where you're about to be, you won't get hit. You have the ability to go up by holding A, down by releasing A, and left and right with the analog stick. Moving just one direction is obviously a bad move, and going in a predictable pattern like an oval will certainly result in better players catching on and punishing you. This is why you've got to spice up your movement every now and then. Start by going in an oval, then an infinity symbol, then whatever the heck. The main key here, though, is to change direction as little as possible. Your hot air balloon is sluggish when it comes to this and gives your opponents a big opening to take you down. If you reach the end of the screen and need to change directions, then make sure you're moving up up and down while doing so to make it harder for them to take advantage. If you're one of the three players, then don't make the biggest mistake most people do while on the team, and that's assuming that by simply pressing A when their cursor is hovering over one of the balloons that they'll land the shot, but it's much too sluggish for this. You've got to keep your cursor ahead of where you think the solo player is going to go. They only have so much real estate to work with. If they're on the right side of the screen, for example, then they have to go left unless they want to be a sitting duck, or in this case, a flying one. Coin Op Bop, a coin minigame. Stop the slot to get coins. One player presses five buttons while three others press them as a team. The solo player must hit five inputs in a row. They can be any combination of B, A, Y, X, L, and R. There will never be two inputs in a row. Simply hit the required buttons you see as fast as you can. There is no delay between your inputs, so feel free to get speedy with it. For the team of three, each member is assigned a button press press each cycle. When your slot opens up and you see the button you've got to press, press it. The possible buttons you can be asked to press are the same as the solo player, B, A, Y, X, L, and R. Remember, buttons don't repeat, so if you see your opponents have already hit their buttons and you're the last one to go, then you know that their inputs will not show up on your slot, so ignore whatever your teammates got. If you press the wrong input on either team, then you'll get stunned for a moment by a ba -bomb. This doesn't reset your progress, but merely halts it for a moment, so it's not too bad of a punishment. Just be patient regardless. Easy pickings. Smash the rocks to find gems. One player has a big pickaxe, while the other three have smaller ones. If both teams get the same number of gems by the end, it's a tie. Red gems are worth one point, and purple gems are worth three points. The layout of the gems is completely randomized, but the rock formation is not. You'll notice that three rocks are darker than the others. These ones cannot be broken and are merely there to serve as blockades. Since their placement is static, that means that we can chart out routes for each team to take to maximize the amount of rocks they destroy. The solo player can destroy a rock with a single hit. What you see before you is the route I normally take. The goal here is to minimize the time you spend on going from rock to rock, so you want to make sure you leave leave the least amount of stragglers in your way. The unbreakable rocks make this a little difficult, resulting in a few where you've got to destroy single blocks in a row instead of standing still and hitting multiple ones beside you. By no means is the way I'm doing it here the absolute best way. As long as you find a path that lets you go from rock to rock quickly without running around too much, you can find the same amount of success I do here or even more. One problem I see players run into in this minigame is assuming they can destroy rocks from far away. 
you cannot. Despite your pickaxe being massive, you have to be stupid close to a rock in order to destroy it. Even when you keep this advice in mind, it's possible you'll still miss a rock and end up wasting time because of how ridiculous the hitbox is on this thing. To make sure you hit a rock, you've gotta be right next to it. At least for my route, the amount of rocks they end up leaving behind is two or a little past that if I missed a swing. This is a fine amount and will normally result in victory unless there were some gems unfortunately placed in the ones you leave behind. The team of three has an easier time figuring out a route in this minigame. All they've got to do is simply move in a straight line upwards, making small detour hits for rocks beside them. The player in the middle will end up running into the unbreakable rock, in which case they should move to the player beside them that has more rocks on their side to assist. The team can easily end up wasting hits by teaming up on the same rock and swinging when it's already been destroyed. Be mindful of where your teammates are going and where they're swinging so you can chart your route properly. If both teams are equally skilled, then they should destroy around the same amount considering it takes 3 hits for a single player on the team of 3 to destroy a rock, whereas the solo player only needs to do 1 hit. Unfortunately, this minigame does come down to RNG, so even if you happen to destroy more rocks than the other team, team, it's possible they'll end up winning, but the amount of gems and gem types given to each team are equal, so it's not like one team gets more 3 point blue gems than the other. Also, the placements of the gems are not the same between each team, so you won't gain any advantage by screen peeking, just route the best you can. Flash Fright One player tries to shine a flashlight on the other three while they attempt to run and hide. It's the same map every time. If you're the solo player, then your main goal is to predict where the team of three is going to go and catch them red-handed, obviously. The best way to corner them is by cornering them. Lots of the time, the team of three will run behind the Shy Guy statues, which is the worst spot for them to be in. When your opponents inevitably do this, push up against the Shy Guy statue's face and move your flashlight to each side rapidly. This will essentially trap the opponent you're chasing and force them to either stay where they are or gun it for an escape. Regardless of what they're about to choose, after you freak them out with your flashlight scare, take the shortest route to them. What happens next depends on their reaction time, but if you make a quick dart in their direction and slam your analog stick to where they are, most players will not be able to get away. Skilled players will know better than to corner themselves behind the Shy Guy statues and use the bridges instead, which give them much more leeway in getting away from you. If you face off against a skilled player doing this, keep your flashlight moving in unpredictable patterns. The moment you see your target double back, move your flashlight the direction they're going. You don't even need to commit to moving that direction, just a quick flash there will do, since that might make them instinctively not go that direction since they think you just started going that way. If you've ever played Dead by Daylight, then you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Incredibly good players in the team of three can loop you for days, which can be frustrating, but all that means is you've got to be a little less predictable with your movements and throw them off better. If you're on the team of three, then do not get cornered behind the Shy Guy statues. Simply running around them real quick can work work and be fine, but if you want to waste the solo player's time, then the bridges are a much safer bet. Keep your eyes focused on which direction your opponent goes. You should also strive to be the furthest distance from them, so don't accidentally get too close by moving when you don't need to. Sometimes it's okay to tap your analog stick instead of holding it to make minor adjustments. Get good at running in this minigame and you'll make it impossible for the team you're on to lose, especially if they're decent as well. Just don't body block one another. La Bamba one one player ground pounds to drop the bombs while the other three flee. The gray boxes hold one bomb, bomb the green boxes hold two, and the red boxes hold four. If you're the solo player, there is absolutely no reason to ground pound the gray boxes. The green and red ones show up more than often enough to occupy your time, so ignore gray altogether. Ideally, you should only be hitting the red boxes, but I'll give you a pass if you hit some green. You'll notice that each box has a glass panel above it, so no matter what size the box is, all of them have the same target size. Speaking of panels, there are three rows of them. The top and bottom ones are going right, and the middle ones are going left, as indicated by the arrows on the panels. Running the same direction the panels are going will speed you up and help you go between the larger boxes. If you see a player or players are cornered by some
some bombs, then prioritize throwing some bombs down exactly where they are. It may seem strange, but if you drop a bomb directly onto a player's head, then the bomb will explode immediately. This can be a fantastic quick finisher move, but in most cases, you'll just want to spam a ton of bombs. It doesn't matter how high up you perform your ground pound, by the way, so just quickly mash A to do low ones so you hit your targets quicker. If you're on the team of three, then be weary of the spinning spikes. Touching them even slightly will knock you out of the game. Touching the bombs does not kill you, but their exploding will. The way most teams lose here is by running to the sides of the ring and getting trapped in the corners and subsequently exploded. The key is to not lurk near the corners and instead bob and weave through the middle and the sides. Make sure to leave room for your teammates to move around as well. It'd be a shame if you end up screwing one another over. Pogo a go go. One player spins the stage in an attempt to make the three players on pogo sticks fall through a hole. The layout of this minigame is the same every time. If you're the solo player, then keep in mind that changing directions is slow. You can't catch your opponents off guard by switching it willy-nilly, so you've got to be a lot more purposeful with when you choose to throw your foes off. Keep an eye on the most skilled player of the team and shift the stage when they have to move in between this huge hexagon and the smaller hexagon on the side. This is the hardest section of the stage to move between due to the sheer size of the larger hexagon and the awkward angle you've got to move at between the two. For the skilled player, you want to avoid shifting the stage when they're at the easier parts, such as this stretch of land here. Focus on delivering more difficult experiences for them to maneuver through, and when you eventually knock them out, then move on to the other players. Remember that they only need one player left to win, so it's not a waste to target the most skilled one first to prevent the team from having a carry. If you're a part of the team, then keep your pogo as far away from the holes as possible. The solo player, if skilled, will attempt to put you through difficult situations like the thin pieces of metal we talked about earlier. Don't panic. Your pogo is a little sluggish, but if you can react to the stage turning in time and foresee where you have to go next, then you'll make this minigame an absolute chore for the solo player to win. Give your teammates space, by the way. There's no advantage to sticking together other than for moral support. Spinner Cell. One player controls two spinning machines and uses them to attack the other players. If you're the solo player, then this one's rough. The goal is to have your slow and luck stick machine full of spikes to hit each and every opponent. You also have a C stick machine that's a lot faster, which can bump into your opponents to stun them for a little. The large spinner cannot be jumped over, but the smaller spinner can, and that's where this minigame gets to be a bit biased. Good players will just run circles around the large spinner quite easily, and even if you get your small spinner towards them, they can leap over it with enough timing. It'd already be a pain if it was just one player on the team doing this, but the fact that you have to deal with three players is brutal. I wish they couldn't jump, but complaining won't do much here. When this minigame starts, immediately make a dash for the player on the left, because they're closest to you. Most of the time, players will run in circles hugging the walls, so you want to slowly move in with the big spinner while having the small spinner in between the big one and the wall. You can either carefully move the small spinner nice and slow in between to make it harder for your opponents to jump over it, or let it go wild with tons of bounces. It's up to you. The length of time opponents get stunned for by the small spinner isn't too long, so make sure to take advantage of their vulnerable state as quickly as possible, because your large spinner is slow. If you're on the team of three, then keep most of your attention on the large spinner. Getting knocked out is usually a result of focusing too hard on the small spinner and forgetting that it can't actually kill you directly and is only an accessory to murder. Most solo players won't have great control over it, so it's unlikely that you'll get hit after jumping unless they manage to keep the small spinner directly under you throughout the entire duration of your jump. Separate from your teammates to force the solo player to commit to each person individually, which wastes more time than if you were all bunched up together. Try not to bully them too much. This one's in your favor if you're the three. Spray anything. Three players fire water balls at the lone player who must try to avoid being soaked. As the solo player, avoid the middle of the arena. No matter where your opponents shoot from, their water balls will always go through the middle, making it the most dangerous spot for you to occupy. To make things easy, make sure you don't set foot on the sun design. Instead, stay along the outer edge of the arena where your opponents have to try a lot harder to make their shots hit you. Don't worry about falling off, by the way. You can't. There's an invisible wall. Yes, the arena does tilt when you're on the edge, but it's so slight and is basically negligible. 
You could either go on the side of the arena where none of the players are so that you have tons of time to react, or counterintuitively move closer to your opponents and snuggle in between them. This forces them to either circle around to try and hit you, or obviously move in on you, which are both reactable. All this alone should make it easy for you to win. But there's another quirk here, and it's the fact that your opponents can accidentally stun one another for a second if they get hit by a water ball. So laugh away at their despair as you clench victory. If you're on the team of three, then spread out. Sticking together will make your shots predictable and easy for the solo player to dodge, but by spreading out, they'll be coming from every which way. The major downside to this strategy is that you run the risk of hitting each other with your water balls. If the three of you can pay close attention to avoiding each other's friendly fire, then you'll make it a pain for the solo player, especially if you don't occupy a single space for too long and force them to constantly adapt. A decent setup is to have one player on your team follow the player and make close shots, have another make long shots, and the third make shots meant to trap your opponent. Think Tank. One player drives a big tank while the other three team up in smaller tanks. Last team standing is the winner. If neither team eliminates the other within 5 minutes, it's a tie. The cans arrangement are different every time. Shots from the big tank destroy them in one fell swoop, whereas shots from the small tanks don't affect the cans at all, so if you're the solo player, then driving around them serves as great protection, something that the team of three can't do as easily considering your shots obliterate any cover they have. When landing a shot on someone, they'll be granted invincibility frames for half a second, making shooting them during this moment a waste of time. Try and alternate your shots between two players that are close to each other in order to gain the maximum value. If no one is around the player you're targeting, then wait a quick moment for their invincibility to be up and then shoot them. You don't want to be surrounded by all three tanks getting fired at, so make sure you move in unpredictable ways such as around the cans I mentioned earlier. Your opponents only have three hearts each, so if you manage to fire upon two of them quickly within one another, then you can easily whittle down their numbers, making it that much more difficult to defeat you. The controls are a little funky as you can't stray at all, so make sure you commit to whichever direction you're going, turn, and nail your shot at your opponent. Keep in mind that they're faster than you are, so if one of them is doing nothing but running away, then don't waste your time with them, they're just trying to distract you. Focus on the ones that are easy to knock out and leave the most skilled player for last and then throw your health at them. If you're on the team of three, then gang up on them immediately. If you notice that the solo player is targeting you, then run away from them using the Kansas cover. A lot of the times, the solo player will get tunnel vision and focus too hard on the one they set their sights on, letting your teammates deal some shots while they waste time. Things get rough when your numbers start dropping, so if you end up finding yourself in a 1v1 against the solo player and have less hard than they do, do not go face to face with them and shoot like mad. Instead, try to juke them and hit them from the side, taking a hard off when you can. Ideally, you do not want to be in a 1v1 situation to begin with, so take safe shots and distract the solo player whenever you can. 1v3 mic minigames! The solo player is the one that speaks into the mic, which controls what they do in the minigame. The team of three control their characters as they normally would. This setup normally favors the team of three since 1. If the mic's bugging out, you can't properly do your commands, 2. Your opponents can shout commands into the mic while you're trying to do them, and 3. You're literally announcing what commands you're about to do, making it easy for the three players to react accordingly. The first two downsides aren't a big deal so long as the mic works and your friends aren't jerks, and the third downside isn't too bad on certain minigames. Regardless, I prefer playing with the mic off so that I can quickly input what commands I want using the window in the top corner. Players can still potentially see what you select, but only if they move their eyes to the corner of the screen within the small time frame you make your decisions, which can result in them not moving their character properly. One of the downsides to using a controller as the mic in Mario Party 6 was that you weren't able to select any of the secret commands that were only available to those that spoke into the mic. But in this title, there aren't any secret commands that affect gameplay, so the controller is more viable here. The code word strategy 
strategy does return from 6. This is when you say words into the mic that aren't commands. While you would think this would result in nothing happening, the game will often take the nonsense words you say and interpret them as one of the commands and execute them. This is especially true if there are a lot of possible commands to choose from, like in Boxing Day. With this in mind, you can say stupid words like BASED and have the game input a random command that your opponents must now react to on the spot. Normally they can just listen to what you're saying and use that, but by experimenting with what nonsense words result in what actions, you can disguise your intentions and make it all that more difficult for the three players to avoid doom. Feel free to practice all different types of words to get a feel for what works and what doesn't. Don't be afraid to get creative with it, like saying the names of colors in the Number Crunchers game despite there being no command for colors there. With all that said, let's hop into the mic minigames and cover the strategies for each playstyle. Mic and Controller Be my chum. Use the mic to attack the underwater swimmers. If you're in the water, dodge everything. As the solo player, your commands are Lakitu, Cheap Cheap, Blooper, and Sushi. The Lakitu command will cause a Lakitu to randomly fly by from the left to the right or the right to the left. As he does so, he'll throw down three spinies into the water. You can't summon another Lakitu until your current one has left the screen. The Cheap Cheap command will spawn three Cheap Cheaps from either side. Sometimes three will come from the right, three will come from the left, two from the right, one from the left, any combination can occur. You can't summon more Cheap Cheaps until the first one that comes on screen reaches the middle of the screen. The blooper command will spawn three bloopers from the same side. Unlike the Cheap Cheaps, they cannot spawn on opposite sides from one another. They'll be together. You can't summon more bloopers until the first one that comes on screen reaches the middle of the screen. The Sushi command will cause a Sushi to randomly swim by from the left to the right or the right to the left. You can't summon another Sushi until the current one has left the screen. Yes, there are certain advantages to using one command over another, like how the Spiny's Lakitu throws down can wall people out, or how Sushi is pretty fast and can catch people off guard. But frankly, the fact that you're given four commands to choose from and said commands have a low cooldown, you can just spam! Seriously, when you don't see a Lakitu on screen, use the Lakitu command. When you see that first Cheap Cheap you summon has reached the middle of the screen, use the Cheap Cheap command. When you see that the first blooper you summon has reached the middle of the screen, use the blooper command. And when you don't see a Sushi on screen, use the Sushi command. This minigame is a simple matter of recognizing when you're able to spawn your next enemy, because once you get the hang of that, you'll have the entire screen filled to the brim with obstacles going every which way, making it incredibly difficult for the team of three to dodge all of them. If you're using the mic, then there is one secret command for this minigame. Goomba. It doesn't do anything of significance, it just makes the Goomba in the background jump, but it is cute though. If you're on the team of three, then listen carefully to what commands your opponent shouts out. If you know how all the enemies move, then this will make evading them so much easier. Try keeping to the top of the water more than the bottom. Bloopers and Cheap Cheaps don't cover this section as often as the middle of the water, so you have more leeway in terms of dodging. It's the spinies drop from the Lakitus that become more dangerous while you're on the surface, so look out for them especially. Also, the last thing you want to do is get in the way of your teammates. For the love of all that is good, do not get in the way of your teammates. You are not a fish. Boxing Day. One player uses the mic to guide the robot arms, while the other players try to ground pound the tiles. The commands are right, left, double punch, rotate, and rocket punch. If you're the solo player, then I want you to forget about two commands in this minigame. The first being rotate. This attack can be seen by your opponents from a mile away, and it's easy to dodge too since it's a simple match matter of jumping over a couple bars as it moves across the floor. While unskilled players can certainly get hit by this, there are attacks at your disposal that can knock out unskilled players even easier along with knocking out the skilled players. The second attack you want to avoid using is the Rocket Punch. It has a cool name and the animation's great, but man does it suck. Its coverage is low as it brings the fists closer to one another and launches them at the end of the ring. It can easily be avoided by moving to the lower middle part of the arena, staying on the corners, the lower part of the arena, so many spots. Its main upside, funny enough, isn't even the part of the move where the fists launch, it's right before they launch. If you've got a player on the far right or far left side of the arena, then this attack can catch them off guard since the fists move in rather quick. 
Other than that specific scenario, I wouldn't be using them much. Alright, now we've got a couple straightforward attacks, the left punch and the right punch. These, as simple as they sound, are great, and it's because of how strangely the robot moves when it throws these punches. Using the right punch as an example, the bot will go for this crooked punch, and instead of going back the exact way it came, its arm will bend to the left a little and finally retreat. During the startup of this punch, the left arm pokes out a bit too, so players need to avoid that corner during this move as well. The main way to avoid the left and right punch is to simply be on the opposite side of whichever arm is punching. Now, for you on the team of three, this doesn't mean that left half is completely safe when the right punch is thrown, as you've seen, it's more like the inner left half. Practicing the minigame will help you get the hang of the safe spots. The double punch is interesting. It will always begin with a swing from the left arm, but but this swing does not go as far as the left punch. It stops about halfway through the arena before receding, then the bot follows up with the right punch, which goes a lot further than the regular right punch. The amount of arena it covers is kind of crazy, leaving the bottom left corner as the only large safe space. That being said, if you're on the team of three, then the greatest advantage you can give yourself is knowledge. Knowing how each attack covers the arena will greatly improve your survivability here. Have you and your teammates spread out as you ground pound the panels, this will make it more difficult for the solo player to choose which mood they'd like to use since they can't knock you all out in one go if you're not in the same relative location. Granted, you're good players. You must hold down the A button to get the maximum height out of your jump. Not holding it will give you flimsy jumps that aren't even enough to make it over the arm. You can jump on your teammates, which is obviously not recommended, and you can also ground pound your teammates, in which case the one ground pounded will inevitably get knocked out so long as the solo player has a working brain. Seriously, it's a 4 second stun animation, you're not living this. Getting jumped on sucks too, but your jump height is preserved, so you can still leap over the arm of the robot. It's running away that gets a bit iffy since your movement speeds decrease. But none of these friendly fire issues need to be a worry so long as you and your teammates are properly spread out. Number crunchers! One player speaks commands into the mic to drop thwomps while the other players try to avoid being smashed. The commands are 1 one, two, three, square, and circle. The layout of this minigame is the same every time, so familiarize yourself with it. You'll notice that there are four circles placed around the middle top, middle right, middle bottom, and middle left, whereas the rest of the five are squares, making the square command slightly more powerful than the circle one due to sheer numbers and the fact that it has the center platform. The one and two platforms mirror one another, whereas the three platforms cover the entire middle row. You can see that the platforms are color-coded to match what number they are, not what shape they are, with red being one, blue being two, and green being three to better help you memorize. As the solo player, you're screwed! Not entirely, but this one's rough for you, and that's because even if you're using the GameCube controller and selecting your options quickly, the thwomps just don't fall fast enough to catch players off guard. You input the command, the thwomp shadows appear, and players simply have to jump to another platform next to them to avoid doom. And it's not like you can spawn the thwomps within a short time period of one another either. You've got to wait till your current thwomps are off screen before summoning more. The best you can hope for is that your opponents aren't so good at this minigame or to try and go them into jumping onto the same platform as one another. This can cause some chaos even for skilled players, but a skilled player is unlikely to get caught up in this kind of situation to begin with and will likely be spread out. The best way to grant yourself an advantage is by using a mic and shouting code words. If you discover a random word registers as a command, then try it. Anything to throw your opponents off is better than straightforwardly selecting commands here. If you're on the team of three, then you've got your work cut out for you. If the solo player is using the mic, then simply move away from the platform they specify. If they're using the controller, then be very careful. Under normal circumstances, it's safe to peek at their window to see what they select, but if you do this while you're moving, then you might accidentally misstep and fall into the lava. Looking isn't all that necessary. Just pay attention to which platforms suddenly have shadows on them and jump to the ones without shadows so that you don't get thwomped. This should go without saying, but spread out. The solo player's best chance of beating a skilled player at this is bunching everyone up together. 
so as long as you're paying attention to your placement and the shadows, this should be a walk in the park for you. Stratosphere! One player moves the platform up and down in an attempt to make bullet bills hit the other players. If you're the solo player, then just know that this game is pretty simple with a whopping two commands. Move up and move down, which just moves the platform up and down. The team of three is able to jump pretty high, which is a problem for you since jumping on bullet bills is a safe option for them. It's for this reason that you want to try and move the players into the underside of bullet bills. You can do this by keeping the platform low most of the time, then when you see bullet bills flying above your opponents, move the platform up so that they have to move left or right to avoid them. Trying to knock out players by moving the platform down is a lot harder since causing them to make contact with a bullet bill from above will simply result in a jump, so make sure you're keeping the bullet bills above them. If you're using the mic, then you might assume that simply saying up and down will do for commands, but that's not the case. While it sometimes does respond properly to doing it this way, it's not nearly as consistent as saying move up and move down. Just try and say them pretty fast. If you're on the team of three, then, as always, avoid jumping on your teammates' heads. They'll still be able to jump if you accidentally do so, but moving around becomes difficult. Watch for every bullet bill on the screen, every single one. Assume that all of them can potentially hit you cause they can. All the solo player has to do is move the platform up or down and suddenly that bullet bill that was far away is now at your doorstep. Hold down the A button for high jumps to leap over or jump off of the bullet bills. The jump height you get for bouncing off one of them isn't much at all, so don't try to chain bullet bill jumps together, just get back to safety. If the solo player is trying to move you into the bottoms of bullet bills, then preemptively move out of the way of any bullet bills that are hovering above you. Wheel of Woe One player uses the mic to unleash enemies on the other three players. Last one standing is the winner. The commands are Chain Chomp, Shy Guy, and Bullet Bill. If you're the solo player using the mic, then you only have to say the first word of each command for them to work. A simple Chain, Shy, or Bullet will result in each respective command activating. Saying the full phrase like like Chain Chomp gives your opponents extra time to know what's coming and dodge it, so only say the first part. When using the Bullet Bill command, keep an eye on which direction both of the Bill Blasters are facing as they swing back and forth throughout the entire minigame. Launching the Bullet Bills while the Blasters are aiming away from the platform is a complete waste of time. It's also not recommended to fire when the Blasters are aiming directly at each other, since this will cause the Bullet Bills to slam into one another instead of going their maximum distance. Try fire the bullet bills when the blasters are facing between the middle and the edge of the arena. This way your bullet bills will cover a lot of ground on the arena and make it harder for the team of three to dodge them. The Shy Guy command is instant and can be used rapidly to keep players in the same position if they don't see it coming. Use it to mix your opponents up and put them in uncomfortable situations like pushing them towards the chain chomp gates or bullet bills. If you're on the team of three, then obviously look out for whichever minion the solo player calls upon. The middle and middle bottom are just generally the best spots to be in since they're far away from the chain chomps and bill blasters. You can jump on the bullet bills by the way, doing so won't kill you. In fact, it'll grant you a bit of height if you do so, so take advantage of that, it's easy to pull off. The shy guy switching can get pretty annoying, but mainly if the solo player is using a controller. Hitting the shy guy button over and over is much more rapid than saying shy or shy guy into the mic. Just be weary of your current position and don't get caught next to one of the chain chomp gates if they're available. 2v2 minigame! Battery Ram. Help your partner carry the battery through the blocks. This one takes patience. If both teams reach the end at the exact same time, the winner is chosen at random. If five minutes passes without either team knowing how to solve this maze, it's a tie. This minigame's layout is the same every time. While it looks like multiple different paths are possible, only one is, and it looks like this. It's essentially a game where you and your teammate are moving forward and backwards, sliding in and out of crevices to make room for the battery ram. If you notice that your teammate is trying to move you guys towards the wrong spot, then tell them where to go instead, cause I assure you, there is only one route that works in this minigame, and if you are not on that route, you are wasting time. Just make sure you and your teammate are properly making space for one another and are on said route, and you should be good to go. Bumper Crop Work with your partner to load three kinds of vegetables into 
into the truck, you must load two of each one. If after 45 seconds neither team collects all the required vegetables, then it's a tie. If both teams throw in their last crop at the same time, then both teams win. I honestly didn't expect that. Sometimes when you go to pull for a crop, you'll get nothing but grass, which is a huge waste of time. Unfortunately, there are no discernible differences between the grass pulls and the crop pulls, so all you've got to do is make sure you pull these suckers as fast as you can and deliver them promptly as well. Prioritize the crops closest to you. If you already have one type of crop collected and your partner is searching for the other one, don't look for it too because you only need one more. You'll end up wasting each other's time. Only search for the same crop together if you need two of that crop or if it's the last crop you need to complete the game. You could travel to the opponent's side and start plucking crops close to them, but this is often a waste of time since they can easily move a few inches to grab a different one. Buzz Stormer, move left and right to avoid the dandelions. If five minutes passes without either team managing to get through these dandelions, it's a tie. If both teams manage to reach the end at the exact same time, it looks like the second team is preferred to win. I'm ashamed at this kind of outcome because it doesn't feel right, but no matter what situations I played this in, the second team just always won. Go figure. You and your teammate are both controlling the aircraft. If one of you holds left and the other does nothing, then you'll slowly move left. If both of you hold left, then you'll quickly move left. If you each hold opposite directions, then you'll move nowhere. The aim of the game is to be in sync with your partner in order to properly avoid the dandelions. If you're not in sync and end up holding different directions, directions or make opposing decisions often, then you'll end up getting stunned again and again as punishment for your lack of chemistry. Believe it or not, this minigame's layout is the same every time, so you can grab a friend and memorize the layout and plan what your exact route will be should you ever end up on a team together, but that's a lot of work. The main thing to avoid in this minigame is deadlocking, so you and your teammates should decide on a direction that you will both always go anytime you encounter a fork in the path. For example, my teammate and I have decided we will always go left whenever there's a split, so in this example where going left or right works, some teams would deadlock because each player on the team chose opposite directions, but since my teammate and I have already decided we'd go left on splits like these, we avoid that deadlocking issue and simply head left every time. When there's not a fork in the path and it's obvious which direction to go, as in the opening is really close to you guys, then simply head that way. The only other thing to keep in mind is that the wing hitboxes are mean, so don't try and squeeze in between dandelions that are close to one another. It ain't gonna work. Card no rule. Look at the card in the center of the screen, then ground pound the matching card pair. If after five rounds neither team reaches three points, then it's a tie. If two players hit a card at the exact same time, then whoever hits it first is determined by port priority. Yes, you can ground pound your opponents and teammate, but doing so is a total waste of time since the best opportunity to do so is when they're standing still and they'll likely only be like that after having ground pounded one of the correct cards, so you're much better off honing in on the card in the middle and then scanning the cards on the floor for the right one. There are six types of cards by the way, with three character types. Goomba, Koopa Troopa, and Babam, each of which will have their eyes open or close. Get a good mental image of what each of them look like so that you can scan the floor for them quicker. If you see that you and your partner are both running for the correct cards, let your partner have the card closer to them so that you can complete the pair quicker. After a pair is found, move towards the middle of the floor so that you can better adapt to where the next correct pair will be. Herbicidal Maniac Fire at the piranha plants when they emerge from the pipe. The first team to three points is the winner. If three rounds pass without either team scoring any points, then it's a tie. These rounds do not need to be consecutive, they're cumulative. Hitting a spike ball won't stun you or your teammate, but it will spawn more piranha plants for you to shoot at, which is basically a loss that round unless your opponents made the same mistake. Speaking of these guys, they'll pop up just about anywhere without much of a pattern. You and your partner's cursor should each be on opposite sides in order to cover the most ground. Immediately shoot whichever piranha plant is closest to you and quickly move on to the next. Whenever a round is completed, your cursor will disappear, and when the next round starts, your cursor will reappear in the same spot you last left it. I often see players get confused on where their cursor is in between rounds because they don't know this detail and assume they're going to be in some neutral starting area, but nope, it'll always be where you last left it. You can't shoot shots too quickly one after another, so make sure you're certain on where you're shooting when you go for one. Also, each team will be given the exact same setup of piranha 
piranha plants and spike balls, so no excuses. Against CPUs, try pausing the game as soon as the piranha plants show up so that you can immediately move your cursor to fire at them. You can do this to real people too, but that's on you for annoying them. Hopomatic 4000. Move the Hopomatic 4000 by pressing the buttons that appear on screen. If both teams make it to the end at the exact same time, the winner is chosen at random. If somehow neither team makes it to the end after 5 minutes, it's a tie. It takes 6 jumps for the Hopomatic to reach the goal. The players on the team alternate pressing buttons, starting with the player on the left. Once the team does 4 inputs, the Hopomatic will jump. If one player makes a mistake, then the team is stunned for a second. The instructions list 6 buttons for you to press in the minigame, but you'll only see 4 of the 6 buttons appear each time you play. You don't know which 4 buttons were selected until you complete your first jump. Make sure you memorize them at the beginning, cause every jump will contain those same 4 buttons, albeit in random orders with no button repeating. By memorizing the 4 buttons that were selected, you can better prepare yourself to quickly press the one that appears above your head. Better yet, if you're about to do the fourth input, then you'll know for a fact which button comes next since three of the four buttons have already been pressed. And since there's no punishment for pressing buttons early, you can mash the button you know is going to show up to make your Hopomatic instantly jump. If your opponents are ahead and you're about to make the third input, then you could make a 50-50 guess as to which button will appear next, but only do this if you're pretty sure that your opponents aren't gonna screw up. Pyramid Scheme, a coin mini game. Work with a partner to catch the coins raining down from above. Coin bags are worth 5 coins. You'll notice that the shadows of all the coins falling are visible a couple seconds before they show up on screen, giving you time to move over there with your partner to collect them. This is also true for the coin bags, whose shadows are more circular than the coins. When you spot one of these guys, prioritize moving there at all costs. This is the kind of minigame that rewards you for being in sync with your teammates' movements. So don't fight each other on where you want to move and make sure you're both keeping your eyes on the floor for shadows. Only make an effort to block your opponents from getting coins if they're already close to you. Going out of your way to do so is often a waste of time that's better spent gathering coins on your side. The hitbox for gathering coins is busted by the way. You don't even need the coins or coin bags to get in the middle of or even touch the crate you're carrying to collect them. They can touch your character and you'll still grab them nice and easy. Keep this in mind so that you can nab some cheeky coins that you originally may have thought were uncatchable. Sphere Factor. Help your partner roll the giant ball to the goal. First team across is the winner. If 5 minutes pass without either team making it to the goal, it's a tie. The ball will roll faster with both of you pushing it, so roll it side by side. When making a turn, only one player on the team needs to move to alter the ball's direction. Both players making big adjustments will cause the ball to stop moving and is often unnecessary. Same goes with smaller turns, obviously. They don't have to be dramatic and can often be overcome with slight adjustments to your placement as you move the ball. The ball itself is quite sensitive to pressure, where pushing it against a corner or womp for a quick moment and releasing it into open space will cause it to get some distance. Don't be afraid to push it between a womp and a log or even one of the Montes. Believe it or not, if one player pushes up against the other from behind, then the ball will roll as though two players are pushing it at once. This is especially helpful during this narrow section where it's a little difficult for both players to stay on top of the ball at all times. This strat, while helpful, can fall flat if the player behind ends up slipping and accidentally running past their teammate, so only do this if you and your partner are in sync and good at executing it. Don't worry if you can't get the hang of it though, since doing a couple squeezes with the ball and speeding it up that way is often more than enough to gain an edge over your opponents. When it comes to the bridge section, you want to avoid the ball falling off at all costs. Ensure that you and your partner are pushing it nice and straight without either of you making the ball favor one direction. If you notice a slight switch in the angle, then inform your teammate and correct it as soon as possible, lest you want it to fall in the pit where you both must slowly push it out. A single player cannot do it alone. Spider Stomp Take down the spiders that have kidnapped poor Flutter, and do it quickly. If neither team saves Flutter, within 5 minutes, it's a tie. Each team gets the same size and amount of spiders. The first wave consists of 3 small spiders which can be defeated by a single shot, so the moment the minigame starts, run forward and shoot to dispose of them quickly. You should be hitting the shoot button fairly quick, but not to a button mashing extent. It doesn't go that fast. 
be careful to not get hit by their web projectiles. They'll stun you for 3 seconds, which is a massive time loss. Also be sure that you and your teammate don't accidentally shoot one another. This will stun you for 2 seconds, which isn't as big of a punishment as the 3 second web stun, but it's still pretty bad, so make sure you spread out and fire accordingly. The second wave starts out with 2 medium spiders and 1 small spider. The medium spider needs 3 hits to be taken out, but their webs are the same size as the small spiders. After defeating one of the 3 spiders, a small spider will drop down in the back. The same thing will happen again once another spider is defeated, making a total of 3 small spiders and 2 medium spiders that have to be properly avoided and shot to proceed. The third wave starts like the second, with 2 medium spiders and 1 small spider. Defeating one of them will spawn a small spider and defeating another will do the same. Defeating one after that will spawn a medium spider and another one upon trashing one more. They really start piling up at this point, so don't get caught off guard when they drop down. Remember, it's not luck, you should expect them to drop down after defeating a spider. The fourth and final wave spawns the boss spider, which spits out 3 webs at once. One going left, down the middle, and right. It also has a chance of charging you. This is completely avoidable. The only part that hits you is its head, so as long as you react just in time to avoid that part, you're free to continue shooting as fast as possible at the big guy. After 21 hits, its eyes will go red. There's no discernible difference between how he acts when his eyes are red versus when they're white, so this is probably just to indicate that you're halfway to beating him. After 36 hits, its eyes will rapidly blink red. Again, just to indicate you're nearly there to beating him. Once you reach 45 hits, the bugger will be defeated and you'll win the minigame. While overall, you obviously want to avoid getting stunned, it's good to stay a little closer to the spiders to shoot them quicker, especially if you're going up against a team that knows what they're doing and you want an edge. Being close to the spiders can risk you getting webbed, so stay at an optimal distance where your shots don't have to travel as far, but you still have enough time to dodge as well. Tile and Error Ground Pound the Panels to Flip over your team's color. If both teams end up with the same amount of points, it's a tie. You can ground pound two panels at a time. This is what you should be doing the entire minigame. Only ground pounding one at a time is cutting your value in half, so keep aiming for in between the panels. The hitbox is pretty generous. You can jump on, punch, jump kick, and ground pound your opponents and teammate here. Jumping on someone slows them down, but they can still ground pound panels, so this attack ain't really worth your time. Punching is bad too since it has a small hitbox, forces your character to stand still when executing it, and doesn't even push your opponents that far back. Jump kicking on the other hand is crazy. The hitbox is large, you can move in the air while doing it, and it sends foes flying back. It's so powerful in fact that I've gotta designate all of the outer panels as the death zone. If you jump kick someone at the right angle here, then they will fall out of the arena for a solid 5 seconds a huge time loss. This is why you should be ground pounding the inner parts of the outer panels. You gain nothing from standing on the far edge of the arena, so keep closer to the middle to make it more difficult for your opponents to knock you out. You have the option of ground pounding your opponents too. This will stun them for 4 seconds and change the color of the tile below you too as well. One downside here is that if the person you ground pound is in the middle of their jumping animation when you hit them, then you'll bounce off their head mid ground pound and fly off to hit another panel and since you have no control over yourself during this, you may accidentally smack your bum on your panel and help them out. I wouldn't prioritize ground pounding opponents. You're better off ground pounding two panels at a time, jump kicking them when they're on the outer ring, and if the right opportunity arises for you to ground pound someone, then go for it. I didn't mention this at the beginning, but you can ground pound three, even four platforms at the same time, but the absolute precision you need in order to pull this off with patience, let alone with players hectically running around you, is way too much for me to recommend as a move you should go for. Just focus on getting two panels at a time away from your opponents. Winging it, repeatedly tap the A button to flap the wings and get the flying Koopa airborne. If both teams end the minigame with the exact same height, it's a tie. Being in sync with your teammates button mashing does not grant you any extra height. This is a straightforward button masher through and through. Good luck. World Peace, combine two shapes to make the shape in the center of the board. The first team to three points is the winner. If four rounds pass without a winner, it's a tie. If two players place pieces at the exact same time, then the point is awarded 
discarded at random. Only five pairs of pieces can be on the field at once. Here are all the possible shapes you can get asked to form. The L shape, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and the triangle shape share very similar looking pieces, which is why you'll benefit greatly by getting a good grasp on which pieces make up which shape. You've got to be able to recognize them when they're upright, on their side, upside down, every which way. The better you get at doing so, the quicker you can run over to the correct piece, pick it up, and run back up to the top where your character will automatically place it in the hole. If you're wrong, then your piece will simply be thrown back onto the field where you must then try again. The colors assigned to each piece mean nothing. They are completely random, so ignore them completely. Always hold down on the analog stick before a round starts since every piece is below you. Prioritize grabbing the correct piece closest to you and try not to get in your partner's way so that you can both deliver the proper piece quickly. Battle mini games, Air Farce. Strap yourself into the hang glider and fly as far as possible. Players that go the exact same distance will tie with one another. Let me just say, the controls on this thing sucks. If you thought it was going to be anything like the paper airplane from Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door, then you'd be wrong. Here, where pushing right makes you go down and left makes you go up, there is no reason to ever fully go up, and that's because if your glider points up, then all of your speed will be killed and you will get nowhere. Alternatively, just holding down will cause you to nosedive into the water and not get a good score either obviously, so the clear strat is to find a balance between the two. Start the minigame with a sharp nosedive and then immediately hold up until you see the edge of your glider not pointing straight ahead, but ever so slightly lower than straight ahead. It doesn't even have to be in one fell swoop, you can do a couple quick micro adjustments until you land on it. And when you do reach this angle, stop adjusting. Too often will I see players get scared of it pointing down a little and try to point it a little up for more glide potential, but again, the physics here are whack. You will lose all of your speed if you decide to point up here, so keep it slightly pointed down and let yourself glide towards the water. Once you're super close to the water, then angle your glider straight ahead to give yourself a few more meters of distance. Executing this how I said will get you consistent 100 meters over and over again, but the world records on this minigame go up to 113 meters, so why not learn their strats? Because one, it's harder to do, and two, it's overkill. Most players will be defeated by a score of over 100, and netting that score is pretty consistent. Going for over 110 meters is risky and will often result in you losing speed immediately and getting an incredibly low score. To pull it off though, you've got to do a slight dive down and then adjust the angle to slightly below straight ahead. What makes this technically better than the 100 meter strat is that you're a bit higher up as you glide ahead, netting you over 110 meters, but I find it much more difficult to pull off and frankly just not worth it, even if you're playing against pros. But hey, maybe you're incredibly consistent at it and can do it every time, in which case, go for it and swamp the competition. Deck hands, pick a card, any card. The player who picks the three highest cards is the winner. Any players that scored the same points will tie with one another. The cards are numbered 1 to 13. There is only one of each card numbered one to 13 in the deck. In the first round, the order of play is random, but in the succeeding rounds, it goes by who has the least amount of points. The highest possible score is 36 via selecting cards 11, 12, and 13, and the lowest possible score is 6 via selecting cards 1, 2, and 3. I tried so hard, you guys. The devs really went in on making this game luck-based because I couldn't find any repeating sets whatsoever. Do your best to have your heart in the cards. Helipopper! Fly in the helicopter and pop as many balloons as possible. Any players that scored the same amount of points will tie with one another. Single balloons are worth one point, whereas balloon bunches are worth three points. The color of the balloons do not matter, they mean nothing. There are also bullet bills that zoom around the field in a straight line. Don't waste time trying to avoid them. They move too fast and by the time you try to fly out of the way, it's likely you're already doomed to being hit. 
hit. Not like it's much of a punishment since you don't get stunned when hit by a bullet bill here. It simply knocks you in the direction it was going, which can even be helpful in some regard, so don't pay too much mind to them. Hold forward to go as fast as you can. When you need to make small turns, keep holding forward and slightly in the direction you want to go. When making tight turns, stop holding forward entirely, hold in the direction you want to turn, and then hold forward once you mostly turned in your desired direction. Your helicopter blades are rather long, so don't be afraid to get cheesy with them and hit the balloons with the tips to save time. The biggest thing that'll affect how well you do in this minigame is paying close attention to the map. The edge of the circle is the out of bounds area. Moving into it will result in your helicopter automatically turning back around, which is a big waste of time. There aren't any indicators for where out of bounds is on the field itself, so you have to keep an eye on your map location to ensure you don't accidentally enter this zone. Everyone's cursors on the map are color coded, by the way, so if there's a huge threat that you can't chance even getting second place in this battle minigame, then you can just follow their cursor around, maybe slightly ahead of them, and steal all the balloons around them. Them. Running into an opponent only bumps them a little bit. It doesn't stun them, so it's not really worth doing. The balloons that spawn in at the beginning of the minigame are all there is, so you want to maximize the time you spend in areas players haven't been and avoid areas players have been. Do this by glancing at the radar over and over, keeping track of the paths players have taken. If you see an open section that hasn't been explored yet, immediately make your way over there and when you're done, visit the next spot on the radar that you haven't seen players move to yet or at least haven't flown around in much. Following players will result in you losing the minigame since they will have already popped all the balloons ahead of you. The better you are at making use of the radar, the more points you'll get. Monty's Revenge! Peek out of a hole, but don't let Monty Mole whack your head. The player who stays out longest wins. Any players that score the same time will tie with one another. If multiple players attempt to pop out of the same hole at the exact same time, one of them will be selected to pop out at random. These Monty Moles are really good at tracking you and the others. So good, in fact, that they will preemptively move to the hole you're about to pop out of by following your cursor. This is a very important detail that a lot of players don't realize. Most players assume that Monty's recognize and move towards your location after you pop your head out, but nope, they follow your cursor. So don't just leave your cursor in the same location for a while waiting for the Monty moles to leave. It's not gonna happen. These guys are fast, which means you've gotta be faster, so quickly slam your analog stick over and over towards the hole you want to pop out of and hold A. When you release A, your head will duck back down. Do this as soon as a Monty Mole is about to stop at your hole, lest you wish to get stunned for a second, which is a big deal in a minigame where time is of the essence. Prioritize holes that are far away from Monty Moles, which will often be the ones on the perimeter. Bonus points if you can pop out of a hole where an opponent is serving as a shield for you, since the Monty Moles will go for them first and then you. Repeating this process of quickly popping out of holes away from most Montes and using your opponents as shields while ducking when necessary will net you a very high score. This is one that you'll especially get better at with practice since it's all about speed and reaction time. The final countdown! Shove foes off the platform but watch the numbers. The panels break when they reach zero. Players that fall off at the exact same time will tie with one another. Jump slow players down but still allow them to jump and kick, so they suck. Throw in a kick during your jumps and now you're getting somewhere. These suckers will launch people far, and the fact that you're hitting from the air while also being able to move during the kick makes it especially useful at poking and running away after a hit. Punches keep you stationary, which just ain't as nice. The arena itself is composed of panels that start from a random number 3 to 9. Once the minigame begins, these numbers will start counting down. When a panel reaches the number 0, it'll wait for half a second and then open up, where you'll inevitably fall if you were standing on it at the time. A big part of this minigame, shoving players aside, is knowing which panels are healthy and which aren't. While it's nice to look at each of the panel's numbers to know which are close to opening up, you can instead focus on the color. The higher numbers are cooler with blues and greens, whereas the lower numbers are warmer with reds and oranges. The warmer and hotter a color gets, the closer it is to opening up. This is just another way of keeping track of the panels, so if you find difficulty with this, then it's no sweat, just do the number strat instead. Whenever you get injured, you gain invincibility frames, so use them to make your way back to safety and then attack. Don't just retaliate immediately, because if you miss, then you'll be stuck in the dangerous position they left you in, primed for being 
being picked off. Safety comes first. Dual minigames, Apes of Wrath. Mmm, delicious apples. Oh no, you stole them from the monkeys! Run! Run for your life! A new Kiki will appear every 10 seconds. You can see where it'll appear from 2 seconds before it does by watching where the falling leaves are. If you don't have any Ukikis on you, then stay as far away from them and your opponent as possible. They'll target whichever of the two is closest, so as long as you ensure that your opponent is closer to them than you are, then you're solid. If you're the one that has all these monkeys chasing you, then move towards your opponent. You're bound to get caught if nothing is chasing them, so you've got to shake some of the rascals off of you and onto your foe so that they crumble under the pressure. The ideal method to avoiding them is to simply run around in circles. One part of the map players often get stuck on is this platform that raises and lowers. Do not jump on it when it's at its lowest. Doing so will leave you in a dangerous position where you can't leap high enough to either platform above you and must go down as your only exit. Keep an eye on where it is in its cycle as you approach it from afar and try to time your approach so that you can use it when it's higher up. These monkeys can climb by the way, so don't think you're safe on these high grounds. It merely buys you time. These stumps really want you to jump from the lower one to the higher one and finally to the upper ledge, but I find them more useful as blockades and as random platforms to escape the monkeys. Jumping on your opponent's head will absolutely cripple them, more often than not winning you the minigame due to their reduced speed. The reason this doesn't happen often against skilled players is because you won't get flanned if you're in the air, so if you see your opponent trying something, then stay airborne. On the other hand, if they aren't jumping too much and you're above them, like on top of this slope, then a jump can work out nicely. Bridge work. Avoid the cheap cheeps jumping over the bridge. If both players fall into the water or get hit by a cheap cheap at the same time, it's a tie. If both players survive the onslaught, it's a tie. You do not have as much room as what you're shown on the top and bottom parts of the bridge. It's borderline unfair, so keep that in mind as you dodge cheap cheeps around these areas. This minigame really likes to play with depth perception. Cheap cheeps look like they should land on the same part of the y-axis as where they were swimming, but actually plop down further up than you expect. Keep this in mind whenever you see one make a jump. You don't want to assume you're safe just for one to come at you from an angle you didn't expect. What's especially scary about these guys is that not all of them jump. Some will just swim by underneath the bridge. You've got to ignore these ones and focus on the ones that actually jump, which you can track by darting your eyes between the left and right sides of the screen. As the minigame goes on, more and more cheap cheeps will start jumping onto the bridge and less will passively swim under it. At around 15 seconds, you won't be seeing any cheap cheeps ignoring you and your opponent. They'll all be coming for you, which does cure the paranoia but ups the terror tenfold. You can jump over small cheap cheeps and even medium sized ones. It's the big boys that you cannot jump over and must run around instead. You can opt in for jumping on your opponent as well, which slows them down greatly and will put them in a state of panic if you manage to pull it off during the second half of the minigame. These cheap cheeps really start piling up near the end, so if you see an opportunity to make it even harder for your foe, then go for it. Kampu Kiki, race against your foe as you make your way through the obstacle course. If 5 minutes pass without either player making it to the end, it's a tie. This minigame's layout is the same every time, so practice does you wonders. For these posts, it doesn't matter which way you go as long as you're always holding forward and rounding the post quickly. Just make sure that you go through the middle opening here when coming across these posts and head right to save time when you run through the last opening. Don't slow down here when jumping these platforms, it's not necessary. Full jumps here will result in your falling since the platforms are rather close to one another, so don't hold the A button down all the way, only do it a bit. Walking through the gate and touching the first log will automatically make your character jump and progress to the next section, but you'll save time by performing a high jump onto the first log yourself to start this process. Once you're dropped off, jump over the upward slope so it doesn't slow you down. Perform multiple jumps one after another as you leap over these stairs. Head right and jump over the upward slope. When you land on the downward part, run down it for extra speed. Jump up the left upward slope and repeat the process for extra speed again to complete this minigame 
in record time. If you fall off at any point in this minigame, you will be brought back within 4 seconds, but instead of getting dropped off close to where you fell, you'll get dropped off in front of the last gate that closed behind you, so be extra careful with your movement here. If your opponent blunders and falls off horribly, then take your time executing your inputs properly. Fish and Cheeps Swim and dodge the school of angry Cheep Cheeps. If you touch one, it's game over. If after 30 seconds neither player has been knocked out, it's a tie. You have way more control over your swimming than you think you do. But mash that sucker to vroom around at your leisure. There are three behaviors these Cheep Cheeps can have. The first is simply swimming down, which is easy enough to avoid. The second kind of Cheep Cheeps move in diagonal patterns, which isn't completely predictable since they may cancel their path and turn the other way diagonally whenever they please. The third kind of Cheep Cheeps are especially tricky. At first glance, they appear like the first kind, just swimming straight down the stream, but once they get close enough, which is about half the screen above you, they'll turn and follow where you go as they make their way down. Swim left and right often in order to better figure out which Cheep Cheeps above you are these dangerous ones so that you can avoid them further in advance. Oftentimes, players will get comfortable being still or only swimming up and down just to get blindsided by a Cheep Cheep that decided to turn when they didn't expect it. The walls of the arena are not the land itself. There are invisible walls a little beyond the land that you've got to deal with, which is why I prefer staying near the middle of the river so that I have more opportunities for moving around, especially when it comes to the sneaky Cheep Cheeps. You can move your opponent by swimming into them, but honestly, the Cheep Cheeps alone should be enough. Give me a sign. When Shy Guy holds up a card, that board with that design will sink. Don't be on it when it does. If both players fall into the water at the same time, it's a tie, even if one player falls in right after the other. Make sure your legs are on solid ground. If both players survive to the end, it's a tie. You can't fall off the top of the platforms, but you can fall off the bottom left and right. You'll notice that you and your opponent's platforms and their corresponding icons are reversed. This doesn't make it easier or harder for either player, but what it does mean is that you should not be looking at your opponent's side to see what they're up to. Doing so might result in you copying their movements, and since their layout is different from yours, could result in getting you knocked out. I prefer to keep my eyes glued to my side and the Shy Guy only. At the beginning, the Shy Guy will only hold up one sign at a time, which is pretty easy. It's unlikely you or your opponent will get out in the first 20 seconds even, because it's around second 11 that the Shy Guy will start holding up two signs at a time and steadily increasing the speed at which he does so. Do not get thrown off by this. Players will get super comfortable with the first 20 seconds, and then when he starts quickly throwing up multiple signs one after another, they end up falling in the water. It's during this section that you need to start doing some high jumps towards the safe platforms. Don't give up. Even if you have to travel a far distance to reach one of the safe platforms, just jump nice and high and leap off of any platforms you can to reach safety, even if they're in the middle of dipping into the water since you aren't out unless it's fully submerged. This last 5 seconds all comes down to quickly recognizing where safety is and booking it there. Staying in the middle of all 4 platforms is usually recommended no matter what second the timer is on so that you can better adapt to which platform falls next. Hip Hop Drive Hop for the finish line by quickly pressing the buttons that appear on the panels. If 5 minutes passes without either player reaching the end, it's a tie. Your opponent does not have the same pattern as you, so no screen peeking. The possible buttons that could appear in front of you are B, A, Y, X, L, and R. Buttons can repeat and there's no pattern to it, it's just pure reaction time. If you input the wrong button, you'll fall, but the button you have to press does not change, so make sure you're mashing the correct button as soon as you get dropped back down. If you're a little behind and you know your opponent isn't going to be making any mistakes, then go for a blind press. You have a 1 in 6 chance of being correct, and if you beat those odds, then you can edge out some much desired time. Light speed. Hop on the amazing hover cart and run over panels to change them to your color. If both players end with the same amount of points, it's a tie. If you enter a teleporter, you'll pop out the teleporter that has the same color as the one you entered. This mini game's hilarious. All you've got to do is follow your opponent as soon as they start moving. This way, any squares they change will immediately be changed to your color right afterwards. If they don't realize what your strategy is at the very beginning, then they're as good as screwed, because even if they attempt to throw you off their trail, it's pretty easy to just continue 
following them and mimic their inputs, even if they go into a teleporter. It's truly stupid and honestly unfair for the player that doesn't know this trick. If both players are aware of and aim to execute this strategy, then things get weird. Because instead of having one player trying to play the game normally and another following, you get a situation where two players start following one another in a circle because they both expected the other to just play normally. Even if, before the minigame starts, each player is aware that the other one is going to pull this strategy, that doesn't change much. Because remember, the number one thing you want to avoid here is your opponent following directly behind you. This will kill your chances of winning if they're even halfway competent. And the best way to guard against this devastating strategy is to do it yourself. It's the perfect offense and defense. Again, resulting in an infinite loop, which neither player wants to break apart from since they know the moment they do, they're essentially handing their opponent the win by a allowing them to execute this broken strategy. In cases like these, it'll come down to which player can consistently go in circles the fastest. Doing anything else against a skilled player will result in a loss. Mad Props Use the boat's propellers to navigate through the white water rapids. This minigame has the same layout every time, so practice it till the sun goes down until you have it nailed. Holding R and L will propel you forward. Holding only R will make you turn left, and holding only L will make you turn right. The moment you make a turn, immediately hold down both triggers to go full speed, and the second you see a turn coming up, turn early so that you don't run into the walls or rocks. If you don't have the course layout memorized, then look at the water ahead of you. It telegraphs what the next turn will be so that you can prepare earlier. Don't lose hope if you run into something. It's pretty common since this boat is incredibly sluggish, not to mention the controls are unintuitive. These details, combined with the fact that it's the same layout every time, makes this minigame the embodiment of practice makes perfect. Royal Rumpus Ground Pound the Goombas to earn points. The player with the most points wins. If both players end with the same amount of points, it's a tie. Regular Goombas are worth 1 point and Golden Goombas are worth 3 points. Jumping on Goombas does not get you points. Only Ground Pounds get you points. Make sure you drill that into your head as you go into this. Aim for clumps of Goombas where you can potentially nail multiple with a single ground pound. Keep in mind that you don't have to jump super high before executing a ground pound. You can do them pretty quickly and close to the ground. The drawback in doing these quick ones is that you might accidentally jump on the Goomba instead of ground pounding it, which again grants you no points. The Gold Goomba, again worth 3 points, will pop out when the timer hits 6 seconds. Book it to this guy and make sure you ground pound him as quickly quickly as possible. If you're far ahead of your opponent and the only way they can win is by simply ground pounding him, then you might actually be better off simply jumping on the gold Goomba instead. Jumps on Goombas don't actually get rid of them. They simply get stunned for a moment and pop right back up. So by jumping on the gold Goomba, you can put yourself in a better position to get the points since your opponent is forced to wait a bit. Ground pounds on said opponent are deadly here and are absolutely worth doing if you're next to them. Them. Just wait for them to ground pound a Goomba, and while they're stuck in end lag, flatten them clean and return to obliterating Goombas. Don't run across the arena for a ground pound though, since that wastes time. Attack your opponent after you slowly made your way over to them. Spin Doctor Run to the goal by navigating a series of spinning checkpoints. If neither player makes it to the end after 5 minutes pass, it's a tie. The pattern is random each time and both players are given the same pattern. Red spinners only turn 3 directions, whereas blue spinners turn all four directions. The main path you take is going to be determined by the first blue spinner you encounter. If it's rotating clockwise, you're going up. If it's rotating counterclockwise, you're going right. Your approach to this minigame is similar regardless of which path you take. It's all about navigating the red spinners. Remember, blue ones are nice because they will turn in all directions, but red ones only turn in three, which can result in you hitting a dead end if you screw up. To avoid them, you need to be looking at the top of your screen screen and observe the red spinners for openings. When you see a path available, take it and glue your eyes to the top of the screen once more to see where openings are available. If a red spinner up top doesn't provide you
provide you with any openings, then move horizontally. Moving towards a red spinner from the left or right is very dangerous in this minigame because your camera view isn't wide enough to see them in advance, which may result in you hitting a dead end. This is why approaching red spinners from the bottom is a lot safer. You can see if you're about to hit a dead end in advance and preemptively avoid it. When moving left and right, try and only do so towards the red spinners you've seen in advance or to any blue spinner. The layout of red spinners and blue spinners is the same every time in this minigame, so if you memorize where each color spinner is, then you'll always know when it's safe to move left and right since you memorize where the blue spinners are. The top two red spinners at the end will always face towards the final blue spinner. Always. Once you find your opening into one of them, it's home free. Warp Pipe Dreams. Head for the goal by jumping in and out of the warp pipes. If neither player escapes the maze within five minutes, it's a tie. The warp pipes and where they link are randomized, but because their randomization follows a set of rules, we can easily navigate this maze by following three steps. Learn them and you'll consistently clear this maze quickly. But keep in mind that nothing is quicker than a player that manages to have amazing luck. Step 1. Enter the closest warp pipe. If you pop out of a triple warp pipe, you got the fast route and can move on to step 2. If you instead pop out of a double warp pipe, you got the slow route and need to enter the next warp pipe to continue to step 2. Step 2. Enter the closest warp pipe. If you pop out of a triple warp pipe, you got the fast route and can move on to step 3. If you instead pop out of a double warp pipe, you got the slow route and need to go back and pick the unused warp pipe to continue to Step 3. Step 3. Enter the closest warp pipe. If you pop out in the center, you did it! If you instead pop out somewhere else, go back and pick the unused warp pipe to reach the center. This strat is the most consistent one for clearing this minigame quickly and consistently, and thus, I imagine many players will start to use it. If you're playing against someone that is following this strat like you are, then that means you'll both be jumping into the same warp pipes and get the same outcomes, so whoever wins will simply come down to whoever enters warp pipes faster 100% of the time. If you know you can do it faster than them or are up for the challenge, then follow all the steps like normal. But if you feel like they're going to do it faster than you, then on step 3, instead of entering the closest warp pipe, enter the furthest warp pipe. This turns what would have been a 100% loss for you, because they're faster, into a 50-50, where you're hoping they enter the wrong warp pipe and you enter the right one. But again, only do this if you know that they're doing this strat too and you're confident they can do it faster than you. This is a last resort. Wait for it! Hit balls with the hammer to roll them towards your rival. The player with the least amount of balls wins. If both players have an equal amount of weight on their respective side, it's a tie. If you get hit by a ball, you'll be stunned for half a second and have invincibility frames for a full second. Your hammer hits these balls hard. So hard, in fact, that if you hit it straight ahead, it'll just bounce off the wall and come right back if it doesn't run into anything else. This quirk ends up being a huge deal if all the balls are on your side, because if there aren't any balls on your opponent's side, then anything you launch over there is just going to come right back with nothing to stop them, unless you manage to hit your opponent with one, but that's not the best strategy. This is why you want to prioritize doing diagonal shots, where the balls you hit go the same distance as the straight shots, but because you're hitting them at an angle, they'll actually stop on your opponent's side instead of ending up on your own. Now, doing straight shots isn't always bad. If there's a ball on your opponent's side that you can knock one of your balls into, do it. It's quicker than a diagonal shot and can even cause some chaos for your opponent, potentially resulting in them getting hit. Speaking of which, while it's good to stun your opponents for a quick moment, the stun time just isn't long enough for it to be something you should prioritize. The ideal should be for you to constantly move from ball to ball and hitting each one at such an angle that it'll stop on your opponent's side. And if you can happen to get a hit on your opponent while doing this, then that's a great bonus. If your opponent has way more balls on their side than you do, then play defense and stand near the middle of the arena to block anything they launch over. One interesting trait about the balls is that they'll immediately stop when hitting a player, so when you block one, all you have to do is wait out the really short stun and then knock it right back. If you're far behind your opponent, then move towards the largest clump of balls and whack them over one after another. You can even hit multiple balls at the same time if they're close enough. Single Player Bowser mini games slot o whirl line up three key symbols on the slot machine to get a key of your own and win it's a button masher i don't care what anyone says i treat this one like a button masher 
Okay, maybe the first roulette is slow enough to time, I press A right after blue passes by the top, and I normally land on the key, but even then, waiting to time this and failing kinda blows. If you instead button mash, then you'll likely land on a few Bowsers in a row, followed by the key. On the second roulette, again, I just button mash. It goes too fast to time it, so it's best to just get as many shots in as you can until the key appears. Especially when you've got to deal with the third roulette, which, come on now, look at this thing. Just spam A so that it quickly lands on results until the key is gained. If you want to be cool and figure out pinpoint timings, then that's fine and all, but I found a ton of success by simply mashing here. It's rarely failed me. Treasure Dome. One chest holds a key to the next chest, which holds a key to the next one, and so on. Open every chest to win. Even if there were tons of potential patterns for you to memorize here, it wouldn't be necessary. Simply run towards the key and keep using it on the chest closest to you. If one's locked, then move to the next closest one, and so on. When moving from the front two chests to the back two, make sure you start from the outside and work your way in to save more time. As long as you don't get stuck on the chest and remember which ones you checked already, this one's a walk in the park. On average, you'll see yourself beating this one with around 5 seconds to spare, maybe even more if you get lucky. If every time you look for the key it ends up being in the last chest you check, then you'll definitely lose, but this only has a 1 in 120 chance of occurring, or 0.83%, so unless you're terribly lucky, this should be a walk in the park. Tunnel of Lava Only one of Bowser's minions has the precious door key. Stomp on them to find it. There's no way to tell which one has the key just by looking, so you've got to destroy him till you randomly hit the one that has it. Thankfully, there's more than enough time to pull this off. Jump on one of them and move the opposite direction they're spinning. So if they're circling clockwise, then move counterclockwise and vice versa. This makes it so much easier to bounce on them in a row since there's much less distance you have to cover due to them moving towards you. In some cases, you can even sit still as they march to their doom, but you probably shouldn't challenge them like this too often. You've also got to watch for when they start walking in and out so that you can account for their movement. When they start turning red, retreat to the center of the arena. Touching them while they're fully red will stun you for a couple seconds, and so will getting hit by their flames when they're like this. Once they're done, observe which direction they're circling and jump on the one in the front and continue your chain once more until you win. Multiplayer Bowser minigames. Just like the single player ones, you do not want to lose these. So if you're practicing minigames, then prioritize these ones above all else. Thunderwall. Climb to the top of the fence while dodging the fierce attacks of the Koopa Kids. This one's my personal favorite Bowser minigame in the whole franchise. While you're trying to avoid the Koopa Kids' flames, you also need to make sure you don't touch any of the spikes on the walls. They're in the same layout every time, so feel free to get used to their position so you aren't caught off guard. The Koopa Kids will always begin by shooting their flames upward in unison. They'll then begin to shoot flames one after another, starting with Blue Koopa Kid, then Green Koopa Kid, and finally Red Koopa Kid before repeating the pattern. The cursors themselves don't indicate which Koopa Kid they belong to, so you've got to look at the Koopa Kid's machines and see where they're pointing to know which cursor belongs to whom. You don't have to keep track of the pattern or whose cursor is whose in order to play this minigame well, especially for this first section where they simply spray their fire from top to bottom over and over. As long as you station yourself at the bottom of the gate, then you can easily adapt to the cursor that glows red, which is the indication that flames are incoming. After five sprays of fire, they'll join together at the top and shoot some more in unison from top to bottom, but their flames will be much closer this time around than the first. Avoid them by keeping to the left or right side. They aren't very creative, so they'll return to the routine of shooting flames one after another in the same blue-green-red pattern. Staying near the bottom is dangerous this time around, since there's a wall of spikes there, so keep a little above them to avoid all of the flames they're spewing out, again from top to bottom. They'll only go four in a row this time, with their unison attack being one flame down the middle and two flames up the sides, easy to avoid by a small juke when you know they're coming. In this final section, they go into a frenzy, where they'll once more do their blue-green-red pattern, but execute it much faster. Pay close attention to each of the cursors, because they get pretty quick. If all of the other opponents are still in at this point, then someone is probably going to get out, and it's going to be due to people getting in each other's ways. Try to find a section for yourself where you can move around as you please, so you don't get stuck on anything.
anyone. Once they finish their seventh spray of fire, they'll give up and you'll win the minigame. Moving into a threat can really screw them over here if they're not expecting it. If someone's trying to move you and you need to stay in the same spot you're in, then move directly against them. This will balance you and them out so that you'll both remain still. But be weary, for if they stop moving towards you when you do this, you'll begin moving in the direction that you were pushing against. Funsticle Course Reach the goal by running through a series of diabolical Koopa Kid traps. If you get hit by anything on the course or fall, then you're out. Getting jumped on by opposing players will just slow you down though. You can easily target threats in this minigame in an attempt to have them lose, but be careful to not lose yourself when trying this. It's the same course layout every time, but some obstacles behave a little different each time you play, which we'll cover in a moment. Starting off, the Koopa Kids blast fire from the left, so being on the left side of the screen or even in the middle means death. Make sure to keep a little to the right and up or to the right and down so that you can easily avoid the first swamp that appears in the middle. More will start to appear. Carefully navigate them, only running under one if it just rose up. The Koopa Kids will back off during the thwomp section. While they're away, keep moving right and stop at the ledge. Do not get comfortable and move towards the left side of the screen or to the middle. Make sure you're moving right and properly station yourself at the edge like a stone once you see it. The Koopa Kids will try and scare you by suddenly approaching from the left with flames, but as long as you're here on the edge, you're fine. Don't jump to the right platform yet. Just wait until the Koopa Kids leave, and when they do, patiently wait for the platform to lower and then jump on it. Players greatly underestimate how much time they're given here and tend to panic, resulting in this spot being the one where most players lose. Keep jumping from platform to platform, waiting for the one you're on to raise up to its highest point before making each leap. Once you reach solid ground, keep avoiding the left side of the screen since the flames are going to return once more, but this time you can stay in the middle of the screen since they don't go far. The next section is composed of many narrow platforms. Take your time with these. You can easily walk along the top and even jump across the short gaps as you please. After this part, the Koopa Kids will leave once more, which is good because now you've got to move to the left side of the screen. There are five rolling spike bars that you've got to jump over in a row, and if you're too far right, then you may not see them coming in time. Their speeds are not the same on each playthrough, which is another reason to give yourself more time to react to them. After you jump over the fifth one, go as far right as you can. The Koopa Kids will come back and start shooting fire fireballs at random. Sometimes they'll do split shots, sometimes they'll shoot in pairs, you never know what's coming next. Perform full jumps over each fireball that gets launched at you. These are not hard to do at all. Just make sure you don't accidentally move too far left when jumping over them. Once they stop shooting, you're good. Let them push you to the finish line or run there yourself and you're out of this funstical course. Madge Magical Journey. Hop across the rocks to reach the goal, but watch for the attacks of the Koopa Kids. The layout for this minigame is the same every time. Think of it as a simpler funsticle course where you just perform full jumps from platform to platform trying to avoid falling into the lava or getting hit by one of the Koopa Kids fireballs which are telegraphed via their cursors. If it turns red, then a fireball's coming and you need to get out of the way. If you get jumped on, then do not attempt to jump to another platform. You will not make it because your speed is reduced. Patiently wait until you return to normal and then jump. This makes jumping a valuable tool to stop big threats, and it's not all that hard to pull off here since there are only so many platforms to go on, so you can easily wait at one of the platforms ahead of the threat and when they arrive, bonk on their head. Don't get ahead of yourself though, because there's an invisible barrier at the top of the screen, quite a bit closer than what you may have assumed. Get a good handle on how far you can go lest you accidentally bump into it as you try jumping to the next platform. After the first long set of platforms, you'll enter an open breather section free of danger. The long set of platforms is the second half of the minigame, where it's pretty much more of the same. It's all about striking that balance of not being so far ahead that you bonk your head and not being so far behind that the platform sinks from underneath your feet. Single player DK minigames, a bridge too short. Run across the bridges. If one breaks, you'll have to go back and take another path. There are four pairs of bridges that you and DK will come across in a row. 
Each pair will have a bridge that's perfectly fine and a bridge that's broken, but the broken one won't reveal itself until you walk on it first. To make matters worse, it may break at the beginning of your walk, in the middle, or at the very end. You just don't know. Thankfully though, you and DK share the same set of bridges, so all you have to do is follow him the entire minigame and once you reach the fourth pair of bridges, quickly take the route he's about to take before he does. So if you see him moving over to the other side to take that bridge, quickly round the corner and take it before him. If it happens to be the correct bridge, you win because you crossed it faster. And if it happens to be the wrong bridge, you find that out before DK and can take the other bridge before him to win that way. If instead you see him start moving towards the path in front of him, quickly smash your analog stick up to be just barely ahead. You both move at the same speed and he won't slow down, so you have to be on the mark to ensure that he didn't start crossing it before you. This is why it's best to be right next to the post ahead of him here, since you're given ample time to either smack up if he starts going forward, or smack either left or right if you see him walking that way instead. You could also pause right when he makes his decision to see which direction you need to start heading, but if you're playing with friends, then they may get upset at you for this. Jump, man! Run up the ramp and reach the top before DK does, but watch for the barrels. Say, this looks familiar. Running into a barrel will stun you for a quick moment, whereas hopping on top of one will let you do a small bounce. The first floor is pretty easy, only requiring a single simple jump, maybe two to reach the rope, where you need to hold up to climb it. Do not try jumping up this rope. Doing so will cause you to fall down it a while before your character grabs back on. Just let yourself climb up normally, and when you get close enough to the next floor, jump to it to save time. Oh, and if you run into a barrel mid-jump, it'll knock you all the way back down to the floor below you, so ensure you're jumping high enough to at least bounce off of it. The second floor has faster barrels, but it's still easy. When going for the rope here, look above you for barrels that drop down. Oftentimes, players will get sniped by barrels that they didn't see coming. So from now on, dart your eyes up to the floor above to make sure you won't get hit as you latch on. The third floor is faster, requiring quicker jumps over multiple barrels. Don't get nervous and watch your inputs. As long as you're making progress and don't get hit more than a couple times, you'll be ahead of DK since he's basically programmed to mess up a bit. On the fourth floor, the barrels are flying by. To clear this, you've got to make sure your jumps are on point. There may even be a couple jumps where you've got to hold back a bit so that you don't run into a barrel. One strat you can do here is purposely run into a barrel when you jump off. This will give you some invincibility frames which you can use to simply run forward and knock away multiple barrels, finally ending the minigame with a jump to the finish. This isn't recommended if you and DK are neck and neck since he might clear it normally faster than you. This method is just a straightforward, consistent way to beat this floor to guarantee a win if DK's a bit behind you. One big thing to note is that if you reach the top floor quickly, the barrels will not be as fast. This is because the speed of the barrels is determined by how long the minigame has gone on, not by what floor you're on. I gave advice assuming you'd get stunned a couple times, but if you manage to play it fast and safe at the beginning, then the end gets a lot easier. Even more of a reason to keep a watchful eye for the barrels rolling at you. Vine Country. Tap A repeatedly to reach the top before DK does. Move sideways to dodge honeycombs and spiders. It may not look like it based on your slow animation, but button mashing fast here helps a lot. The problem is that the faster you mash, the more likely you are to get so absorbed in the mashing that you don't notice the honeycombs and spiders about to fall on your head. Mash fast, but note which side of the vine you're on. If you're on the right side, then mash and keep your eyes glued to the right side of the top of the vine. The moment you see any movement in that area, immediately move to the left and shift your eyes to the left of the vine. The moment you see any movement in that area, move to the right and so on. It's all about mashing and keeping focus on the space above where you're climbing so that you don't get stunned and lose time. Multiplayer DK minigames. Bananas faster. Hop on the roulette wheel to collect bananas. You can jump as many times as you want before time runs out. Banana peels are worth nothing, whereas banana bunches are worth 5 bananas, making them your prime target here. The jump timing is the same no matter which position 
position you get, but the marker used for each position is different, obviously. If you're top left, then jump when the banana bunch lines up with the right barrel. If you're top right, then jump when the banana bunch lines up with the bottom barrel. I'm sure you can see the pattern now. Each position uses the barrel that's 145 degrees clockwise from it as their indicator to jump when the prize they want is just about to line up with it. Remember, you aren't jumping when your target lines up with your barrel, but as soon as it's about to. If, when you jump, you land on a spot an opponent's standing on, you'll bounce off of their head and back to your original position, which just wastes time. So don't bother doing this and focus on getting a bunch of bunches and the singular bananas too when the bunches run out. Peel out, go down the slide and collect bananas on the way down. The bananas on the paths are decided once you load into the game, so you can absolutely use safe states to cheese this one. There are bananas all over the place on many different routes, making this one luck based unfortunately. If there's a threat in the game that you really don't want to pass you up in coins, then look at which direction they're choosing to go and follow them. After all, the paths are the same for every player, meaning that mimicking another's movements ensures you both get the same amount of coins coins by the end. Stump change, hop on the barrel and roll over the bananas to collect them. The banana layout is the same every time, meaning that there will always be a bunch of bananas worth 5 bananas in the middle. If you're playing with CPUs, even if they're set to brutal, you're basically guaranteed to get this bunch for yourself since they don't know how to properly hold their analog sticks towards it like you do. If you're playing with real players, then there's a bit more competition for this guy since it doesn't take a genius to figure out the fastest way to snatch him is to just hold forward. If multiple players reach it at the same time, it'll randomly give itself to one of them, so there's no special priority given to any one player. While shooting for this bunch might be your first instinct, consider letting the three players fight over it while you work your way around the outside of the arena collecting all the bananas there. With this method, you have a high chance of guaranteeing you get some coins out of the minigame, whereas gunning it for the middle can result in disappointment when the bunch doesn't get awarded to you. Staying on the outskirts likely won't result in you getting more bananas than whichever player got the bunch, but the point here is deciding whether you value playing it safe with a healthy sum of bananas, or if you need a certain amount of coins that going on the outskirts just can't provide for you. Pushing foes in this minigame doesn't do anything, so don't bother unless you want to look silly. 8 player minigames! These are played with two players sharing a controller, where one takes the left side of it and the other takes the right side. The more skilled player between you and your partner should always take the right side. This is because it's more difficult to control the C-stick than the analog stick, and leaving a beginner with a more tough to control stick is just asking for trouble. One of the 8 player minigames also requires a lot of buttons inputs which will mainly fall onto the right player so it's better to put the one with more experience on this side. Bobonic Plague Form a ring and pass the bobom to the next player. When it blows, players on each side will lose. The last player standing wins for their team. If the last two players are on the same team, they automatically win. On the first round, each player will be placed opposite of their partner. This is to ensure that each team has at least one player in the second round. The time it takes for the bobom to start blinking red is random, and ranges from as quickly as about 5 seconds to as long as about 9 seconds. The length of time it takes to explode after it starts blinking red is more consistent, often blowing up at around 4 seconds. You can easily take advantage of this by simply holding onto the babam, and when it turns red, wait a full second before passing it to the next person. You can use a sound indicator here, where you can wait until the babam stops making noise after it turns red. <laughs> It doesn't stop perfectly after a full second though, so wait a split second after it finishes to throw it. The reason why we wait here before passing is so that we don't accidentally blow up our own partner. If you immediately pass the babom as soon as it turns red, then the people after you are most definitely going to pass the babom quickly, resulting in getting your buddy knocked out. On the second round, there will always be at least one member of each team remaining with one team having two. The team with two members will be moved right next to one another. If your team is the one with two members and you go after your partner, then great! Do the same strat as before, holding onto the babam for a full second after it starts blinking red and then throwing it to the next person. If your partner goes after you, then you could inform them of the trick to ensure your victory on that minigame, but if you'd rather keep this trick to yourself, then when you have the babam, wait until it starts blinking red and then immediately throw it. Your partner will likely freak out and throw it to the next person 
and quickly, and with this, you get the same result, the enemy receiving the bob a full second after it started blinking red. If you and your partner survive this round, then you win, but if they got knocked out, then you've got one more round left. This is where things get a little more luck based, whereas in previous rounds the bob exploding a second later or sooner than expected wasn't a big deal due to how many players it had to work through, this round it's just you and your opponent, so that uncertainty in when it explodes makes this impossible to win 100% of the time. More often than not though, you want to hold on to the bob and when it starts blinking red, wait 3 full seconds before throwing it to your opponent. In most cases this will end with your victory, but if the bob decides to explode a second later, then that's that. If on the first couple rounds an opponent going before you executes this waiting a full second strategy we talked about and lobs the bob to you at the proper time, then consider just holding on to the bob to purposely knock them out along with yourself. After all, if they do the strat correctly, then in most cases they will survive and you will get knocked out, leaving your partner to face off against an opponent that knows the timings on this minigame. The best case scenario is, of course, for you to survive but in a situation where an opponent before you does this, consider bringing the both of you down to even the playing field. Hitting the throw button when you don't have the bob will cause your character to emote. This doesn't do anything, but it's funny nonetheless. Bumper to bumper, hop on the amazing hover cart and use it to ram your foes off the edge. The last one standing wins it for their team. Multiple players can win, but if all teams have someone left standing, it's a tie. If all players fall off before time runs out, it's a tie. You may assume that the platform tilts based on where most of the weight is, but this isn't the case. It actually tilts in different directions at random. Paying attention to which way it's tilting is absolutely key to winning this minigame. There is a huge difference in power between hitting someone up a slope versus hitting someone down a slope. At the beginning of the minigame, your number one priority is to endure the madness of the first five seconds. During this time, everyone's scurrying to safety and bouncing into each other like crazy. You might be tempted to go for the middle of the arena, but it is not the safe spot you think it is. Most players book it there first and start bouncing all over the place, which will result in you getting flung into terrible positions. Instead, consider going in a circle closer to the edge of the arena, and when all the players in the middle start duking it out, position yourself towards the higher part of the arena once it tilts. If you can pull this off, you'll be in a great position to launch others out of the game and not get launched yourself. When bumping into players, keep on them over and over again until they're out. If you notice the arena tilting in their favor, then immediately back off and move sideways. Do this any time you're on the defensive when the arena is tilted against you. Players will often get knocked out because they keep holding their analog stick towards their aggressor despite the tilt not being in their favor at all. Wrap around to the higher side of the arena each time and go on the offensive once more. Rinse and repeat. Obviously, do your best to not bump your ally off the arena. You can easily tell which players are on the same team with one another because they share a shade of the same color. If you and your partner are 2v1ing a player, then it's best for one of you to knock the player at a time, with the other going in for a support bounce when an opening is found. If you're trying to 1v2 a team, then you've got to play like a chicken, going around in circles and finding small openings to take advantage of whenever you can. Less skilled players will run into their own partners, which you can take advantage of. Duct and cover. Watch for the button symbols to appear over the pipe, then tap that button repeatedly to fix the leak. The button symbols are A, B, X, Y, L, and R. Five of these six buttons are on the right side of the controller, which is part of the reason why the more skilled player of the two should be on the right side. Each player will be given three leaks to fix. Both you and your partner should be watching one another and seeing which buttons appear over your heads. If you see a symbol over your partner's head that's on on your side of the controller, start mashing that button so that your partner can fix the leak and vice versa. That being said, this is not a fast button masher. Treating it like one will result in the controller shaking a ton and possibly messing up your partner's movement or button presses. All you've got to do is hit each button at a decent pace. Give me a break. Stop your scooter closest to the course's edge by hitting the brakes at just the right moment. If all players fall into the mud pit, it's a tie. If the top scores are tied, it's also a tie. There are 
are three variations of this minigame, and they all have to do with weather. Sunny, rainy, and snowy. When it's sunny, the scooters stop quickly. When it's rainy, they slide a little before stopping. And when it's snowy, they slide a lot before stopping. When sunny, wait until you pass the third set of triangles and then break at the end of the third dash. When rainy, wait until you pass the third set of triangles and then break at the start of the second dash. When snowy, break just before you touch the third set of triangles. Simple as that. Grin and bar it. Jump over the rotating metal bar to avoid being hit. The last team with a standing player wins. If the remaining players hit the bar at the same time, it's a tie. The bar is curved, meaning every player will be jumping at different intervals to clear the bar. You cannot copy another player. Hold your designated trigger down for a full jump, which you should be using a ton during the first few swings so that you have more leeway over this awkwardly shaped bar. When it starts speeding up, don't hold your trigger as long to jump. Just tap it a bit so that your hops are shorter to the ground. This way, you can jump in quick succession and won't get caught by the bar once it reaches faster and faster speeds. It gets so much faster after a while that it'll be near impossible to time your jumps, so just spam your trigger as fast as possible and hope that your opponent is foolish enough to continue timing theirs. You'll definitely know on your own when it gets to be too fast. Hammer Spammer Survive the Barrage of the Hammer Bros If you fall off the pit, get slammed by one of the huge hammers, or get hit by a singular small hammer thrown by a hammer bro, then you'll get knocked out of the minigame. Please do keep in mind that last detail. While it feels like these small hammers should just bump you a little bit, touching them will result in your loss, so avoid them carefully. You can't jump in this minigame, so there's no worry about players leaping onto your head and slowing you down. But that also means you can't do the same to other players. So instead, you want to just focus on simply dodging the hammer's thrown and staying away from the very edge. When the timer hits 25, 15, and 5, all hammer bros will retreat for a moment and two enormous hammers will slam down onto the field. You can see where they're about to hit via the shadows on the floor, so keep your eyes peeled for that and move preemptively. Just make sure you don't accidentally run into another player. Real Smoothie Throw fruit into the blender. The player on the left takes oranges, while the one on the right does strawberries. If multiple teams have the same highest score, they all win. If the wrong player grabs the fruit, then they'll waste time putting it back. So make sure you're laser focused on each fruit that appears, and only hit your designated trigger when your fruit appears. If your partner's having trouble and keeps taking your fruit, give them a friendly reminder to take their time. Now I should warn you, there's an absolutely broken strat on this minigame you need to look out for. If two players on a controller decide to just let one of the two players grab a hold of the entire controller, then that one person can easily sweep through this minigame in record time since they don't have to worry about being in sync with a partner. This strat is very unethical, so I just thought I'd inform you it exists so you can look out for it and make sure no hooligans are trying to pull a fast one on you. Rope-a-dope. Cross the narrow path to make your way to the goal, but don't let your partner drag you down. If multiple players reach the goal at the same time, the winner is chosen at random. If no one reaches the goal after five minutes pass, it's a tie. The paths are mirrored. During most of the minigame, you can freely move forward without worry of stretching the rope between you and your partner too tight. There's quite a bit of leeway. The problem comes when you or your partner runs too far ahead of the other. If you see your partner's lagging behind, then slow down a moment so that you don't accidentally cause the rope to stretch too far. Same goes for your partner. Tell them to slow down if they get too far ahead. The main issue comes when you reach the star design. This is where most players fall. Give your partner a reminder to do it slowly and be careful unless you want to start over all the way from the beginning of the design. The main spot that the rope can stretch too far on is the top points of the star. If both you and your partner move to the tips at around the same time, then you'll likely fall due to stretching the rope too far. You need one of you to go around the point first so that you have more leverage on the rope. 
Other than that, the design's a walk in the park as long as you take your time and don't rush it. Winning this minigame is often easy to do as long as you don't fall a single time. Shock Absorbers Punch left, right, and up to hit the lights when they glow. If every light is glowing, duck. You lose if you fail to punch a glowing light in time, or if you press the wrong one. Same goes if you fail to duck when the lights start flashing red. If remaining players from different teams get shocked at the same time, it's a tie. Every player is given the exact same buttons to press with the exact same time allotted to them. This is a pretty straightforward reaction minigame. As the minigame progresses, the time you're given to react to each button press shortens. Get a feel for how much time you have on each press so that you don't accidentally press buttons in a rush unnecessarily. If you want to be evil and have everyone in the room scream at you, then consider pausing during the minigame for a quick moment to screw everyone up. Don't throw me under the bus though. Spin off. Stop the slots to make the character shown. You must make three different characters to win. If no team matches all three characters before five minutes passes, it's a tie. There are five characters on the slot machine. Goomba, Thwomp, Womp, Chain Chomp, and the bomb The order that they're in on the slot machine is random every time. You'll see which three of the five characters you have to match in the bottom left corner of your screen, but don't get it twisted. You can match these characters in any order you please. When trying to land on a character, the button must be pressed when the character is in the middle of their spin or closer to the end of it. Stopping the roulette right before they get to the middle of their spin will likely result in the previous character being selected instead, so wait until your desired character is front and center. Memorize which characters come right before the character you want so that you'll be prepared to stop the roulette accordingly. If you find this difficult, then count up numbers starting from your desired character, and after you hit 5, then get ready to stop the roulette. For example, here I want to stop it on a chain chomp. When I see it pass by, I count 1, then 2 for the second character, 3, 4, 5, and now I know that the next character will be the Chain Chomp, thus I stop the roulette to land on it. If your teammate is skilled, then agree on which character to shoot for and time your slots carefully. When you stop the roulette, it will remain stopped unless you start it again by pressing the trigger once more. If you landed on the right character, then just wait for your partner to land on it too. If your teammate is not skilled, then let them stop the roulette whenever they want and then match the character they stopped on afterwards. Make sure they don't accidentally start the roulette again if they already landed on one of the three needed characters. Synchronicity. Row and sync with your partner as you head for the goal. If multiple teams reach the goal at the same time, the winner is chosen at random. If no team reaches the goal after five minutes, it's a tie. Don't overthink it. Just make sure you and your teammate are hitting left and right over and over at a nice and slow pace. Do not do it fast or else you won't go anywhere. Make sure you two are taking it easy. If your teammate's struggling with it, then tell them to match your speed and ease them into it. Watch out for teams that let one member of the team have full handle over the entire controller. They're stinky cheaters who are trying to get an easy win. It's a good thing you'd never do anything like that. Unhappy Trails. Run a relay with your partner to find a precious jewel, then bring it back to the starting line. If multiple teams reach the goal at the same time, the winner is chosen at random. If no team reaches the goal after five Five minutes, it's a tie. Simply run along the course and cut corners whenever you can. If you're on the analog stick, then this should be pretty easy for you to accomplish. But if you're using the C stick, then don't be as hasty and be a little more careful as you run so that you don't waste any time falling into the water. Remind your teammate to take it easy too, cause 3 seconds of stun time sucks. Again, make sure no team's cheating or anything by having only the skilled player hold the controller. That would be just wrong. Finish! No matter how many times I booted up Mario Party 7 as a kid, it always managed to draw me in and make me really feel like I was on a globe-spanning cruise with some friends. Whether it be the peaceful waters of Grand Canal or the towering Pagoda Peak, each board had something to offer to give you a taste of the vacation life. And with a soundtrack like this one, oh man did it deliver! The fascinating atmosphere is juxtaposed perfectly by Bowser's rage, where here he's downright cruel. 
causing mass hysteria amongst me and my friends as we scrambled to survive in whatever death-defying obstacle course we're thrown at. We could have been the worst of enemies before a multiplayer Bowser minigame, but there's something about the fear it instills in you during a close game that makes everybody shut up and band together to face the threat hand in hand. This title also had 8-player Mario Party, which is a ton of fun if you manage to fill in all the slots with your homies for an all-out showdown. I started identifying luck four and a half years ago with my Introduction to Mario Party video. There, I said that identifying luck would only cover Mario Parties 1 through 7. And since this is the seventh entry, I guess that means this is the end. But, after a lot of deliberation, I've decided that the party must go on.